In the heart of the empire, in a square where history filled every corner with the echoes of past centuries, there came a moment that tested the souls of all present. Errol Frey Brixia, a woman whose name was known far beyond her native ducal family, came face to face with accusations worthy of the darkest pages of history. She was accused of the unthinkable crime of selling arms to an enemy country, a betrayal that could have spelled disaster for the entire empire. However, standing shackled against the looming blade of the guillotine which seemed to hang over the fate of the entire nation, Errol remained silent. This silence, adamant and mysterious, caused a wave of anger in the emperor himself, whose displeasure was reflected in the mood of the assembled crowd. The people gathered in the square embodied the entire spectrum of human emotions, from fear to hatred, and under the influence of the emperor's anger, their voices united in a demand. They wanted to execute the traitor who, in their opinion, deserved the harshest punishment. In that moment, as the air was saturated with the sharp smell of tension and waiting for a decision, Errol sank into her thoughts. She reflected on the life's journey that had brought her to this ominous land. In her musings, Errol looked back to the past where she, as the Duke's entitled proxy daughter, had revitalized the well-being of the Ducal family, becoming their hope and support. But even on the days when she brought light into their home, she was shadowed more than once by the shadows cast by the whispers behind her back, damn monster words that gnawed at her heart but didn't break her spirit. Her life was a trial from which she sought a way out through love and acceptance, wanting to fill the void left by rejection and rejection. But the injustice of the world gave her a special poignancy. Even her own family, which should have been a bastion of support and understanding, looked at her through a prism of prejudice, making her appearance an object of ridicule and rejection. Errol did not give up under the weight of these trials. She turned her attention to knowledge and learning, finding in them refuge and meaning in existence. Her pursuit of learning was more than just a thirst for knowledge. It was a struggle to be recognized, to prove her own worth in the eyes of those who doubted her. Errol studied with such passion and dedication that each day her efforts left her physically exhausted, to the point of nosebleeds, symbolizing her unwavering determination and the sacrifices she was willing to make for her goals. Even her father, a man who had long remained indifferent to her endeavors and needs, could not resist in the face of her successes. Her merit and ability inspired his respect and, unfortunately, his desire to use her talents for his own purposes. In this twist of fate, Errol found the twisted acceptance she had long sought, but it came with a taste of bitterness and disappointment, for behind her every accomplishment now stood the shadow of her father's self-serving intentions. Errol suddenly broke through the silent wall of her despair with a loud cry that made the multitude of people surrounding her stop in confusion. With this act of desperate courage, she tore off the mask that hid her features from the world and boldly met the eyes of the gathered crowd. Her voice, filled with sincerity and desperation, cut through the air as she proclaimed her innocence, pleading for mercy and understanding. However, in response to her call for justice, there were shouts from the depths of the crowd accusing her of being a monster. Errol, staunchly resisting the flood of accusations, answered with unyielding determination, emphasizing the absurdity of a situation in which her guilt was presumed solely on the basis of the appearance she was born with. Her words, full of pain and resentment, sounded like a denunciation, indicating that for many the truth was nothing more than an empty sound, ignored and forgotten. In this moment of tense confrontation, with Errol's words still in the air, the emperor pronounced his verdict. His order of execution sounded ruthless and final, like a verdict that could not be debated. In those final moments before facing her inevitable end, Errol was seized with despair, acutely aware that even the right to her own destiny had been taken from her by the decision of others. Her gaze turned to her father, in whose eyes there might have been a flicker of regret or understanding, but Errol saw only a reflection of his mistakes and weakness. Boldly and distinctly, she made her final accusation to him, predicting that his own incompetence would be his undoing. These words, coming from his daughter, sounded like a sentence, striking deepest into his heart. Her father, alarmed and caught off guard by this accusation, hastened to justify himself to the emperor in an attempt to wash his hands of the matter and separate himself from his daughter's impending execution. At this time, as her life was coming to an end under the shadow of betrayal and disbelief, Errol was enveloped by a wave of memories of Sevs Rudin, her one true friend in this ruthless world. She remembered the moment he had handed her the ring, investing the act with a promise of protection. 
This symbol of hope and friendship may have been the only comforting thought in her last moments. But now it seemed that the ring she had received from her only friend, a symbol of protection and friendship, seemed to have no power to protect her from the cruelty of a world that only saw her as a monster because of her appearance. In that moment of despair, when it seemed her eyes were slowly closing one, something unexpected happened. A moment later, Errol suddenly found herself in her room as if awakened from a deep, disturbing dream. In front of her stood Avara's maid, whose expression was full of concern. Ovara, with her typical maid-like manner, got right down to business, not giving Errol even a moment to gather her thoughts after such a stunning transition from grim reality to ordinary life. She warned Errol that time was ticking inexorably, and if she didn't hurry she would be late for the important event of Lord Belfort's arrival, and if she was late she would get a reprimand from her father. Obera, who had died four years ago, suddenly appeared before her alive and unharmed, making Errol feel as if she were not in the world of the living, but in some sinister hell with its own rules. Overa kept Errol on her toes, reminding her of her imminent obligations and the possible consequences of being late to the Duke, which could even be life-threatening. This was adding to Errol's stress, for she was already overwhelmed by what was happening around her. Despite the external pressure, Errol expressed a desire to rest, trying to find refuge in the calm to sort out her feelings and thoughts. Her mind was racked with confusion as to how she could be in her room after surviving her own execution. That moment became for her the rift between reality and unreality, between life and death. Doubts about what was real and what was just a nightmare tormented her, for both the execution and the return to her room seemed equally clear and real. It made Errol rethink her perception of the world, searching within herself for answers to questions about life, death, and what lies in between. The thought that she might have been a monster because of her return to life after her execution seemed more and more real to her. However, when she discovered that the distinctive spot around her eye that had been an integral part of her for years was gone, she was overcome with shock. The stain was something of a brand inextricably linked to her essence, the disappearance of which seemed impossible. No less astonishing was the disappearance of the ring that had always been with her. These two events added mystery to the already incomprehensible situation in which she found herself. Errol tried to find an explanation for what had happened, but each guess seemed more and more unbelievable to her. At that moment, the door of her room suddenly swung open, the suddenness of which startled her slightly. This unexpected turn of events made her heart quicken with anticipation of new discoveries or perhaps new challenges that lay ahead. It was her father, whose appearance always promised new tasks or reminders of debts. This time, he came to remind Errol of the imminent arrival of the Lord, an important guest that required her direct involvement in the preparations and meeting. Errol, feeling the weight of her father's gaze upon her, hastily pulled her mask back on and declared the need for rest. But her father, adamant in his demands, reminded her to take up their joint project, adding that if successful, she could expect to accompany him to the upcoming banquet. After her father left, Errol was left alone with her thoughts and reflections. In that silence, she realized that her return to the past offered her a unique chance to change the course of events to bring the story to a new, desired ending. She realized that the old Errol, who had made mistakes and brought her life to a disastrous end, had died along with those mistakes. Now she was faced with the task of not repeating her previous blunders and finding a way to repay her father for all the torment and trials he had inflicted on her. In this new understanding of her role and capabilities, Errol found not only hope to atone for past mistakes, but also confidence in her ability to change the future for the better. For Errol, the moment when her father Alden first expressed his intention to take her to the ball with him remained unforgettable. It was a condition for her diligence in her work, like a reward for a duty done. But behind this offer lay a deep ambivalence of feelings and motivations. When the moment of solitude with his friend came, the latter, questioning the reasons for Alden's unusual proposal, revealed a layer of hidden intentions and doubts. Alden, with his usual candor, admitted that the words about the ball were just an incentive for Errol, a motivation to work harder. It was a kind of mechanism designed to reinforce her desire to run errands, nothing more. The friend, for his part, didn't miss a chance to point out Alden's seeming insensitivity, accusing him of lacking fatherly care and warmth. In response to this, Alden, without losing his temper, challenged, if his friend thought himself more suitable for the role of guardian, then let him take Errol in with him. 
The friend, however, hesitated and retreated in the face of the possible curse he believed might accompany the girl. This moment was the breaking point for Alden, when he suddenly decided to really take Errol to the ball with him because he wanted to put on a fun show. In anticipation of the ball, Errol was excited and meticulous about her outfit, unaware of the dark twist that awaited her ahead. Dreams of a magical night full of dancing and fun were slowly, but inevitably, turning into a frightening reality. She didn't yet know that this evening, which was supposed to be the culmination of her dreams, would turn out to be her most vivid nightmare. Her father, the man who was supposed to be her protector and support, ruthlessly rips off her mask in front of the entire aristocratic society, subjecting her to cruel ridicule and humiliation because of her appearance. The moment Errol is lying on the floor, splattered with tears, trying to hide from the scornful stares, she will realize the horror of her situation. Surrounded by laughing aristocrats, her hopes and dreams will crumble, leaving behind only shards of shattered illusions. Now realizing the bitter truth, Errol realized how naive she had been to believe her father. Now she saw how cruel her father had always been to her and to expect more from him was just silly. All those years of hiding her real feelings and masking her identity to please her father had finally come to an end. She no longer intended to play by his rules, suppressing everything in her that made her herself. This time she was ready to expose the true nature of the one she called father and show that her own self was far more important than his expectations. As soon as she entered, her father, without wasting a moment, immediately started reprimanding her for being late. His words sounded as usual, stern and peremptory, but this time they did not arouse the usual fear in Errol's soul. At this time, Lord Belfort Buldern, with whom the meeting had been scheduled, showed a completely different side. He greeted Errol happily, though he noted that he did not insist on her speedy arrival. Not wanting to waste time on idle conversation or exchanging pleasantries, Errol simply sat down on the couch, ready to get down to business. Together, they began discussing a project that was important to both of them. This moment marked the beginning of a new phase in Errol's life, when she finally decided to stand up for her ideas and believe in her own strength, not letting other people's opinions and expectations dictate how to live her life. During their discussion, Lord Belford of Bulderne expressed concern about the quality of the manufactured product, military boots, pointing out a significant shortfall. The problem, he said, was that the boots were not performing their primary function of moisture protection, allowing water to freely penetrate. Alden flatly rejected the suggestion of product defects, confidently suggesting that the problem most likely lies in improper maintenance of the shoes by users. In his opinion, there can be no quality problems and all responsibility lies with those who misuse the boots. Lord Belfort, however, did not accept this argument. His determination left no room for doubt or excuse. He sharply dismissed the possibility of excusing the deficiencies as improper maintenance, emphasizing that if further inspections confirmed quality problems, his order would insist on compensation from Alden. This moment tested both sides, exposing potential conflicts of interest and emphasizing the need to find a solution that satisfies each side. Errol recalled past events when Alden, driven by a desire to reduce costs, had deliberately allowed defective products to be produced. This moment of insight was like a cold shower for her, illuminating the depth of the problem and the futility of the situation in which she found herself. It was then that Errol first realized that her father was acting extremely irresponsibly, putting not only his own dignity on the line, but also the well-being of the entire family. Alden, trapped by his own actions, cast glances in his daughter's direction, hoping that she would somehow manage to resolve the issue at hand. His gaze was full of expectation, as if he were looking to her for salvation from imminent exposure. But Errol, meeting his gaze, made a choice not in his favor. With a slight smile hiding behind a sea of feelings and experiences, Errol expressed her desire to leave this place. She claimed ill health as a last argument to avoid further involvement in a conversation that could have had disastrous consequences for her and her father. As Errol left the room where the tense dialogue between her father and Lord Belfort was unfolding, the atmosphere was saturated with various emotions. Her father was feeling anger at the unexpected turn of events, while Lord Belfort, despite the escalating conversation, found the strength to wish Errol well. Errol was consumed by her thoughts and feelings as she left the room, hovering somewhere between realizing her role in the family's fate and anticipating the consequences for her father that now seemed inevitable. Her musings on how her father would cope without her support were imbued with a subtle note of irony and perhaps even satisfaction. She felt Alden's despair, which he would surely experience soon, fill her with a sense of joy. 
It was like a grim anticipation of karmic retribution for all his years of mistakes and inattention. Errol was absolutely certain that without her intervention, Alden would be unable to deal with the consequences of his decisions, which now seemed more wrong and irresponsible than ever. This realization gave her a strange sense of liberation. On her way out, she no longer thought about the welfare of her family, whom she considered unworthy of her continued efforts and attention. When Errol, immersed in her reflections and feelings of release after the meeting, was about to separate herself from the heavy atmosphere of the past, she was suddenly stopped by Brother Veritas. His voice cut through the silence, bringing back memories of long ago. Veritas, with bewilderment and obvious surprise in his voice, could not hide his surprise that Aerolth was now alone. His words, filled with mockery and sneer, sounded especially sarcastic when he mentioned her indisposition, as if even for a monster, as he dubbed her, weakness was something unforgivable. Veritas, without wasting a moment, grabbed Errol's arm, continuing his game of humiliation, mocking her appearance. Errol, however, met his gaze and showed not the slightest sign of weakness. Her steadfastness and steadfastness in that moment was a clear testament to her inner strength and determination not to give her brother power over her. Veritas, despite his status in his family and society, was a man whose nature was as greedy and incompetent as their father Alden's. He had long established himself as the debauchee of the family, whose actions often caused trouble and shame. He had treated Errol with a particular cynicism since childhood, especially loving to taunt her by touching her mask, which was something personal and meaningful to Errol. These actions of Veritas were not just childish pranks, but something that left a deep mark on their relationship, making each of their encounters filled with tension and emotional struggle. Veritas stated that Ariel doesn't need the mask anymore, as everyone already knows she's a monster. Errol's response to Veritas's words was as resolute as her previously demonstrated fortitude. The abrupt pushing away of Veritas's hand not only expressed her refusal to tolerate his abuse, but also symbolized a moment of release from the long-standing bonds that bound her to familial expectations and insults. Her departure, which left Veritas in a state of bewilderment, emphasized the new boundary Errol had drawn between her past and her future. Later, reflecting on the day's events, Errol realized that Belfort's departure had come later than she had expected, which probably indicated Alden's attempts to justify himself to Lord Belfort. These attempts, Errol realized, were doomed to failure. Her father, who had always tried to save face and dignity in front of others, was facing insurmountable difficulties this time, and his usual manipulations were not working. Like a whirlwind rushing through the silence of a preternatural house, the door swung open with a crash and Father Errol burst into the space of the room, shrouded in an aura of unconcealed anger. His words, filled with accusations and frustration, fell upon Errol like an icy rain, foretelling the family of hitherto unseen trials and losses. A momentary realization flashed in his eyes that disease was a calamity that did not choose whom it touched, and even Errol could fall victim to it. But that brief moment of realization was quickly replaced by a new wave of anger as he again exclaimed that her action was unacceptable, putting the family's well-being at risk. Errol, remaining at the center of the storm, buffeted by her father's verbal barrage, plunged into thought. It seemed to her that Alden's mind was so limited and primitive that it could be compared to the thinking of a child. And so, without giving her time to recover, Alden entered the conversation with a statement that made Errol freeze. He openly admitted to informing Belford of the error in the blueprints, thus hinting at Errol's need to personally take responsibility for the oversight. Errol's gaze, directed at Alden, was full of phlegmatic and unconcealed irritation. Deep down, she realized that her father was trying to slyly shift the burden of guilt onto her, thus seeking to avoid punishment for his own mistakes. The moment the tension in the air became almost palpable, Alden expressed his thought with unwavering determination in his voice that Errol should take responsibility for what had happened and try to find a way to Belfort's heart to make things right. He emphasized that this was the only way for her to find forgiveness and thus preserve the opportunity to appear at the upcoming ball, which promised to be the event of the year. Alden was adamant. If Errol did not follow his advice, the doors of the gala would be closed to her. Time slowly dragged on, and the sun was beginning to slope toward the horizon when Belfort, shrouded in a halo of expectation, found himself standing at the edge of the fountain. The water splashed around, reflecting the last rays of the passing day, and Belfort, immersed in his thoughts, waited for the one who was to appear to him. 
His gaze occasionally glanced around, trying to catch the slightest movement. He knew that since he'd been sent a mediator, this was going to be a very important conversation. And so, as the golden glow of the sun on the water surface of the fountain began to fade, she, Errol, appeared. As she approached Belfort, she gathered her will in her fist and apologized for the fact that he had to cut his journey short and wait for her here at the fountain. Errol stood before Belfort with an unwavering confidence that indicated she had no intention of apologizing for the incident that had been the subject of their discussion. Her gaze, full of determination, slid over the face of her interlocutor, genuinely interested in his opinion of the blueprint she had presented. Belfort, after a brief pause, admitted that he found no glaring flaws in the document which only added to Errol's confidence in the correctness of his actions. With the wit of an analyst, she hypothesized that the root of the problem lies in the final stages of the project just before commissioning, hinting at the possible intervention of corrupt schemes. Errol felt that this was where the cause of the predicament was to be found, suggesting that Belfort should not delay in finding the culprit for what had happened. Her words did not sound like mere speculation, but like a clear plan of action, suggesting the need for an immediate investigation to discover the true causes of what was happening in order to bring those responsible to justice. Belfort stood on the threshold of ignorance, shrouded in doubts that scattered around him like ashes from a bonfire of truth. The uncertainty in his heart was fueled by the words of Errol, enigmatic and intelligent, whose confidence and mystery enveloped her like a mantle. She, like a sorceress from distant legends, looked at Belfort through the mirror of time and saw in him something more than he thought of himself. The words came from her lips, filled with faith in his strength and valor, as if she had already seen the path he was about to take and knew that he could unravel the tangle of corruption that lurked in the shadows. She promised to treat him if he solved the riddle of corruption as if it were a test ordained by fate, a test that would determine the true nature of his character. When Belfort finally pulled himself together and reported his dialogue with Errol to his superiors, the atmosphere was filled with anticipation. His words, intertwined with doubts and hopes, reached the ears of his superior, a man unaccustomed to his subordinates embarking on such ventures. But something was different this time. The boss, taking in the information, appreciated it not as the ramblings of a blue mare, but as a challenge that could change everything. His reaction was unexpected. He expressed his desire to meet Errol in person, as if her words contained a keynote that could change the course of their fight against corruption. On a day when their family's fate could have been decided in the courtrooms, Alden reminded Errol with adamancy that her actions could not be taken lightly. His words hung in the air, leaving behind a heavy residue of responsibility and a foreboding of impending events. Errol, stepping away from the conversation, realized with surprise that Belfort seemed to have managed not to divulge any excesses to Alden, remaining silent about many aspects of their affairs. With each step away from Alden, Errol sank deeper into her thoughts. She couldn't understand how it was possible not to realize the full extent of the picture when there was a fierce struggle, not only for power but also for territorial dominance in the empire. Thinking back on the history of the recent past, only 30 years ago, when Osland and Deslavon had been embroiled in a bloody war, she could not escape the thought of the folly of such ignorance. In those days, it seemed that the peace between the two great empires was forever shattered, and the lands that both sides wished to seize became the scene of endless battles and political games. Deslavan, despite the temporary truce, still secretly longed to regain the territories lost during the conflict, while Osland had not given up hope of expanding its borders at the expense of its neighbor. This heavy struggle for power and influence forced both empires to find new ways to strengthen their position, including directing huge sums of money to support and develop armies capable of fighting for their interests at any moment. As the economic condition of their great nation deepened into the abyss of financial difficulty, the shadow of imminent consequences began to loom over every corner of the empire. Even the stately Brixia family, rooted in the very foundations of the empire's creation, found itself facing inevitable accusations. Guilty of military corruption, growing like an ominous weed in the garden of their state, could cost them not only the loss of power and influence, but their very lives. Like dark clouds thickening over the horizon, the prospect of execution hovered over the heads of every member of the family, heralding a storm that could hit at any moment. In this world where every step on the political plank could be her last, Errol faced a mystery. 
her own time travel that seemed to be the only thread that could lead her out of the maze of impending disaster. The loss of the ring and the disappearance of the ugly spot around her eye that had always served as a reminder of her past trials left her soul with even more questions than answers. Time seemed to be playing against her, but Errol's resolve was unwavering. She knew that the first step toward saving her family and bringing stability back to their world would be to solve the mystery of her unexpected journey through time. A tense atmosphere suddenly arose. Aslan, whose mood was far from happy, suddenly appeared in front of Errol. The meeting between the two girls was full of misunderstandings and hidden irritation. Aislinn, with her characteristic directness and undisguised irritation, could not conceal her displeasure at meeting Errol. Errol, trying to defuse the situation, hastily began to explain that she was delayed by a conversation with her father. However, when Aslan abruptly asked about the topic of their conversation, Errol realized that explanations might be in vain. The thought flashed through her mind that Aslan might not be able to fully grasp the essence of their project, no matter how simple it was. Even so, Errol decided not to back down and began to talk in detail about the project they were both involved in. Aislinn, for her part, tried to follow the story, making a visible effort to show her understanding. She nodded and from time to time tossed in short questions, giving the illusion of interest. Errol, however, knowing Aislinn long and well, felt that her words seemed to scatter in the air, not finding a way to understand her interlocutor. It was obvious from Aslan's facial expressions and gestures, which betrayed a polite but superficial interest. She held out her test papers to her, her eyes reflecting worry and fear of the inevitable. Her words filled with despair cut through the silence. She admitted that her grades were far from ideal and she was in danger of expulsion from the Institute. But along with this confession sounded confidence in his special gift of persuasion, the belief that even in the most desperate situation can be found a way out. Errol, who had always been known for her phlegmatic calmness, only nodded in response as if the whole world of student worries were unknown to her. However, Aislinn's next words were unexpected even for her. With a nonchalance worthy of the best dramatic actresses, Aislinn announced that she would not fight for her place at the Institute on her own. On the contrary, she placed this heavy burden on Errol's shoulders, explaining her act by the upcoming ball at which she intended to shine. At the moment when Aslan, like a character from a magical fairy tale, hurriedly left in search of the perfect dress for the ball, Errol remained standing with the tests in her hands, embodying the image of patience and resilience in the face of unexpected turns of fate. Left alone, Errol felt a surge of anger that made her clutch the tests in her hand with force. In that moment, she realized how much Aslan reminded them both of their father, a man who was used to command without expecting objections. Suddenly, like a bolt of lightning that pierced the silence of the room, Errol came to a decision. She turned to the maid with a request that could change the course of their family drama. The words to tell his mother to please her with Aislinn's grades came out of her mouth like arrows aimed at the heart of the problem. The move wasn't just an attempt to draw attention to her sister's academic failures. It was something like a beacon warning of an approaching storm. By morning, when the first rays of the sun were barely touching the roofs of the manor, News reached Errol that made her heart beat faster. The Duchess, their mother, not only took note of the information about Aislinn's poor grades, but decided to take action. Aslan was told off and then commanded not to leave the manor until she corrected her academic progress. This decision had far-reaching consequences. The possibility of Aislinn appearing at the upcoming ball was jeopardized. On the eve of the grand ball that was to enliven the castle with its splendor, Errol turned to her faithful companion, Overa, to ask what the latter planned to do during that time. Overa, a woman whose heart was drawn to her native expanse far beyond this glittering event, replied that she intended to go to her hometown. There, in the cozy embrace of the house she had not seen for five long years, her relatives were waiting for her, the very ones whose voices and warmth she kept in the deepest corners of her soul. However, with a slight hesitation in her voice, Overa added that if Errol decided not to attend the ball, she would not hesitate to put her plans aside and stay by her mistress's side to support her in whatever decision she made. But Errol, whose heart was full of care and understanding for her dear companion, insisted that Overa must be reunited with her family, no matter what the circumstances. Overa, however, said, puzzled and with a noticeable embarrassment in her voice, that she would prefer to stay. 
There was a note of determination in her words to prioritize her duty to her family, handing over the money instead of attending in person, believing it to be the best way to support them. In her eyes, it was an expression of care and responsibility, for Overa believed that true support lay not only in moments of joyful companionship, but also in the ability to ensure the well-being of her loved ones, even if it meant personal sacrifice. Overa, being the oasis of warmth in Errol's life, held a special place in her heart. Obera was the ray of light that chased away the shadows of loneliness that surrounded her. However, the looming omen of imminent loss to an unseen enemy, a disease that was to take her life in a year, filled Errol's heart with heavy sadness. This agonizing foreshadowing of future loss made Errol rethink her intentions for the upcoming ball. Recognizing that every moment spent together was precious, Errol made her decision, despite her personal worries and the distant memories of the upcoming celebration. She decided that she would go through with the ordeal of the ball if it would allow Overa to find long-awaited moments of happiness with her family. It was a display of true friendship and self-sacrifice, a willingness to face one's own fears and anxieties for the happiness of another. As a sign of her decision, Errol asked Overa to pick out a dress for the ball, symbolizing with this gesture her firm intention to attend the event. She also gave Owera a whole week off, giving her the opportunity to enjoy time with her family without any worries. The act was filled with deep gratitude and respect for Overa, reflecting Errol's unwillingness to part with the one who had given her boundless support and warmth. In the original timeline, Errol's father, as if enveloped in an illusion of caring, set about convincing his daughter to remove her mask. He used words as weapons, hiding his true intentions under a mask of false alarm that the world was deprived of seeing her unseen face. This manipulative ploy was only a precursor to the tumultuous and dramatic scene that played out in the following moments. With an unexpected ferocity and determination reserved for those who have lost all compassion, he forcibly ripped the mask from her face, exposing the secret hidden beneath its protection. Errol, deprived of her last refuge, lost her balance and fell like a leaf plucked from a tree in a storm. This moment of decadence was the beginning of another tragedy when the father, oblivious to the heartache and humiliation he had inflicted on his child, began calling out to those around him. He was inviting them to witness not an event worthy of admiration, but something that in his distorted perception deserved ridicule. He wanted them to stare at the ugly spot around Errol's eye, as if it was a sight worthy of their attention. The act not only physically but emotionally devastated Errol, leaving her alone and vulnerable under the gaze of the crowd that had gathered at her father's call. As the situation reached its climax of tension and drama, Overa, a being whose loyalty seemed unwavering, approached Errol. A smile played on her face that could mean anything, but in this situation seemed like a beacon of safety. Errol, gripped by fear and despair, without the strength to resist a fate that seemed already sealed, grabbed hold of Overa's dress. Her words were filled with a plea for salvation, a desire to escape from all the problems and horrors that surrounded her. She was looking for support and understanding, for hope that at least someone could help her. However, Overa, instead of reaching out, grabbed Errol's face. Her words were cruel and harsh like a knife that inexorably wounds the soul. She unleashed a torrent of ridicule and humiliation upon Errol, speaking of her appearance in words full of disgust and contempt. And then, as if emphasizing his words with action, Overa's fingernails suddenly grew longer, turning into instruments of torture. They began clawing at Errol's face, leaving behind marks of pain and unthinkable suffering. At that moment, when it seemed that there was no more hope and the darkness would swallow everything around her, Errol let out a desperate cry. That scream wasn't just a sound, it was an expression of all her pain, fear, and despair. And suddenly, as if tearing through the shroud of night terror, Errol jumped up finding freedom from her nightmare. She found herself in her bed, breaking free from the confines of a nightmare that seemed so real. This moment of awakening was a testimony to her that despite all the trials, she was still able to resist and fight for her happiness and peace of mind. As silence enveloped the world in its invisible blanket, Errol headed to the window of her room to peer through the curtains at the beautifully decorated courtyard of the Imperial Palace. Her heart knew no surprise at the nightmare she had seen, which seemed only an echo of long-ago traumas. The Imperial Palace, majestic and impregnable, now seemed to her something distant and yet so close at the same time. 
She knew that soon a lavish ball would be held here to celebrate the founding of the empire, an event that would bring together the highest aristocracy in color the entire capital in festive colors. Festivals will fill the streets of the capital, turning it into a meeting place for art, music, and dance. Errol, who belonged to the noble family of Brixia, was certainly one of those who had received the coveted invitation to this ball. Her desires, however, lay far beyond social gigs and social parties. Asking for a room for herself in a secluded part of the palace, she sought to avoid unnecessary meetings and glances, wishing to remain in the shadows, unnoticed and mysterious. Her mind was busy devising a cunning plan, the purpose of which was as cruel as she needed it to be, the destruction of her own family. Errol saw it as the only path to liberation, albeit one covered in the thorns of moral dilemmas and internal struggles. Suddenly, Aslan burst into Errol's room with a noise and a whirlwind of emotion. Her voice, full of anger and resentment, cut through the air like a sharp blade, leaving behind the tension and anticipation of the storm. She unleashed an avalanche of reproaches on Errol for the latter's giving their mother a test with an unsatisfactory grade, which now rested on Aslan's shoulders. Her words were accusatory of Errol, as if all of Aislinn's hardships were solely her fault. Aslan didn't hold back her emotions, stating that Errol, being an illegitimate child, should have felt grateful for the life and opportunities she had been given. Errol met this sudden outburst with an equanimity worthy of great strategists. She reminded Aislin that it was the latter who had thankfully asked her, a pathetic illegitimate child, to do her work. Errol emphasized that Aislin, with all the opportunities and resources provided by their family, had to make it on her own. Errol, with unwavering confidence and equanimity, missed no opportunity to emphasize the irony of a situation in which a noble daughter of the great house of Brixia, with all the privileges and opportunities, finds herself unable to cope with her homework. There was an undercurrent of defiance in her words, indicating that Aslan, despite all her titles and status, was losing the contest for dignity and intelligence. To an illegitimate child, she considered an unworthy competitor. The moment when Aislinn, burning with anger and resentment, decided to physically aggress was the culmination of their confrontation. She took a swing at Errol, probably hoping to assert her power and dominance at least through the use of force. But Errol, showing not only outward calmness but also physical readiness for self-defense, deftly intercepted her sister's arm. Clutching her in a firm and confident grip, Errol suggested that the attraction to violence did not appear to be merely coincidental, but rather a deeply rooted family tradition reflecting the general state of their relationship. The moment the tension between Errol and Aislinn reached its climax, Errol, with a determination beyond belief, shoved Aislinn out of the room. The response was Aislinn's immediate and energetic impact on the door that now separated them. With a thunderous roar that would have rivaled the stormy skies, Aislinn began to drum on the door with her foot, accompanying each blow with bursts of angry screams. She promised that such disregard for her feelings and dignity would not go unheeded and reciprocated. Errol, however, seemed unfazed in the face of this storm of emotions that Aslan had unleashed. With an equanimity worthy of the oldest masters of strategy, she set about devising her plan, in which every step was important and nothing could be left to chance. Errol remembered that the Imperial Guard would soon be founded, an elite military unit whose fame would spread throughout the Empire. Her family will be able to use this event as a key moment in their ambitions, intending to secure a lucrative contract to produce equipment for these invincible defenders of the state. But there was a weakness in this plan that Errol knew about. If a defect in shoe production was discovered, the whole deal could collapse like a house of cards under the blows of an invisible enemy. This was the vulnerable spot where Errol was about to deliver her precise and decisive blow, as Errol was absorbed in her thoughts of the trials ahead and the difficulties to be overcome on the way to her goal, her loneliness was suddenly broken by the unexpected appearance of Belfort. His entrance was filled with a special sheen of chivalrous gallantry that one would expect from someone of his rank and position. With the magnanimity and respect befitting a true nobleman, he nobly greeted Errol, creating an atmosphere of politeness and courtesy. At the same moment, he introduced her to the captain of their squad, a man named Ethan Lloyd Burstein, whose name resounded among many as a sign of unwavering strength and determination. Ethan, whose appearance in this scene added to its importance, expressed sincere regret that the circumstances of their visit had been so unexpected and urgent that they had not been able to warn Errol in advance. His demeanor was deeply respectful and professional, 
further emphasizing the seriousness of the moment. Ethan Lloyd Burstein standing before Errol was the epitome of chivalry and the responsibility he carried as captain. His desire to speak to Errol didn't seem like a random impulse or simple politeness, rather it hinted at the importance of the message he wanted to convey. This moment heralded the beginning of something new and perhaps life-changing in Errol's life. Meeting such prominent figures as Belfort and Ethan Lloyd Burstein could not be devoid of profound meaning. In a world where the names of warrior families are held in special awe, Ethan Lloyd Burstein stood out as the consummate hero. His reputation in the circles of knights was impeccable, and his skill in the art of combat was an object of admiration and envy. As a descendant of an ancient and powerful warrior family, Ethan didn't just carry the glory of his ancestors on his shoulders, he elevated it to unprecedented heights. His life was a succession of victories and achievements, and many noble families sought to marry him, offering the hand of their daughters. But despite all these offers, Ethan remained steadfast, rejecting them one by one, as if he were looking for something he could not find in these unions. Errol hadn't even expected such a person to come to her on their own, especially so unexpectedly. The reason for his visit was not a lavish feast or ball, but a serious matter. Ethan explained that thanks to the advice he had received from Errol, he had been able to expose a corrupt man who had tarnished his honor and reputation by his actions. Errol, standing in front of Ethan, sensed that his visit carried much more than just gratitude for his help in solving the corruption case. Her intuition told her that there was something behind it that required deep attention and perhaps even concern. And, indeed, Ethan soon confirmed her premonitions, revealing the gravity of the situation that was weighing on them both. He informed Errol that the corrupt man whose case they had jointly solved in a last-ditch effort to save himself had accused her own father of facilitating the corruption schemes. This accusation was not just a blow to Errol's family, but put her herself in danger before the law. After all, their country has extremely strict penalties for military corruption, sparing no one associated with such crimes. Ethan, trying to find the best way out of the situation, offered Errol his support. He was ready to speak at the trial about her role in uncovering the corruption scheme, emphasizing her unwavering honesty and contribution to the fight for justice. Errol, however, remained unperturbed despite the gravity of the moment. Her refusal of the offered help was not an act of pride or desperation. Errol, steadfastly in front of Ethan, surrounded by an aura of confidence, did not hesitate to express her opinion that Ethan should adhere to the strict limits of the law. There was a confidence in her voice that came from a deep conviction of her own rightness and purity. Errol was absolutely certain that she would be above suspicion, for the blueprint created by her hands was flawless. She recounted the subsequent blueprints, which she suspected had been masterfully forged by her father in a clever attempt to frame her. Errol felt she had all the evidence she needed at her disposal to clear herself of the charges and prove her non-involvement in the forgery. The situation took an unexpected turn when Ethan, like an arrow from the darkness, asked a question that caught Errol off guard. His interest in the reasons why Errol kept her face hidden behind the mask was unexpected and overwhelming. The question, amidst the discussion of legality and accusations, seemed to throw Errol off balance making her look at Ethan in a new way. In the atmosphere of awkwardness and tension that enveloped the room after Ethan's unexpected outburst, Belfort felt a strong rush of consternation and shame. His reaction was immediate and instinctive. He rushed towards Ethan, trying to muffle his words while apologizing for the rashness of his companion's remarks. In this chaos of apologies and attempts to make amends, Errol stood there, racked by waves of surprise that were replaced by calm, as she realized that Ethan really didn't know about why she was considered different by those around her. She revealed that his wearing a mask was due to the exact defect she was born with, an unusual spot around her eye that caused many to call her a monster. All this time, Errol had an amazing ability to remain calm and dignified, even when she had to talk about such personal things as her physical features. After the tension had subsided a bit and everything seemed to be discussed, the moment of parting came. Errol, with a note of regret in her voice, mentioned that she would not be able to attend the upcoming ball, which was no doubt a disappointment to everyone. Ethan, as a sign of respect and understanding, responded to her words with a graceful bow, emphasizing that he hoped to meet soon when the right opportunity presented itself. 
In the depths of her thoughts, Errol couldn't escape the feeling that Ethan was an enigma, the embodiment of something unfamiliar and unusual. His ignorance of her past and the lack of any malice or contempt at the mention of her mask made her wonder. She was used to people addressing her history or appearance with prejudice or spite, but Ethan was the first to show genuine interest without a shadow of judgment. It was so unlike anything she was accustomed to that it set off a flood of speculation in her about his true motives and character. Suddenly, as if on some unknown signal, Ethan looked back, and in that moment there was a strange silence between them. Time seemed to stop as they looked at each other, trying to read the secret thoughts behind the looks. The moment dragged on, filled with unspoken words and emotions until Ethan made a nod, a gesture that could mean anything from goodbye to a confession of some elusive connection between them. Ethan turned and walked away, leaving behind a whirlwind of questions and vague premonitions. Errol was left standing alone, overwhelmed by the waves of confusion and bewilderment caused by that strange look. After Errol and Ethan had separated, she tried to return to her routine, eager to focus on her intended plan of action, but thoughts of their recent encounter continued to swirl in her head, keeping her on her toes. She wondered why Ethan was so interested in her mask. There was something unusual about his gaze, which seemed capable of seeing much more than mere outward appearance. This gaze seemed to penetrate through, seeking to see the essence hidden behind the mask, to reach the depths of her soul where her true feelings and experiences were stored. Errol's musings were suddenly interrupted by the voice of a maid, which broke into her thoughts like a cold gust of wind. Alice rushed into the room, her face expressing the urgency and importance of the moment. The words that came out of her mouth cut through the silence like lightning. The Duke was looking for Errol. This news instantly shifted Errol's attention from her inner worries to the upcoming meeting. After all, when the Duke sought someone out in person, it always heralded events of importance— in the darkened room, where every rustle seemed to ring out a sentence, Alice, overwhelmed by the unbearable burden of fear through restrained tears, squeezed out words filled with terror and despair. She told of the Duke's cruel threat to cut off her legs if she did not do his bidding and could not convince Errol to attend the upcoming ball. At the moment when despair reached its climax, Alice, losing all caution and forgetting the chasm that dissected their statuses, fell to the ground. Like the last ray of light in an endless darkness, she turned to Errol with a plea for help. For Alice, who carried on her fragile shoulders the care of her siblings, the request for help was a cry of the soul, a prayer for salvation. Errol, faced with this revelation, felt a wave of icy coldness spread through her body, caused not so much by the horror of the situation as by an all-consuming anger toward her father. Her teeth clenched involuntarily in anger and a flame of hatred and determination flashed in her eyes. Alden, the key figure in this game of fates, became the object of the insistence of his friend who, without melting his discontent, demanded the immediate commencement of the long-awaited show promised by Alden. With an unyielding calmness that embodied the confidence and equanimity of a strategist, Alden replied, urging patience, emphasizing that true art requires only the right moment. And so the climax of the evening came as the doors to the hall slowly swung open, like a gateway to another world where every step decides fate. Errol stepped through the door and instantly drew everyone's attention, becoming the center of the evening's universe. With every step she took, a magical silence spread through the room, an anticipation of something incredible that was about to unfold before the eyes of the assembled audience. Alden, who had been watching the scene, could not conceal the malicious triumph that glimmered in his eyes. The smile that played on his lips was full of gloating and confidence in his power over the situation. Errol, like a ray of light breaking through the dark clouds, slowly but surely made her way towards her father. At that moment, Alden, whose figure emitted an aura of authority and control, addressed her with a remark disguised as concern. He portrayed concern over Errol's absence among the guests, claiming that his concern was due to a potential stain on her reputation that could prevent her from appearing at the ball. These words, however, caused among the audience not sincere approval, but rather restrained laughs and smiles because it was clear to everyone that Alden's words were not the truth, but just another play on words, another attempt to humiliate or joke on his daughter. In the midst of this tense atmosphere, Alden suggested that Errol take off her mask, ostensibly to test how the reaction of those gathered would change upon seeing her face without any adornment or cover. Errol, however, with her inner strength and dignity, did not let this manipulative challenge bring her down. 
Calmly and confidently, she replied to her father that she did not need to give in to such provocations and remove her mask, showing her autonomy and refusing to play by the rules imposed on her. The moment Errol exchanged glances with her father, her lips curved in a sneer, as if shrouded in a fog of incomprehension as to why he insisted on seeing her at the ball. A question flashed in her gaze, aimed straight at the heart of her father's intentions, like an arrow ready to strike him with surprise. Was he planning to mar her evening by exposing her to public ridicule? But instead of answering, she, full of determination and misunderstanding, turned around like a leaf in the wind, ready to walk away from the unwanted dialogue. Alden, however, moved quickly from words to action. His hand, heavy and relentless, grabbed her wrist. He called her a despicable daughter, his voice filled with anger and frustration as he ordered her to remove her mask, as if it were not just a demand but a judgment reflecting the depth of their family strife. At that moment, the air around them became tense, as if before a storm threatening to break with renewed vigor. Errol staggered like a ship in a storm from the sudden onslaught of memories that came ruthlessly at her in waves from the past. Alden's every word, every gesture drove her into a labyrinth of fear and pain, where every turn reminded her of the trauma to her mind and body. Dizziness swept over her. The world around her began to seem unreal, and at that moment in time when she was most vulnerable, Alden, knowing no pity, reached for her mask, eager to shatter the last bastion of her vulnerability and secrets. The moment Errol felt the waves of the past ready to engulf her, she gathered her will into a fist and pushed Alden away with wild determination in her eyes. Her actions were swift and decisive. She turned to flee, eager to carry her fears and pains away from this place where every corner reminded her of suffering. But fate, it seemed, had decided to make a change in her plans. Some invisible enemy tripped her, and she lost her balance and fell right in front of the crowd, which was not stingy with criticism. Whispers and indignant voices filled the air, accusing her of lacking manners and knowledge of etiquette as if it were the worst offense at that moment. Suddenly, amidst the chaos and confusion, Errol realized that her mask, her shield hiding her deepest secrets and fears, had shattered. Her heart sank with horror as she realized the implications of this misfortune for it seemed to her critical to conceal the disappearance of the spot around her eye, which might have revealed her secrets before their time. It was her plan to keep her true self in the shadows until the hour came when she could use her advantage to strike at her own family. But now that the last barrier between her secret and the world had been destroyed, Errol felt a new storm brewing, threatening to destroy all her plans and hopes of retribution. As the tension reached its climax, Errol, with a slight hesitation, reached for her mask, but her gesture was abruptly interrupted. Ethan's soft but determined cloak stood in the way of her goal like a wall, forcing her to stop and rethink her intentions. Ethan, whose movements were full of sympathy and understanding, crouched next to the broken pieces of the mask, as if trying to piece together not only its physical shards, but also Errol's shattered feelings. His question about the girl's condition was not without sincerity, and as he handed her the mask, he glanced at Alden, Errol's father, whose expression was full of bewilderment and sudden realization. Alden, so accustomed to his role as an unyielding defender of family values, is caught off guard by Ethan's actions to help his daughter. Alden's stunned expression was quickly replaced by a flash of anger, like a flash of lightning cutting across the sky. With a loud and emotional outburst, he exclaimed, emphasizing that regardless of Ethan's social status, he had no right to interfere in Brixia's intimate family affairs. The cry was more than just words. It was an expression of Alden's deeply held belief that family problems should remain within the family, inaccessible to outside intervention, even if that intervention carries good intentions. As if from the depths of the unknown, as if summoned by the very excitement of the day, Crown Prince Estian Yulgoth Ausland entered the scene, whose appearance instantly transformed the atmosphere. His sudden appearance acted like a magic elixir, dispelling the clouds of misunderstanding and tension enveloping Brixia and Ethan's family. Prince Estian, possessing not only blood rights to the throne but also an unrivaled sense of humor, easily turned the drama of the moment into comedy, declaring with a sparkling smile that all the fun had begun without his knowledge. It was as if he were joking about what was happening, presenting the situation as if the ball had been arranged solely for the amusement of Alden, whose emotions were far from enjoyment. Prince Estian, who possessed a powerful aura and impressive authority, didn't need loud words to emphasize his presence. His gaze, 
heavy and piercing, like a sword that could cut through the darkest clouds, was fixed on Alden. His gaze carried not only power, but an unyielding demand for the respect for order and harmony that the prince valued above all else. Alden, pressed by that look, felt like a small child caught in leprosy. A shiver ran through his heart, forcing him to apologize in spite of his usual defiance and firmness. Ethan, with an unwavering sense of compassion and generosity, gave Errol the support she needed at this critical time. As the darkness of ignorance and fear enveloped those gathered around them, Ethan became Errol's support, helping her up. Despite his noble efforts, however, the ominous tongues of those around him did not abate. Like dark waves spreading farther and farther away, rumors spread that Errol was not just an unusual person, but also a monster that had been cursed. These baseless accusations caused a wave of panic among the aristocracy, who believed that the misfortune allegedly emanating from Errol could affect them themselves. In response to the baseless accusations and growing hostility, Errol's gaze became a weapon more powerful than any sword. Her eyes, which hid the depths of her soul, filled with pain and misunderstanding, at that moment released all the accumulated energy of despair. That look, menacing and full of unspoken threat, frightened the aristocrats present. What they saw in her was not just a fear of the unknown, but a reflection of their own dark fantasies that they harbored in their hearts. At this point, gripped by uncontrollable fear, people began to scream, accusing Errol of being a demon, not realizing that the true evil lay not in the one they were pointing their fingers at, but in themselves, in their ability to see in others only what they had decided in advance to see. From the very moment Ethan stood up, his status as not just a participant in the event, but a defender of the dignity of those present, became obvious to everyone. With all the authority he possessed, he called for order, reminding the audience of the high status of the event, hosted by the imperial family itself. His words, spoken amidst the hustle and bustle, were filled with an unwavering certainty. Anyone who was invited to the ball, regardless of their background or the rumors surrounding their name, had an unquestionable right to respect. Any statement even indirectly pointing at Errol could now be seen as a direct insult to the imperial family itself, under whose patronage the event was held. Errol, standing in the center of attention, was overwhelmed by a mixture of feelings. On the one hand, she was overwhelmed by Ethan's unexpected support, whose intervention seemed so incredible and inexplicable. In the privacy of his space, Ethan was again gripped by a vague, uneasy foreboding about Errol's condition. He couldn't shake the thought that her ailment might be more serious than it seemed at first glance. A shadow of concern flashed in his eyes as he turned to her with questions about her well-being. Errol dismissed his concerns with a slight smile, assuring him that their society was already willing to attribute any of her troubles to a curse. She emphasized that the medical community tended to attribute her every ailment to magical misfortune, regardless of the true causes. Nevertheless, she didn't hide her gratitude to Ethan. Her words sounded sincere and warm as she talked about how his support had helped her leave the ball, which could have been a real ordeal without his intervention. Errol noted that amidst the general rejection and resentment she faced every day, even from her own father, Ethan was the only one who had shown a willingness to help. Her words emphasized the deep isolation she was in, where even those closest to her avoided any contact with her, as if her very presence was something undesirable. Ethan, in turn, became that ray of light in her dark world, showing kindness and caring when it was so needed. Suddenly, during their conversation, Ethan's gaze fell involuntarily on the small but disturbing wound that adorned Errol's bosom. Without the slightest hesitation, he set to work applying to the wound the rudimentary first aid measures he had mastered during his soldiering days. Ethan explained to Errol that such techniques were often used in the field when emergency care was needed, and confidently added that it should help her ease the pain and prevent possible inflammation. With the utmost care and precision, as if treating the most fragile treasure, Ethan wrapped the wound on Errol's leg with a bandage. His hands moved confidently and gently while Errol felt the inner discomfort and awkwardness of such close contact. For her, this gesture of caring was something unusually precious, because apart from Overa, Ethan was the first person to show her genuine kindness and concern, this moment was extremely important to Errol, for his actions carried not only physical relief from the pain, but also emotional support that she had been unable to count on for so long. From her early years of life, Errol faced the cruel attitudes of those around her, 
As a wounded person, instead of the expected support and care, she was always met with ridicule and humiliation. She was considered too weak a monster, not deserving of even basic compassion or help. Those hurtful words had eaten into her heart, leaving deep wounds as painful as the physical ones. Errol has learned to wear a mask of indifference, hiding her true feelings and beliefs under a layer of outward indifference. She felt she was destined to put up with this loneliness and accept ridicule as something inevitable, part of her destiny. However, there was a change in her life that forced her to rethink her routine. For the first time, she found someone she could turn to not only as a comrade but also as a confidant. She suggested that Ethan move to a more intimate level of communication, letting him know that there was room for sincerity and openness in their duet. Now, in seclusion, Ethan could address Errol using her name, which symbolized not only a break with formalities, but also a recognition of the deep connection that had begun to form between them. This gesture from Errol was not just an invitation for more intimacy, but a quiet cry for help, a desire to be heard and understood, something she had been deprived of for so long. At the most unexpected moment, when the atmosphere in the room was filled with anticipation and invisible streams of excitement, something happened that made everyone present freeze and shift their gaze to the doorway. Estienne crossed the threshold, whose appearance was a surprise to everyone. His gaze glanced around the room, and he immediately felt part of the unique atmosphere that reigned here. Estienne was not here by chance. He was driven by a genuine desire to learn about the condition of Errol, whose name had become almost familiar to him of late. He stepped inside, gently but firmly interrupting the solemn greeting that had begun, as if trying to say, This is no time for formalities. The words came out of his lips about the anxiety he felt about the events that had happened. But that wasn't the only thing that worried Estian. His desire to meet Errol had been spurred on by stories of her deeds, how she had been able to help in the capture of a corrupt man whose name was mentioned too often in conversation. Estian shared his reflections on how important moments in history are sometimes overshadowed by dark deeds. He expressed concern about the situation when, during a temporary truce, when half of the budget is spent on the army, the key figure responsible for the supply of military weapons is involved in corruption schemes. A man like Alden Brixia, who held such a significant role in the provision of the army, ended up undermining the confidence and security of the state through his actions. But even in the face of such blatant corruption, the imperial family faced an obstacle that prevented them from simply arresting Brixie. The situation was confusing and required not only evidence, but also a subtle approach so as not to cause a political crisis. In this predicament, Errol Brixie, despite her obvious connection to Alden, showed incredible courage and integrity by making a tip-off against her own relative. Her decision not only contributed to Alden's exposure, but also to ensure that all actions were done in strict accordance with the law, further emphasizing her honor and integrity. Estian taking a moment to express his sincere regret for the misunderstanding that had occurred at the ball. He admitted with a note of surprise in his voice that he was amazed by what he saw, the warm relationship between Errol and Ethan, which seemed something unexpected to everyone present. Estian did not hide his surprise, for Ethan, whose name was rarely associated with such events, had outdone himself this time. He had not only honored the ball with his presence, but he had also shown himself to be a true protector of Errol, embodying gallantry and nobility. Ethan, sensing the attention on him, was embarrassed by Estian's sudden openness. His reaction was instantaneous. He asked Estian to stop talking about it, wanting to leave what had happened out of the discussion. Such a conversation put Ethan in the unexpectedly vulnerable position of having to face the inner turmoil he had tried to keep secret from others. Ethan, with a note of sincere regret in his voice, turned to Estiana saying that by protecting Errol at the ball, he was apologizing for his question about Errol's mask earlier in the morning. Estiana, for his part, didn't take long to respond. He accepted Ethan's apology with ease and understanding, at the same time recalling a past incident that also involved tactlessness. It was about Ethan's childish curiosity when, without thinking of the consequences, he asked Estian about such a delicate matter as gray hair. This moment, when recalled, added a note of forgiveness to their understanding and a realization that sincerity and openness can sometimes cross the line. Errol stated that she didn't see anything tactless in Ethan's question about the mask, as she felt that it was not a desire to offend or reveal any flaw, but simple childish curiosity and no malice. 
These words from Errol brought a special atmosphere of understanding and acceptance to the conversation, emphasizing that true friendship and respect can transcend momentary misunderstandings and imperfections in communication. Errol, with her keen instincts and deep understanding of human motivations, felt the need to look into the situation in more detail. She turned to Ethan with a question that seemed important to her understanding of the whole picture. What had prompted him to ask the question about her mask, which had been the subject of their previous discussion? Errol's question was not just an attempt to grasp the details of the past dialogue, but a desire to understand the underlying reasons for Ethan's interest in her face hidden behind the mask. Ethan's answer was heartfelt and revealed new facets of his perception of Errol. He admitted that it wasn't just the accessory hiding part of Errol's face that caught his attention, but the confidence and directness of her gaze. Ethan described her look as that of someone so strong in spirit and confident that the opinions of others didn't matter to him. This perception was a mystery to him, for in his eyes she did not look like someone who sought to hide anything from the world, much less her face under a mask that could be perceived as an attempt to hide some kind of ugliness. But the most important thing was that the red eyes and some kind of stain around the eye would not affect Errol's abilities in any way. The crown prince noted that he liked her bloodshot eyes in general, as they were one of a kind and could charm anyone. The moment the crown prince turned his attention to Errol, he was struck by her gaze, so unusual and mesmerizing that he compared it to a rarity of imperial blood. He spoke with admiration and conviction that such unique traits made Errol a truly outstanding individual, no less special than the very imperial family to which he belonged. Her eyes were not just a mirror of the soul, but a symbol of her unique origin and extraordinary destiny, which, like a hint of a great destiny, distinguished her among others. Estian, as he continued his musings, touched on the other side of such exquisite uniqueness. He assumed that Errol probably feels a great deal of pressure from others, who never cease to marvel and admire her unusual gift. This pressure, in Estian's opinion, is nothing more than an additional confirmation of her exceptionalism. After all, to be special by birth is to carry the views and expectations of many who see you as something greater than yourself. Errol, thoughtfully weighing Estian's words, shared her doubts about how his reaction might have changed if he had confronted her true face hidden behind the mask. She expressed the idea that people's views are often limited by their perceptions based solely on what they see in front of them. In this context, the mask served not just as an object of mystery, but as a defense against prejudice and judgment, hiding what Errol called her ugliness from the public eye. This mask was her shield, allowing her to maintain her dignity and privacy without being subjected to unnecessary scrutiny and evaluation by outsiders. Errol also emphasized that Estian's call for openness and sincerity, particularly his suggestion to remove his mask, was too reckless. She pointed out that Estian, not knowing the full extent of her life, had no idea of the trials and hardships she had endured. Her words sounded like a reminder that behind every choice, even seemingly small ones, there are reasons and a story behind them that are not always visible on the surface. Errol emphasized the importance of understanding and respecting everyone's personal experience, suggesting that the true knowledge of a person is hidden behind the facades we choose to show the world and the masks we are sometimes forced to wear to protect our vulnerability. After exchanging thoughts with the prince, Errol realized that her words sounded too harsh, perhaps even rude to a man who undoubtedly had sincere feelings and intentions for her. The realization that she was standing before the heir to the throne awakened guilt and regret for her rash candor. With an apology barely audible whispered through her lips, she hurried away, leaving Estian to ponder. As she moved farther away, her steps became faster and faster until they became a sprint. Errol's heart was pounding in her chest, not only from the physical exertion, but also from the storm of emotions brought on by the recent conversation. She regretted her words, realizing that Estian was only trying to be kind and supportive. A sudden pain in her leg made her stop, and in that moment, breathing in the cool air, she thought about her situation. This pain wasn't just physical, it symbolized a deeper emotional wound as well. Errol realized that despite her best efforts to change her fate, she was still in a difficult position, perhaps even worse than ever before. This moment of epiphany was like a bitter pill for her, confirming that even going back in time was not a cure-all. Standing alone with her thoughts, Errol tried to find the strength to accept her present and perhaps find a path to a better future, despite all the difficulties she had to overcome. 
A voice suddenly erupted from the shadows behind them, breaking the silence and bringing Errol out of her musings. Errol, who was walking ahead, felt Ethan catching up with her. His concern for her condition was palpable even in the air. He noticed her limping and offered his help, wanting to ease her way to her room. As soon as he said those words, Errol felt the sudden pain in her leg intensify, as if her wound had responded to his concern and become more acute. Ethan, seeing her distress, became more insistent in his offer. His voice was filled with determination, and he was ready to support Errol no matter how hard the road to her room was. He stood before her, determined and ready to come to her aid, like a warrior ready to stand in defense of his comrade. Errol, for her part, thought for a moment. She assessed the situation, weighing her pride against her need for help. Her gaze, full of skepticism and independence, slowly softened under the influence of Ethan's genuine concern. Finally, she held out her hand, accepting his offer. At that moment, there was an invisible agreement between them, cemented by Errol's quiet assent. Her acceptance of help became a symbol of trust and understanding, which added a new, deeper connotation to their relationship. In the back of her mind, Errol was surprised to find Ethan feeling quite comfortable in her company. She couldn't understand why he was so insistent on offering his help, especially given her not always friendly behavior toward him. Her thoughts swam in a sea of doubts and misunderstandings, trying to unravel the mystery of his motives. Like a wind of change, Ethan suddenly solved the riddle as if reading her doubts. He turned to Errol, stating that she could address him by his first name. It wasn't just a suggestion, it was an invitation into a world of deeper and more personal connection. Ethan admitted that he was deeply impressed by Errol's unwavering steadfastness of conviction, her ability to stand up for her principles even when it seemed disadvantageous or dangerous. He expressed a desire to get to know her better, to explore the depths of her thoughts and attitudes that made her so unique. This moment was a turning point in their relationship. Ethan not only showed care and help, but also expressed a sincere interest in her inner world, in what drives her soul and thoughts. Ethan, like a wizard creating a bridge between two souls, made a promise to Errol that made her heart sink with wonder. He promised to see her as she really was, without masks or pretense, recognizing her true nature. The words touched Errol deeply, leaving an indelible mark on her soul. She was amazed and at the same time fascinated by his ability to accept her without reservation, seeing true warmth and depth behind the facade of her outward rudeness. As the next day dawned, Errol was still mulling over this unexpected moment in their relationship. Lying in her bed, she tried to unravel the mystery of the moment Ethan had created with his words. It seemed to her that there was more than words hidden in his promise. It was something that even Errol herself could not fully comprehend or explain. She felt that moment imprinted on her soul, changing the way she looked at the world and the relationships between people. In this morning silence, when the light of the first rays of the sun was barely breaking through the curtains, a maid entered the room. Her appearance was as sudden as the wind that rushes into a closed room, and the words she brought were like a light breeze heralding change. The maid announced that Errol had a visitor. This news interrupted the flow of her morning thoughts and reminded her that even in her most introspective moments, life continued to flow, bringing with it new encounters and events. In Errol's family circle, where words and actions were often intertwined in a complex pattern of relationships, Perez Brixia always stood out for her distinctive stance. Unlike her brother and sister, who never missed an opportunity to banter with Errol, Perez preferred silence, watching from the sidelines. Her silence was mysterious and heavy, like an unread book left on a shelf. There was a depth in Perez's eyes that Errol could rarely unravel, and her stillness seemed to speak more than the words of others. And then, in one unexpected moment, Perez broke her usual silence. Her words to Errol were full of regret for their father's actions at the last ball. This confession was as unexpected as a spring rain suddenly breaking through the clouds. Perez held out the gift to Errol like a bridge seeking to span the chasm between their hearts and made a remark filled with mystery and a warning. It should only be used as a last resort. Perez's gesture wasn't just an act of compassion or an attempt to atone for their father's actions. It was something more. In presenting the gift, Perez opened the door to an uncharted world of possibilities for Errol, leaving behind questions and riddles. The gift was a symbol not only of the physical object, but also of trust, of the secret that Errol was about to reveal. 
Perez added a new dimension to their relationship, leaving Errol to ponder the depth of her words and the situation of the last resort for which the gift was intended. After Perez left the room, Errol looked at the gift left for her with interest. It was a mask whose craftsmanship and design spoke to the significance of the gift and the fact that Perez probably guessed how important it was for Errol to hide her face. Despite the outward appeal and possible value of this mask, Errol did something unexpected with it. Without much thought, she threw the mask into the closet as if it were just another item of no particular importance. The gesture was full of determination and haste, reflecting Errol's inner state at that moment. Errol, consumed with the many chores and responsibilities that demanded her attention, didn't find time to pay special attention to the gift from Perez. Her mind was a whirlwind of thoughts and plans for the time ahead, with no room to think about the mask and the cryptic words that accompanied its presentation. For Errol, standing on the cusp of important events and decisions, any distraction seemed unnecessary, even if that distraction was due to a mysterious and possibly important gesture on Perez's part. Alden was seized with anger like the sea in a storm, his heart beating in time with each surge of emotion triggered by the article about the incident at the ball that had cast a shadow on his reputation. In this maelstrom of resentment and outrage, he resolved to find Errol, the key figure in this expose, to demand an explanation. His footsteps traveled toward the room where he thought Errol might be hiding. The maid who met him, as innocent as the dawn, tried to be an obstacle in his path, claiming that Errol was not in attendance. Alden, however, disregarding her words and resistance like a wind that knows no obstacles, pushed her resolutely to the side and stepped inside. The room he entered seemed empty, as if there had been no laughter or rustling footsteps for a long time, and in that silence, Alden felt only the echo of his anger. Carefully surveying the space around him, his gaze became sharp like a blade searching for a target. And so, amidst the peaceful surroundings where every object seemed frozen in anticipation, he discovered the notes. Those pages innocently lying on the table turned out to be the very investigations that exposed his, Alden's, corruption. They seemed like ravens gathered in a clearing, each letter and word like a carcane exposing his secrets in the face of the inexorable truth. These documents were silent witnesses against him. Their presence in this room seemed a shout amidst the silence. The exposure that was now in his hands was unwittingly the last evidence of his downfall. Clutching the papers in his hands as if they were the last straw that could keep him from falling into the abyss, Alden turned to the maid. His voice cut through the silence of the room like a sword ready to strike. His tone was so resolute and uncompromising that tension hung in the air, portending imminent consequences for those who dared to oppose his will. He demanded to know where Errol was, and every word out of his mouth sounded like a sentence from which there was no escape. At the same time, away from this tense atmosphere, Errol and Ethan were in a completely different world. They wandered through the vastness of the library, which was filled with a silence that could tell more than any words could. This place held knowledge hidden from the eyes of many, and it was here that Errol hoped to find information vital to her goals. The library was more than just a repository of books, however. Access was restricted and could only be entered with an official escort. Ethan played the role of such a chaperone. His presence was the key that opened the door to this temple of knowledge for Errol. Together they paced between the rows of bookshelves, searching for the very pages that might shed light on their research, unaware of the storm that was brewing outside the library walls. In the silence that enveloped the vastness of the library, where every book held a piece of history, Errol was on the verge of a clue that could change everything. Her goal was to conduct an in-depth examination of the transactions her family had made over the past 10 years. This investigation was not idle curiosity, it had a good reason. There were suspicions that there may have been corrupt schemes involved in the conduct of the cases, and that somewhere in the depths of the records lurked a double register that could uncover the truth. The possibility of such a revelation carried not only familial but also societal consequences, for exposure could undermine the credibility of their home. Thanks to Ethan, who acted as her official chaperone and opened doors for Errol that could hide the truth behind, she had a unique opportunity to delve into this complex maze of papers and records. It was a moment when their combined efforts could shed light on decades of doubt and suspicion, offering a chance for clarification or, conversely, confirmation of the worst fears. In this quest, 
Errol was driven not only by a desire for knowledge, but also by a sense of responsibility to her family and community, striving to ensure transparency and honesty in the conduct of affairs that affect many. Immersing herself in a world of numbers, documents, and contracts led Errol to a discovery that made her heart beat faster. Among the many pages she flipped through with the hope of uncovering the truth, she found a glaring discrepancy in the documentation for the procurement of armor parts that reminded her of a previous case involving military footwear. This discovery was more than just numbers on paper. It was confirmation of her suspicions that her family's business dealings may have been marred by corrupt schemes. Errol was convinced that this was just the tip of the iceberg. Her intuition told her that if one such discrepancy had been found, there were likely other yet undiscovered errors or malicious manipulations in the documentation of her family's numerous deliveries. However, the vastness of the data made the task colossally difficult, almost impossible for one person without assistance. In addition, there was the thought that the inspectors might have been deliberately obstructed in their search, which hinted at the possibility of bribery on the part of those who sought to conceal the truth. This discovery not only strengthened Errol's resolve to go all the way in her investigation, but also confirmed her fears that corruption schemes may have penetrated deeply into her family's affairs. She realized that she was faced with not just the task of finding evidence, but of bringing purity and decency to her family and community, uncovering all the hidden corners of corruption that may have remained in the shadows for decades. At that critical moment, when Errol was confidently declaring the safety of all the original blueprints, the library space was suddenly filled with a tense atmosphere, the air saturated with the dust of ancient books and the silence of a scholar's retreat was suddenly cut by Alden's loud cry. Despite the strict prohibitions and rules that guarded the peace of this place of knowledge, Alden had entered its confines with anger and determination. His sudden appearance was a clear disturbance to the calm of the library, a place where words were usually whispered, not shouted. He had come to deal with Errol, whose actions he felt were out of line. Alden's sudden shout cut through the silence, drawing everyone's attention to him. At that moment, the library, usually an oasis of knowledge and privacy, became a confrontation arena where two completely different views of truth and justice were about to collide. In an emotional outburst of anger, Alden loudly demanded that Errol follow him. But at this critical moment, Ethan stood resolutely between them like an insurmountable barrier, protecting Errol from possible anger. He boldly expressed that already at the ball, it had become impossible to ignore Alden's obvious cruelty to his daughter, which had caused tension in the air. Alden, not recognizing the objection, brusquely dismissed Ethan's remarks, saying that this was just a family squabble in which outsiders were not supposed to interfere. However, suddenly Errol, as if under the influence of a sudden burst of courage, decided to accept the challenge. She showed unprecedented determination and declared her intention to speak to Alden alone, away from prying eyes and ears. Their upcoming conversation promised to be crucial, possibly capable of changing the course of their family drama, leaving Ethan and those around them in tense anticipation of the outcome of this bold initiative. Errol, facing her own father, showed unyielding determination, setting a strict boundary for their conversation. She gave Alden exactly ten minutes, emphasizing that Ethan wouldn't have to wait too long for her. It was an expression of her independence, but also an attempt to protect Ethan from the long wait, which emphasized her concern. However, as soon as they were alone, Alden immediately showed his aggression by striking Errol. With anger in his voice, he accused her of ingratitude, ignoring her courage and desire to defend herself and her beliefs. The situation escalated when he grabbed her hair in an attempt to physically dominate and humiliate her, saying she had no right to raise doubts about his authority as a father. At this point, Alden reminded Errol that she was a bastard child, as if trying to diminish her importance and right to justice. His words were filled with contempt. He threatened that all the blame for the corruption in the family could easily be shifted to her, using her status as a weapon against her. This moment alone between father and daughter exposed the depth of strife and cruelty in their relationship, showing the struggle for power and respect within the family drama. In the most tense moment of their clash, when the atmosphere was saturated with anger and aggression, Errol did something unexpected. She smiled. This gesture, full of secret knowledge and unbending will, struck Alden like lightning. Her smile was not a sign of fear or submission, it was a true expression of inner strength and determination. Errol, not losing her focus even under the pressure of Alden's brutality, declared with unbreakable certainty that he had only five minutes left. 
These words, spoken with such confidence and calmness, only increased Alden's anger. He, seized with rage, was about to strike another blow, the epitome of his anger and frustration at his daughter who dared to stand up to him. However, at the most critical moment when tensions had reached a climax and it seemed that further violence was inevitable, there was an unexpected turn. The voices of the guards casually passing by were like a message of fate entering the room causing Alden to stop. This sudden sound from outside was a kind of salvation, for it interrupted the cycle of violence that had been frozen in the air. Alden, realizing that any further action might attract the attention of the guards and raise unwanted questions, had to restrain his anger. This moment was the breaking point in their confrontation, where Errol, despite all the threats and physical violence, demonstrated not only her resilience and courage, but also her ability to remain steadfast even in the face of the darkest challenges. With heaviness in her voice and visible regret in her eyes, Errol expressed her opinion, emphasizing that Alden had missed a unique chance to punish her and thus guarantee himself a front-page spot in the leading newspapers. It was a moment full of tension as the words hung in the air, escalating the situation. Alden, for his part, could not remain indifferent to her words. He grabbed Errol's hand with ease and determination, his eyes searching her gaze for answers. What are you going to do, Errol, when you betray your own family? He asked, trying to plumb the depths of her soul with his gaze. At that moment, as if lightning had pierced his mind, Alden smiled as if his face was ready to burst. His smile wasn't simple, it was piercing and relieved at the same time, as if he suddenly understood the reason for her rebellious behavior. He came to the conclusion that all this rebellion, this outburst of defiance and desire for self-expression, may have been caused by Ethan's influence. This moment of discovery for Alden was a kind of turning point in their relationship. Seeing Errol in such a new light, influenced by someone else's opinions and actions, added complexity to their relationship. At the same time, it allowed Alden to see her not only as a family traitor, but also as a person capable of decisive and unconventional actions under the influence of feelings. This moment was a kind of test for both of them, a test of the strength of the bonds that united them and of their willingness to understand and accept the changes that were happening to each of them under the influence of external and internal factors. At a moment when the tense atmosphere had reached its climax, Alden, with the equanimity peculiar only to those who are sure of their words and actions, expressed a thought that struck him with its directness. He said that Errol's marriage to Ethan, against all expectations, would play into his hands. Those words sounded like a verdict, opening a new chapter in their complicated relationship. Errol, feeling the mounting pressure of those words, could not refrain from reacting harshly. With violent indignation, she broke free of his grip, exclaiming that Alden had, in her opinion, lost touch with reality. Alden, however, did not let the moment go unnoticed. With a haughty smile and the gait of a man who knows more than he reveals, he headed for the exit. His next words were filled with heavy meaning and warning. He stated that Errol, through her actions and choices, was unknowingly following her mother's path of hanging on to men, which could lead her to a similarly deplorable end. This comparison, piercing and merciless, was intended to make Errol think about the consequences of her decisions and behavior. Such words certainly left a deep impression on Errol's soul, causing a flurry of emotion and reflection. Alden, on the other hand, as he continued on his way out, left behind an atmosphere of unresolved questions and unresolved issues, emphasizing the complexity of their relationship, where every word and every action has profound meaning and consequences that impact their shared future. Errol, returning to Ethan after a brief absence, didn't hesitate to apologize for making him wait. Ethan, upon meeting her, couldn't help but notice the new abrasion that insidiously adorned her face. His reaction was instantaneous and full of concern. He literally leapt from his seat to be by Errol's side, gripped by a strong desire to comfort her and find out what had caused the new damage. His concern was so palpable that he seemed willing to take on all of Errol's pain just to put her out of her misery. Errol, for her part, despite her apparent physical discomfort, displayed remarkable calm. With an ease and equanimity that would have elicited admiration from anyone who witnessed the scene, she motioned for Ethan to leave the public space and retreat to the more private setting of her room. Her offer sounded like an invitation to a safe space where she could unashamedly share her experiences and perhaps find solace in the privacy that her personal territory offered. This moment becomes a testament not only to their mutual trust and depth of connection, but also a demonstration of Errol's strength to maintain her dignity and presence of mind even in the face of pain and trouble. In a room filled with cold light, 
Ethan gently applied the ointment to Errol's cheek, carefully touching the delicate skin so as not to cause her additional pain. In that moment in time, the world seemed to stop for both of them, and understanding and caring filled the space around them. Ethan, whose face had previously been clouded with doubt and skepticism about the investigation Errol had immersed herself in, finally found the strength to acknowledge the importance of their case. The abrasions and scratches on Errol's face were silent testaments to her intransigence and willingness to follow through despite the odds. At the beginning of their work together, Ethan couldn't fully support Errol, because the accusations involved her own father, a man in a high position of authority. It called into question everything they did and made Ethan wonder about the morality of their endeavor. However, as he watched Errol's steadfastness and determination, he saw the situation in a new way, realizing that true strength lies in the ability to stand up to even the closest of people when it comes to justice and truth. You can always count on me, no matter what the circumstances, even if it doesn't involve an investigation. Ethan's words sounded sincere and warm, adding to Errol's confidence that she had chosen the right path. This moment became a turning point in their relationship, because Errol felt not only support for her actions, but also personal affection for Ethan, who was able to see beyond the simple investigation the depth of her motives and aspirations. In the heart of the conspiracy, where the winds of change had already begun their inexorable dance, Errol, a woman of indomitable will and clear purpose, approached Ethan with a proposal filled with courage and determination. Her words were weighty and full of determination. Together, they could uncover and probe the depths of her family's accounting to expose and destroy the corruption that was undermining the foundations of their powerful empire. In her opinion, such actions would not only cleanse her family name from the stain of dishonor, but also make the empire unshakably strong and powerful. Ethan, a man whose heart and mind were used to weighing every decision, couldn't immediately understand what ulterior motives were driving Errol. For amidst the noble intentions of her plan lurked the risk of self-sacrifice. She could pay with her very life for being part of a family marred by corruption scandals. But Errol, being one step ahead of doubt and apprehension, had already foreseen this. With a confidence that allowed no doubt, she shared with Ethan that she had a cunning plan that could keep her safe from the possible consequences. To realize it, she needed not just help, but an alliance with Ethan, whose role in her plan was key, because it was Ethan who could earn Errol's trust. Thus, Ethan was faced with a choice that could change not only their fates, but the future of the entire empire. As he weighed the pros and cons, he realized that he was facing not just the task of deciding whether to help Errol, but also the question of whether he was willing to be a part of the history that would be rewritten by their combined efforts. The realization that their plan required action far bolder than mere words came to Ethan the moment Errol confirmed the need to leave the confines of the family mansion to begin their mission. There was a determination and willingness to take risks in her nod that Ethan couldn't help but respect. After a moment of thought, he took a breath, full of determination, and agreed to be the very shield that would protect Errol from whatever storms lay ahead of them. He realized the weight and significance of his decision, Realizing that from that moment on, their fates were inextricably linked. Errol, for her part, made no secret of the fact that her trust in Ethan was absolute and unconditional. Her words that she was relying on him carried with them not merely the hope that their plan would succeed, but a deep sense of mutual respect and faith in his strength, intelligence, and nobility. Their deal, made not on paper but with hearts and words, became the symbol of their union, with Ethan promising to protect Errol no matter what. This promise laid the foundation for their common future in which, shoulder to shoulder, they would face all challenges, preparing to fight not only external threats but also those that await them in the shadows of the most unexpected places. Amidst the shadowy patronage of the ancient trees where every rustle and glance of unseen eyes is woven into the mysterious fabric of the forest, a raven suddenly came to life, a mute witness to a secret agreement. With a grace unique to the feathered guardians of ancient secrets, he snapped from his observation post, cleaving the air with wings filled with mysterious foreshadowing. In its flight lurked a fateful message, and only a moment later this messenger of unknown forces landed softly on the hand of a man of special significance in Errol's life. This man, who had once taken the place of her one true friend, already knew in the back of his mind that their paths would soon cross again. This moment of the raven's landing like a sign of fate emphasized the invisible link between past and future, between long-lost ties and the new circumstances that would bring them together again. 
In a world where power and aristocratic prestige dictate the rules of the game, the ability to feel and understand the emotions of others becomes a matter of survival. Ethan, realizing this, turned attention to the emotional state of others into a kind of art. He chose his companions carefully, focusing on those who could react to various situations in his stead, creating a shield of other people's reactions and feelings around him. This tactic has helped Ethan not only survive, but thrive in an environment of aristocratic intrigue and manipulation, where every move and word can be met with both support and betrayal. However, his carefully constructed world began to change with the appearance of Errol. Before their meeting, Ethan had only been skeptical of talk about the mysterious masked lady whose mystery caused an endless stream of gossip and speculation among the aristocracy. These rumors annoyed him, for they distracted him from more important and real matters, seeming to add only unnecessary intrigue to a world already crowded with them. But when Ethan finally came face to face with Errol, his perception changed dramatically. Suddenly, through the thin veil of mystery, he felt an unexpected sense of intimacy and understanding that had previously seemed unattainable in his surroundings. This meeting was the beginning of a new chapter in Ethan's life, the moment when he first encountered something he couldn't fully control through the emotions and reactions of others. Errol appeared before him not just as an object of rumors and gossip, but as a living person, capable of destroying all his ideas about the world of aristocracy and how to survive in it. Errol, realizing her involuntary slumber, hurriedly apologized to Ethan. Her words were full of sincerity and care, because while she was sleeping, Ethan was working tirelessly, bringing order to the chaos of documents they were trying to sort out together. Errol, noticing the weariness in his eyes, suggested that he rest. Her offer sounded soft and caring, as if she wanted to take on some of his burden, letting him know that she was ready to support him not only in business, but also in moments of fatigue. In response to her offer and concern, Ethan turned to Errol with sudden seriousness. Something flashed in his eyes that made the atmosphere between them thicken with anticipation. He stated that he had a question, the importance of which was beyond question. This moment was a turning point in their relationship, foreshadowing possible changes. Now that Ethan had ventured to ask his question, it indicated a willingness to go to a deeper level of interaction, perhaps even involving personal feelings and relationships between them that could radically change the nature of their bond. That evening, Errol crossed the threshold of the magnificent hall, where all the important persons of the state were gathered for the sole purpose of accomplishing a mission critical to her future plans. Her gaze was fixed on one of the most powerful and capable vassals of the powerful Brixia family. The strategic importance of this meeting for Errol was undeniable, for her future relationship with Count Jer Grieve, whose influence in the kingdom was hard to overestimate, depended on its outcome. Errol, realizing the gravity and responsibility of the moment headed towards her target interlocutor, her steps were full of determination, a desire burning in her heart not only to win his trust and favor, but also to spoil the strong ties between the Count and her own father. It was a risky move, but Errol realized that it was the kind of bold and unexpected decisions that could lead to success in the delicate game of power and influence that was unfolding amidst palace intrigue and political ambition. It was events like the ball that became the arena for subtle manipulations and refined strategies, where the end justified the means, and success was measured not only in the favor of powerful persons, but also in the ability to overturn existing alliances and create new, more advantageous for themselves. In the course of their conversation, Errol, with grace and subtlety, began to steer the conversation toward the poignant and titillating question of her own father's reputation and actions. She skillfully touched on the themes of his profligacy and incompetence, creating an image of a man who not only loses control of his own life, but also jeopardizes the well-being of the entire family business. Count J. Rus, a man of keen intelligence and insight, took these words as a test, perhaps even a hint of a test of his own principles and values. Errol was quick to set the record straight, however, explaining that her words were not meant to test him, but rather to offer an alternative. She made a personal suggestion, emphasizing that she was convinced the collapse of the family business was inevitable because of her father's incompetence. In light of these circumstances, Errol expressed her desire to separate her interests from the fate of the family business and start her own business, a call to action at a time when old structures were about to be torn down and replaced by something new and prosperous. 
Errol presented herself not just as an heiress, but as an enterprising person, ready to take risks and responsibility for her own future. It was brave and yet calculated, for for Count Jairus such a turn of events presented not only potential risks, but also new opportunities. Errol, for her part, showed not only a deep understanding of the situation, but also a willingness to act, which must surely have made the Count interested in and respectful of her person. In the back of his mind, Count Jair pondered over the situation, stumbling upon a riddle he had to solve. He was both surprised and attracted by Errol's desire to remove his own family from power, for such actions seemed to him something unbecoming of a noble man. However, as Errol unfolded the canvas of her explanation before him, the picture became clearer. She revealed to the Earl the secret of her position in the family, revealing that her own blood refused to see her as a member of the family, ignoring her opinions and desires. Moreover, she claimed that her actions, which seemed treasonous on the surface, actually carried care and protection not only for the Brixia family, but for the family of Count Feud himself. Errol placed before Count Jairus a choice that carried the weight of a historic moment, become an ally of a new force, represented by herself, eager for reform and change, or remain in the camp of her incompetent father, whose decisions could lead to unfortunate consequences for all parties involved. This choice was not an easy one, for it required not only political calculation, but also personal courage on the part of the Earl to break away from traditional ties and side with someone who many felt had betrayed his own nest. Errol standing before the Count was the embodiment of determination and a new beginning. She offered not just an alternative to the current state of affairs in their world, but a vision of a future where conflicts and disagreements could be resolved through bold but thoughtful decisions. After a long and draining negotiation, evening came, and Errol finally found a moment to rest and reflect. She spent the entire day in a tense atmosphere where every word and gesture could be decisive. Despite the inner fatigue and emotional exhaustion caused by the need to constantly hold herself up and analyze the situation, the results of her efforts were quite impressive. She was able to get eight of the 13 key figures on her side, made possible in part by the invaluable support of Count Jerus. This success was important not only as a strategic achievement in her plans, but also as a personal victory, an affirmation of her ability to persuade and lead. This success was especially significant when you consider that Alden, her father, was still blessedly ignorant of the events around him. Errol wondered how long she had managed to keep her actions a secret from the head of the household, whose ignorance played into her hands. This fact only added to her confidence in the correctness of her chosen course and in her ability to control the situation, despite all the difficulties and obstacles. As she sat in the privacy of her room, Errol reflected on the path she had traveled and how each step, each decision she had made had brought her closer to her desired goal. She realized that the road ahead was still long and thorny, but today proved to her that the goal was achievable. At that moment, while she felt the weight of fatigue on her shoulders, she also felt the lightness in her soul from the realization that she was on the right path. At that unusually tense moment, when the maid crossed the threshold of Errol's room with unprecedented caution, carrying the anonymous parcel in her hands, the atmosphere around her seemed to freeze in anticipation. Errol, whose senses teetered on the edge of curiosity and anxious foreboding, could not escape the thought that something dangerous, perhaps even a bomb, might be lurking inside that mysterious box. Such times had accustomed her to caution, when even the most seemingly innocuous events could turn out to have unpredictable consequences. But when the carefully untied ribbons and carefully opened wrapping exposed the contents of the package, the tension in the air seemed to evaporate, giving way to an entirely different feeling. The maid watched Errol's reaction with barely contained excitement. Her gaze slid over the exquisite lines of the dress, studying every stitch, every curve of the fabric which seemed lighter than air, the dress by Garrig Odman was not just a garment, it was a message, a riddle that invited one to unravel it, who was behind this generous yet anonymous gesture. His name was known all over the world, and his creations were considered the epitome of elegance and sophistication. It was a dream for any lady to receive a dress from such a master, and even more so when it arrived in such an unexpected way, in a room filled with the thin light of the morning rays. The maid stood before the magnificent dress, her eyes shining with admiration and involuntary awe. 
She turned to her mistress as if to convey a piece of her excitement and in a quiet voice overflowing with anticipation said that this dress would be perfect for the upcoming event that was to be the culmination of the entire period of balls, the masquerade ball. It was not just a dress, but a symbol of a new chapter, an opportunity to start over, an opportunity to right the wrongs of the past. A couple of days ago, Errol met with Ethan, who, with a serious expression on his face, informed her that despite Errol's recent lapses in behavior, the prince had personally invited her to the masquerade ball. The gesture was unexpected, as circumstances might have been an obstacle to such an invitation, but the prince seemed willing to forgive recent transgressions and offer a chance for redemption. Errol, at first stunned by this turn of events, soon felt a surge of determination. It was clear to her that this masquerade ball would not just be an evening of dancing and entertainment, but an opportunity for her to personally offer a hand of reconciliation, to take the chance and apologize for her past actions. It was a chance not only to regain her lost trust, but perhaps to open the door to a new future, where the mistakes of the past would be left behind and a path full of promise and new beginnings would be laid out before her. She finally realized it was a gift from Ethan, which sent her into a flurry of feelings and gratitude. The dress was made of the finest material and was so frankly beautiful that it instantly caused her a wave of embarrassment. It seemed too daring and revealing for her usual style. Her faithful maid, noticing the hesitation in her eyes, quickly stepped in, urging Errol that this dress would accentuate her beauty and symbolize her femininity and sophistication. Those words made Errol think remembering her childhood dreams of gorgeous dresses that seemed unfulfilled. In her dreams, she saw herself as gorgeous and irresistible, but reality was cruel and having a spot on her eye made her give up her desire to stand out and be noticeable. And this inner conflict between the desire to shine and the fear of being rejected because of her imperfection tormented Errol. She seriously considered refusing the gift and offering the dress to Virus, who, in her opinion, could wear it with more dignity and confidence. Errol turned to the maid, ordering her to prepare everything for the masquerade ball, including the dress Ethan had given her. The air was filled with excitement and anticipation of the great event. The day when the long-awaited masquerade ball was to take place had finally arrived. Asleen, overflowing with joyful hope, saw this as a chance to change her destiny. She dreamed that this evening would open the door to a new future, perhaps even a cherished marriage. Her heart pounded in anticipation of the miracles that could happen on this magical night. While Asselin cherished her hopes, Perez was somewhat skeptical about the upcoming event. In the past, Perez had been honored as the flower of the ball, the star of the evening and the object of everyone's admiration. She knew the vicissitudes and trials that could accompany such attention. Apparently, it was these memories that made her question the necessity of such an event. Aslan, however, did not lose optimism and confidently declared that it was her turn to shine and become the flower of the ball. But Aslan's words caused Perez an unexpected reaction. She thought about how her friend reminded her father more and more of their father with her, in Perez's opinion, stupidity. After all, Alden's recent antics could cost them their reputation and even get them kicked out of the ball, not to mention the possibility of Aslan becoming the flower of the ball. These circumstances cast a shadow over the upcoming holiday, turning the joyful anticipation into a subject for reflection on the consequences of rash actions. As the evening unfolded in its full splendor, Perez's thoughts suddenly drifted to Errol. Recognizing the importance of the moment, she decided that a conversation with Errol was necessary after they returned home. Errol had spent all the balls up to that point isolated in her room, as if trying to escape from the world and its bustle. Perez was overcome with anxiety and concern for her sister, for Errol's absence from public events suggested the reasons for this seclusion. However, as Perez was already beginning to make plans for future dialogue, Errol suddenly appeared in the hall, appearing before the guests in a completely new image. This transformation was so unexpected and striking that Perez hardly recognized in this gorgeous person the girl she knew so well. Errol's new image seemed to erase her previous perceptions of her, presenting her in a completely different light. This moment was a revelation not only for the guests of the ball, but also for Perez, who suddenly realized that each person conceals something amazing that can, in an instant, change his entire fate. In the midst of the festive atmosphere, as the room filled with anticipation and excitement for the evening ahead, 
Estiana took the floor to officially open the ball. His voice echoed through the hall like music, setting the tone for the evening. At this time, among the many guests, a special place was occupied by Errol, whose thoughts were far from the festive merriment. She was uncomfortable with her boldly chosen outfit, which seemed too revealing for such an event. Doubt and uncertainty plagued her, but her encounter with the attentive maid was a ray of light in this swirl of doubt. The maid offered her a shawl, which not only added elegance to the look, but also calmed Errol's anxious thoughts by shielding her from prying eyes. Despite the temporary relief, one thing remained constant. Errol realized that she would not be able to leave the gala until she had done her duty. The thought of apologizing to Estian, whose role in the evening was undeniably important, was brewing in her heart. This task hung over her like a dark cloud, preventing her from enjoying the magic of the ball. Errol realized that without the fulfillment of this important gesture, her participation in the festivities would remain incomplete and her soul restless. Thus, while Estiana leads the attention of all present with grandeur and dignity, officially opening the evening, Errol struggles with her inner demons and social expectations. Her determination to apologize to Estian underscores her strength of character and depth of education, for admitting one's own mistakes and seeking to correct them is a true sign of a noble soul. As Estian finished his speech, opening the ball, Errol, who had been standing off to the side pondering her next move, was suddenly the center of attention. The graceful and confident aristocrats, like moths drawn to the fire of her unexpectedly discovered beauty, began to approach her one by one. Each of them sought to get her attention and possibly steal her heart by asking her to dance. In this whirlwind of attention and veiled compliments, a slight argument even broke out between them, each trying to outdo the other in the elegance of his suggestion and wit. Errol, in the midst of this unexpected attention, declared with a dignity and confidence that was so rarely evident in her demeanor that she was in anticipation of someone special. Her words, spoken calmly but with undeniable firmness, caused the aristocrats to retreat. They, recognizing her inflexibility and respecting her desire, bowed with slight words of respect, commenting that such attentiveness was quite natural for a lady of her undoubted beauty. Their words, though flattering, left Errol pondering the extent to which flattery was second nature to the aristocracy. She wondered if their attention was truly sincere, or if it was just another manifestation of society's elegant game, in which sincere feelings give way to strategy and gain. Just as the confusion caused by the attention of the aristocracy began to subside in Errol's soul, a single figure stood out among the crowd heading straight for her. It was Estian, whose arrival seemed like a resolution to all of Errol's inner turmoil. With the suggestion of a dance that sounded like a melody, inviting her into the maelstrom of the evening, Estienne became the very somebody whose expectation she had justified to the insistent aristocrats. Against the background of the orchestra playing a magnificent composition, Errol and Estienne, like two stars, began their dance. In a move filled with grace and ease, Estienne shared a secret, lifting the veil on how the dress was chosen for Errol. He said that Ethan had been involved in the choice, and it was thanks to his taste that Errol shone in her snow-white outfit. These words, Estian's admission that he himself had leaned toward black but recognized the superiority of white, added a special note to the evening. It was a recognition not only of Ethan's good taste, but also of Estian's appreciation of beauty and harmony. In the heart of the dance, suddenly, Errol found the strength and courage to apologize for her past behavior, stunning Estian with her gesture. This moment of apology, unexpected and sincere, made Estian freeze for a moment, for he couldn't even remember what he had been asked to apologize for. This exchange of moments between Errol and Estian was the culmination of an evening of dancing and music, where the past gave way to the present and misunderstandings dissolved into the magic of the masquerade. In a moment filled with tension and emotion, Estian, gripped by strong feelings, pulled Errol tightly against him. His heart was beating to the beat of the music that was playing on this magical evening. He began his apology by admitting his own guilt, emphasizing that it was his words that sounded too harsh. You could see the sincerity and repentance in his eyes as he talked about how much he and Errol were alike. Estian shared a deep reflection that behind the glittering titles of Crown Prince Estian and Lady in Disguise are real feelings and experiences that few people think about. It was the moment when the masks dropped and before Errol stood not just the heir to the throne but a man hungry for understanding and acceptance. At the end of their dance, which seemed like an eternity wrapped in magic and tenderness, 
Estian and Errol exchanged mutual bows. It was a gesture of respect and acknowledgement of each other, despite their past misunderstandings. Estian's gaze at that moment was full of determination and hope, as he opened his heart to Errol, confessing that it was for the opportunity to apologize that he had invited her to the ball. He stood before her full of hope for forgiveness and a new beginning for their relationship, which had been tested by adversity but now found a chance to be reborn in a new light of mutual understanding and respect. When the atmosphere between Estian and Errol was becoming more and more intimate and filled with warm emotions, Ethan suddenly appeared, bringing a note of reality into this magical moment. Estian, feeling that his presence might be unnecessary, decided to seclude himself, leaving Ethan and Errol alone. It was a gesture of respect and tact, allowing the other two characters to discuss what was bothering them without unnecessary witnesses. Ethan, standing in front of Errol, couldn't hide the slight embarrassment when he asked her about the dress she wore. His question was simple, but at the same time incredibly important to him, for it was his way of finding out if his hopes that Errol would like the dress were realized. Errol's response was unexpected, however. She turned the conversation in another direction, asking if the dress looked good on her. Ethan, visibly puzzled by this turn, and at the same time touched by the question, nodded embarrassed. He admitted that it was the first time he saw the dress completely finished, and that his choices were limited to color, while Estian was in charge of the design. At that moment, Errol put together the details of a picture that she couldn't fully understand before. The revelation that Estian had been behind the choice of the dress's design clarified many things for her, she realized why the dress was so revealing and unusual for her. Ethan, standing across from Errol, couldn't help but admire her looks and the grace she radiated in her dress. His gaze locked on her involuntarily, and realizing this, he hastily put on his mask, trying to hide his excitement and embarrassment. This gesture added an unexpected intrigue and mystery to the moment, enhancing the atmosphere of ease between them. Errol, noticing his embarrassment, decided to redirect the conversation to an easier topic by asking Ethan for his opinion on her look. She wondered if he still had the impression of her straightforwardness that he might have formed from their previous encounters. Ethan nodded in agreement and cautiously added that perhaps his perception of her character might have been incomplete because they didn't know each other that well yet. There was a note of sincerity in that confession and a desire to make it right when he expressed his hope that they could spend more time together in the future to get to know each other better. Errol, meeting this suggestion with slight embarrassment but also interest, agreed. This moment was the beginning of a new chapter in their relationship, symbolizing an opportunity for a deeper and more meaningful understanding. Their subsequent dance was the embodiment of this new beginning as they held hands and swirled in the flow of the music, allowing themselves to forget everything for a moment and immerse themselves in a world where only they, their music, and their dance existed. This dance became not only an expression of their mutual sympathy, but also a sign of readiness to open up to each other even more, stepping towards new discoveries and mutual understanding. Estian looked at the couple with a smile as if they were his own brainchild that he had invested time and effort into. On that gloomy evening as the stars hid behind the clouds, the Brixia family, returning from a splendid ball, were swept by waves of indignation. They hotly debated the choice of the flower of the ball, a decision they felt was completely unfair and undignified. The voices of their annoyance echoed in the night, every word soaked in frustration and reproach. Veritas, however, stood aloof from this family tumult. He spent the entire evening flirting with the girls with ease, and it seemed that the worldly disputes of his family did not concern him in the slightest. His nonchalance and lack of participation in the family outrage only fueled the fire of the argument. Suddenly, Alden, the elder of the family, ordered everyone to be quiet with a loud and commanding voice. His word, intended as a means of ending the heated discussion, suddenly provoked a new wave of quarrel between the children. The conflict flared up with renewed vigor, like a storm in the heart of the ocean, and each of them tried to shout over the other in an effort to prove his point. Errol stood apart from this chaos, watching her relatives in bewilderment. She wondered how could a family as honorable and noble as Brixie's allow the trivialities and misunderstandings of everyday life to so profoundly overshadow their dignity and family values. Her gaze full of disappointment and misunderstanding slid over the faces of her family, and a doubt crept into her heart. Were they really worthy of the title of ducal family if they could not maintain unity and mutual respect even at times like this? This scene, 
filled with arguments and discord, seemed to her not just a family quarrel, but a symbol of a deep rift in the heart of their noble family. While Errol stood aside, immersed in her thoughts on family values and spiritual unity, Perez quietly approached her. Her eyes were sincerely interested and the atmosphere of a forthcoming confidential conversation was in the air. Perez, with a slight smile, asked Errol a question that made the latter tense up. Had she been to the recent masquerade ball? At that moment, an uneasiness stirred in Errol's heart. Her thoughts swirled in a chaotic swirl of guesses and doubts about whether she had made some mistake that might give away her presence at the ball, despite her precautions. However, to her indescribable relief, Perez suddenly changed her stance. With a light and apologetic tone, she suggested that perhaps she had simply mistaken Errol for someone else. That someone turned out to be the girl who was honored that evening by being named Flower of the Ball, the ultimate recognition of beauty and grace at the event. This admission from Perez was like a balm to Errol's soul. Her tension slowly eased, giving way to a sense of relief and surprise. Surprise at how unexpectedly circumstances can unfold, and how easily one can become the object of misconception even in a gathering as splendid and varied as a masquerade ball. After a brief but emotionally rich interaction, Perez shared her thoughts on the girl honored with the title of Flower of the Ball, expressing her admiration for her courage and the brilliance with which she lit up the entire evening. However, as if suddenly realizing that her frankness might be misunderstood, Perez quickly apologized, and asking Errol to forget what she had said, disappeared among the crowd, leaving Errol to ponder the strangeness of the encounter. At home, in the cozy and familiar surroundings, Errol felt the weight of the fatigue that had accumulated after the ball. This evening had been filled with so many impressions and experiences that her thoughts now flowed smoothly from one event to another, finding no rest. At such a moment, when her soul and body needed rest and solitude, her nurse came into her room. This person was not just a servant or a nurse, but a true symbol of home and motherly care, the embodiment of warmth and understanding that everyone needed. The sight of the nurse, however, made Errol uneasy. Her face was emaciated and her eyes were heavy with fatigue, as if she had long been unable to find rest or had been struggling with an ailment. Errol, feeling genuine concern for her nurse's health, tried to express her concern and offer help. But the nurse, despite obvious signs of fatigue, shied away from any talk of her condition, insisting that Errol not worry about her. With the love and tenderness inherent in her, the nurse led Errol to the bathtub she had prepared in advance. The water in the tub was the perfect temperature, and the fragrant oils dissolved in it promised relaxation and peace. This gesture of caring was a reminder to Errol that despite all the outside storms and turmoil, there is always a place of calm and solitude where one can regain strength and harmony with oneself. In one of those rare moments when time seems to stand still, allowing the soul to briefly free itself from the heavy shackles of everyday life, Errol found the opportunity to enjoy the long-awaited calm. She plunged into the depths of the bathtub, whose waters promised healing not only to her body, but also to her wounded soul. This rare moment of relaxation was an oasis in the desert of endless intrigues and fights in which she was involved. Errol realized that such moments of solitude and peace would be rare in the near future. Her thoughts raced ahead to the tasks and trials that awaited her outside this sanctuary. The trap for Alden, complex and sophisticated, had already been set, and her plans, ornate and dangerous as a chess game with an unknown outcome, had been successfully realized. However, winning one battle did not mean the end of the war. Errol was well aware that destroying the Brixia family would require not only time and effort, but also the forging of new connections and the weaving of new intrigues. This was the next stage of her intricate plan, the path to which she had yet to contemplate. Suddenly, like a bolt of lightning, a name flashed through her mind. Ethan. This man could certainly be the key to realizing her next move. The thought of him, however, brought an unexpected reaction. A wave of color washed over her cheeks and her heart beat faster. Errol tried to push the excitement away, but it was already lodged in her heart like an uninvited guest. The feeling embarrassed her for in a world where every step could be fatal. Personal emotions were a luxury she couldn't afford to waste time on. But at the same time, this fleeting moment of weakness reminded her that despite all the adventures and trials, she was still a person capable of warm feelings and experiences, 
even in the thick of political intrigue and power struggles. That evening, as the shadows began to envelop the room, filling it with a soft gloom, Errol found herself deep in thought. She watched her nurse, who had returned from vacation, and couldn't help but notice how much the woman had changed in a short time. Each day it became more and more obvious that the nurse's fatigue was not normal. It was a sign that her illness slumbering within had begun to progress with renewed vigor. Errol felt the invisible threads of impending loss weaving their web around her, foreshadowing the imminent farewell to the man who was almost family to her. After much deliberation, clutching the weight of the inevitable decision in her heart, Errol found the strength to suggest to her nurse that she leave the service and return home to her own land, where she could spend her remaining days among the native expanse, perhaps finding peace and tranquility there. But these words, which sounded to Errol like a show of care and compassion, were received differently by the nurse. A shadow of doubt and anxiety flickered in her eyes. She thought that perhaps she had unwittingly made some mistake, invisible to the eye, but sufficient reason for Errol to want to get rid of her. The thought darkened her soul, for the nurse had always tried to serve with loyalty and devotion, hoping to be useful in the house that had become her second home. So there was a misunderstanding between two women bound by years of living together and many warm memories. Errol, eager to ease the nurse's last days, was unable to convey the true meaning of her offer, while the nurse, burdened with the thought of possible guilt, could not imagine that her caring offer was motivated solely by love and a desire for kindness. Errol, standing before her nurse like a statue of determination carved from stone, looked up and directly, with a warmth in her voice that rarely slipped through her usual restraint, spoke words filled with deep meaning and care. She stated that the nurse had dedicated her life to raising Errol, giving her all her warmth and love, and now it was time for the nurse to start living for herself, to find her happiness, to be with her family, where warmth and comfort awaited her. The nurse, this woman who had surrounded Errol with endless care and affection since infancy, was stunned at the words she heard. Her heart seemed to awaken long-forgotten dreams of her own happiness, of a home full of laughter and warmth. But along with these dreams, sadness flared up in her soul, for, as she noted sadly, she had nowhere to return to. The tears that slid quietly down her cheeks became a bridge between past and present as she began to talk about her home. This house was not just a refuge for the family, but a beautiful place that attracted tourists from all over the country, a place where every stone and every tree held stories of joy and happiness. But it was all ruthlessly destroyed in one terrible day when a massacre swept through their peaceful corner, leaving nothing but devastation and ashes. This story, poignant and full of pain, revealed to Errol the depth of the tragedy her nurse had endured and showed how deep and uneasy the bonds that brought them together were. This moment was a test for both, revealing the true strength of their understanding and the support they were willing to offer each other in the most difficult of times. There was a somber moment when the nurse shared the final shards of her broken heart with Errol, telling her of the tragedy that had befallen her family. The family that, like an ominous fog, has shrouded all her memories, leaving only ashes in the place of former happiness. The scene changes, transporting us to a completely different person and place. Far from this scene of grief and sorrow, in a room lit only by the flickering light of candles and a fireplace that cast mysterious shadows on the walls, sat an unknown girl. Her eyes, full of cold calculation, glided over the pages of documents that were spread out before her on the table. She thought of the South, of the place where Errol's nurse's house had once stood. It smells like money there, she said, without a shred of sympathy or sorrow for the tragedy of others. At Errol's behest, a comprehensive study of the situation in the South where two powerful families shared power. Despite the long period of time spanning two decades, clashes and conflicts between these families have not subsided. This constant strife was so protracted that each family repeatedly resorted to hiring soldiers to engage in bloody battles. But the very essence of these feuds, the true cause that impelled them to such long and debilitating conflicts, remained shrouded in the darkness of mystery. This bewilderment raised many questions and assumptions, for a simple family feud could not have led to such widespread and long-lasting conflicts. It was obvious that the root of the problem went deeper than it seemed at first glance, and had much more significant and possibly darker underpinnings than might have been initially imagined. 
This situation challenged all previous assumptions about the causes of the hostility and raised alarms about its true scale and potential consequences for the entire region. In the whirlwind of events unfolding in a world where intrigue and conspiracies are woven as easily as children weave wreaths of wildflowers, Errol, the daughter of a noble family, has become an unwitting witness to mysterious manipulations concerning armaments. A mosaic of fragments of conversations, glances, and rumors began to form in her mind, which seemed to her not random jigsaw puzzles of fate. These bits and pieces led to a dangerous conclusion. The weapons that appeared from the hostile families had a direct connection to her own family name. She was convinced that behind it lay nothing but the cunning design of Alden, whose motives and purposes remained a mystery to her. Realizing that there was a mystery to be solved, Errol made a decision worthy of the heroes of ancient legends. She decided to disguise herself so that she could blend into the crowd, disappear from the enemy's radar, and thus be able to collect the necessary clues. It wasn't just a decision to disguise herself, it was an act of courage and cunning, a determination to act under the cover of shadows to uncover a plot that threatened her family and possibly the world around her. Errol, armed only with her wits and unyielding will, stepped into the unknown, where every rustle and shadow could mean both a new clue and a new danger. She was ready for this journey, driven not only by a desire to protect her family, but also by the certainty that the truth she sought to uncover was crucial to the denouement of this tangled story. Stepping onto the threshold of a pub shrouded in a haze of secrets and half-whispered conspiracies, Errol felt like a hunter on the doorstep of an unknown jungle. She knew this place could be the key to her quest, for it was here, among the worn tables and creaky chairs, that those who could lead her through the shadowy path straight into the heart of the guild gathered. Her hope shone in her eyes like a star in the night, guiding her forward. But then, suddenly, a boy emerged from the shadows. His words cut through the air like a cold blade. He argued that youths like Errol had no place in this stronghold of mystery and arcane knowledge. The irony of the situation was that he hardly looked older than she did. Youth was in every feature of his face, and his eyes sparkled with enthusiasm and inexperience. At that moment, like lightning in a clear sky, a figure undoubtedly related to the young man, his mother, intervened in the dialogue. Her appearance was as sudden as it was decisive, bringing a whole new dynamic to the conversation. Her intervention carried with it the weight of authority and life experience, immediately changing the course of the conversation and adding a note of surprise and tense anticipation. This unexpected turn of events sharpened the atmosphere in the pub, turning it from a simple meeting place into an arena where every word and gesture could change the course of events. Errol found herself in the center of a maelstrom of unpredictability, where each participant in the conversation played a different role in this theater of ambition and secrets. As silence softly enveloped the space between the walls of the ancient house, fate presented Errol with an unexpected twist. Her attention was drawn to a woman with confidence and an unfathomable calmness in her eyes, who had just sent her son away with the sternness of a mother. With an impenetrable gaze that concealed the depths of her thoughts and intentions, she introduced herself as Fabella. There was a scent of mystery in the air with that name, and her voice was enigmatic. Fabella, as if reading Errol's mind, suggested going down to the basement, a place that seemed to hold secrets as old as the building itself. Once in this shelter, Fabella revealed the reason for her proposal without reservation. Her words pierced the silence of the basement, exposing the importance of the moment. Your first visit to the Spy Guild is no accident, her voice seemed to echo off the walls, filling the space with meaning. These words were weighty, for for Errol, a new recruit in a world of shadows and secrets, every direction, every piece of advice could prove decisive in her onward journey. On this not-so-ordinary day, Errol, a character with an unyielding gaze and stately posture, made a request to Febel that sounded almost like a demand. She needed information, and not simple information, but information concerning two noble and influential families from the South, the Marquis of Delphius and Pulgene. These names were not just words, but symbols of long and tangled histories woven with intrigue, power struggles, and unresolved conflicts between two powerful families. Errol's interest in such a specific topic caused Fabella not only surprise, but also a certain amount of excitement. Why had Errol, of all the possible mysteries of the world, chosen this one? Fibela, a woman with a deep knowledge of history and the mysteries that lingered on the shelves of her library, froze for a moment, pondering the request. 
She was amazed, for Errol's inquiry was about nothing other than the South itself, a territory that for years had been spoken of only in whispers, careful not to awaken the secrets that slumbered there. Twenty long years of silence about the South, and now as if a curse had been broken, information about the Delphius and Pulgin families and their age-old strife was suddenly in unexpected demand. Fibella, with a slight sigh of mixed feelings, somewhere between surprise and concern, made her way to the shelf that held the documents that hid the long history of the South. The past that seemed buried beneath the layers of time suddenly found new life in Fibella's hands. She retrieved dusty tomes and parchments that recorded decades of conflict, intrigue, and alliances between the Marquises Delphius and Pulgin. Perhaps these pages held the key to understanding not only past strife, but also future possibilities. Fabella turned to Errol and noted that this was the sixth time she had sold information about the South in the last two months. The remark sounded like a statement of fact, but there was deep intrigue in its implication. What made these secrets suddenly become so desirable, and why had interest in them erupted now? This question remained unanswered, adding another mystery to the existing ones. When Phoebe, her eyes reflecting the light of wisdom and knowledge, said that the information about the South had not been updated in a long time, there was silence in the air for a moment. This moment, like the intertwining of past and present, was a turning point. Errol, standing before her as the embodiment of determination and steadfastness, did not hesitate to respond to this statement. Her words sounded like a command, reflecting not only the importance of the task, but the urgency of its execution. An update is urgently needed. The words sounded like the herald of a change that was inevitable. Showing more than just verbal confidence, Errol also confirmed her commitment by deed. With ease, as if it were a small part of her ability, she handed Phoebe the money, and then, as if to reinforce her promise, added a bag of gold on top. This gesture, filled with generosity and seriousness of intent, was a clear signal. Errol was willing to do much to achieve her goal. The words accompanying her actions carried the promise of even greater rewards once the work was done. So much for you, Fibela will live for a whole year. The words sounded like a mantra, heralding the abundance and security that so rarely accompany the lives of those who collect and sell information. Fibela, meeting such generosity and anticipating the weight of responsibility that rested on her shoulders, was stunned. Errol's reaction, her willingness to pay up front, was something other than mere trust. It was like an act of faith in her abilities and, at the same time, taking a risk that Phoebe didn't even dare to contemplate. And when Errol, already heading for the exit, dropped the words that she needed this information even at a loss, there was a feeling in the air that the stakes in this game were much higher than one could imagine. These words, given almost in passing, invested Fibella's mission not only with weight, but with a certain element of desperation or urgency that made her task all the more important and urgent. So with these words and gestures, a work full of mystery and possibilities was begun that could change not only the life of Fibela, but also reveal secrets that for years had lurked in the shadows of the southern lands. In her final moment in the mysterious halls of the Spy Guild, Errol expressed a final wish that sounded almost like a plea. Her request was unusual, but very important to her personally. She wanted someone to find the nephews of her old nanny, the woman who had once wrapped her childhood in warmth and care. Leaving the thresholds of the guild, whose walls held countless secrets and whose shadows were full of unnamed dangers, Errol sighed as deeply as if she were trying to exhale all the tension and anxiety that had built up inside. Now, standing in the open air, she could only hope that Fibella, her loyal and easily bought companion, would be able to track down the children who were something like a distant but very dear family to Errol. But lo and behold, with barely time to contemplate her next steps and feel the chill of fresh air on her skin, Errol was suddenly and unceremoniously knocked off her feet. The incident happened so swiftly and unexpectedly that for a moment she was even at a loss for words. The culprit of this sudden encounter was a voice that instantly awakened a whirlwind of emotions in her heart, a voice she could recognize from a thousand filled with nostalgia and warm memories. It was Ethan, a man whose name carried so many stories and experiences that even the mere mention of him evoked a complex range of feelings in Errol. And now that their paths had crossed again, at the most unexpected moment, it seemed as if fate itself was hinting that the trials ahead would be closely intertwined with the past they were both trying to leave behind. In the cozily furnished bar of the guild, lit only by the flickering light of candles, 
Fibola and her son were engaged in a tense conversation. The topic of their conversation was not only Errol's suspicious figure, but also her mysterious eyes, hidden behind a mask, which were unsettling and raised a lot of questions. The discussion of their new mysterious acquaintance was full of ambiguities and shadows of doubt. However, despite all the fears and doubts, Phoebe suddenly turned the conversation to the issue of payment, stating with her usual pragmatism that the most important thing was that the customer should pay the guild in full and on time. This outlook, characteristic of Fibela, was a way for her to keep things under control, for money in their profession was not only a measure of success, but also a guarantee of future opportunities. The son, following the logic of the conversation, couldn't resist asking how his mother was going to fulfill the terms of the arrangement with Errol, given that the place in question had been completely destroyed. He was not only concerned, but also personally interested, because he had witnessed the devastation himself at the scene of the events. This moment emphasized not only the close connection between the mission they were discussing and the real challenges they were facing, but also showed how important it was for them to find a way to overcome the difficulties. The son's question reflected the general tension that enveloped their dialogue. The tension between the need to fulfill their obligations to the customer and the reality in which they were forced to find ways to solve seemingly impossible problems. In the guild atmosphere filled with tension and anticipation, Phoebe suddenly showed determination, ordering her son to take care of household duties and clear the tables. That moment was like a flash of light in the darkness, a reminder that even in the whirlwind of secrets and intrigue, the daily routine remained an integral part of their lives. The son, accepting his mother's order with some objection, rose from his seat showing the respect and obedience embodied in their family hierarchy. Meanwhile, Ethan, finding himself at the mercy of a sudden restlessness, realized his oversight. He hadn't recognized Errol under the cloak, shoving her involuntarily. But as the distance between them shortened, and even though he couldn't see her face despite her masked features, something inside him clicked. Her figure, her gestures, her quiet voice, all of it was suddenly terrifyingly familiar. Ethan reached for Errol, trying to catch up, when suddenly their moment of realization was cruelly interrupted. Belfort, like a ghost from the past, appeared out of nowhere, his appearance promising new problems. Belfort was looking for Ethan, and there was determination in his voice, but also a certain menace. The message he'd brought was like a cold shower, a reminder that the world around them was full of danger and unknowns. This moment was a turning point for all the characters in the story, a testament to how personal encounters and chance encounters can change the course of events in unpredictable ways. For Ethan, who was suddenly the center of Belfort's attention, it was an ordeal that required an immediate solution. In the depths of the night, as darkness enveloped the streets, creating a mysterious atmosphere, Ethan met with Belfort. At that moment, Ethan, full of determination and focus, asked Belfort to be unobtrusive and calm. He wished to not be distracted from what he had planned, for the night hid many secrets and possibilities. Belfort, realizing the importance of the moment, still expressed his concern for Ethan's safety for wandering alone through the streets at night could be quite dangerous. This was not a simple walk, but a task that required the utmost concentration and attention to detail. When Ethan noticed that the slightest distraction on Belfort's part had caused a stranger who could have been a key link in their mission to slip away, he couldn't hide his annoyance. With complete seriousness and sternness in his voice, Ethan announced that Belfort was to be punished for his oversight by running 20 laps so that he would show more care and responsibility next time. Parallel to this night scene, another story was unfolding in the lighted and cozy hall of Ethan's home. Estian, the crown prince of this story, was in the company of Ethan's father. The air in the room was saturated with anticipation and tension, for the meeting had dragged on much longer than originally anticipated. Ethan's father, a stern and demanding man, was visibly irritated by the length of the conversation. It was evident from the wrinkles on his forehead and the heavy sighs that broke the silence of the hall. He expected concrete results and decisions, not endless discussions and excuses. Thus, through these two parallel scenes, a picture of the characters' lives is presented to us, full of drama and internal conflicts, where every moment can affect further events and relations between the characters. The day Herzegorin, Ethan's father, was about to leave the meeting was a moment full of tension and anticipation. He was on the point of leaving when his path was blocked by the Marquis of Gerben, Belfort's parent, whose presence added an air of gravity to the coming conversation. 
Suddenly, Estion, young but already full of determination and power, took on the role of herald of the most important news. With the assembly tinged with the seriousness of the moment, he shared that he had summoned the vassals for a reason. The main topic of discussion was the unrest in the South, which had flared up with renewed vigor and posed a threat to stability and peace in their lands. These riots, as it turned out, were not a random coincidence of circumstances, but the result of cold calculation and long-term planning. Estion revealed that at the center of this chaos was an aristocrat whose name remained unknown for now, but whose actions spoke for themselves. This enigmatic character has supported both warring families for 20 years, playing on their feud and thus adding fuel to the fire of a long-standing conflict. But the most horrifying discovery was that a large proportion of the inhabitants, having exhausted their strength and resources in this endless war, had chosen to flee. They left their homes, seeking the shores of the sea, hoping to find salvation away from destruction and death. And amidst this flood of despair seemed to flow a dark river of smuggling, weapons that also left the country, but not to escape the war, but to fuel it, finding their way to enemy nations across the expanse of the sea. Thus, Estion, like a strategist pushing back the fog of war to reveal the true state of affairs, presented before the assembled crowd a picture of treachery and duplicity. The situation in the South no longer seemed a distant and unrelated problem. Now it had taken on a concrete shape causing anxiety and the realization that the enemy was not only outside their lands but also inside, masquerading under the mask of the aristocracy. In response to Estian's revelations, Herzogorin, not without a heavy sigh, brought a grain of historical wisdom to the conversation. With the attentiveness of a man who has endured many trials, he reminded the audience of the Dyslavon War, an epic of struggle and confrontation that ended 30 years ago. He emphasized that victory over the enemy was achieved not so much because of military might and strategic genius, but because of the critical inability of the enemy to support his troops with the necessary resources. This historic moment was a reminder to all present of how vulnerable nations can be when deprived of reliable supply routes. Continuing his point, Herzogorin noted with stark realism that a deal with an enemy state made through the sale of arms, despite the seeming treachery, can be extremely lucrative for those seeking personal gain at the expense of the welfare of their people. He pointed out the practicality and feasibility of such deals, especially since the sea route through the port offers ample opportunity for smuggling of military materials. Even the risk associated with the transportation of weapons in the eyes of an experienced military commander did not seem an insurmountable obstacle because, in his words, a ship carrying weapons can always be sunk. These words of Herzog Gorin reflected the deep ambivalence of the situation, where even the knowledge of possible treachery within the country left no room for simple decisions or immediate action. Estian, who had been listening intently to Duco Gorin, nodded in agreement and understanding of the complexity of the circumstances they faced. The nod was not a simple gesture of agreement, but rather an acknowledgement that the way forward would require not only wisdom and strength, but a willingness to face the darker aspects of human nature. Anyone guilty will be executed regardless of title. In the whirlwind of talk and proposals that were being discussed around that heavy table, modeled with the marks of years of counsel, the Marquis of Gerban made a suggestion that instantly gathered the eyes of all present upon it. The gravity of the moment demanded an extraordinary solution, and the suggestion was to send a man south who would be both unfamiliar to those lands and yet trustworthy enough to be entrusted with such a responsible task. It had to be someone who could get to the heart of the alleged conspiracy without attracting too much attention. In response to this suggestion, Herzog Gorin, with the fervor of a caring father, burst out. His words cut through the air like a sword. He declared that to think of sending his son on such a dangerous journey was absurd. His plans for his son's future were much more peaceful and family-oriented. He dreamed of seeing him married, wealthy, and happy, rather than risking his life in an unpredictable and possibly hostile land. However, Estian, possessing the authority of a just and judicious leader, made a decision that was not up for debate. From his point of view, the perfect candidate for the role could only be Ethan. The decision was met with a mixture of excitement and concern, but no one could deny the logic behind his words. With a force and confidence that left little room for objection, Estian declared that Ethan would head south. The announcement ended the discussions and doubts, leaving behind the walls of the council chamber the expectation and hope for the success of the mission. 
With these words, the meeting was adjourned. The decision was made and a new path opened before Ethan, full of dangers and challenges, but also an opportunity to prove himself and contribute to the welfare of his people. That afternoon, as the sun barely broke through the thick clouds promising the beginning of a new, unpredictable adventure, tension flared between Ethan and Estion, hovering in the air like the harbinger of a thunderstorm. Ethan, not hiding his indignation, accused Estion of being frivolous in his suggestions. At the same time, Estion, with an unfailing calmness in his voice and a slight smile on his lips, argued that the idea of sending Errol south to accompany Ethan was not just a good idea, but a great one. He was confident that Ethan would be able to provide Errol with the protection they needed on their journey, emphasizing that there was an understanding and harmony between them that was rare between travelers. But Estion didn't stop there, adding that Errol was far from defenseless, and in fact she had such skills and strength that she could protect not only herself, but become a support for Ethan if necessary. With his words, it was as if Estion was painting a picture where Errol was no ordinary damsel in distress, but rather a warrior standing by Ethan's side, ready to face any threat, which strengthened their chances of a safe return. Concluding his narration, Estion, without losing his good-natured mood, jokingly suggested that they consider their upcoming trip as a honeymoon, adding lightness to the tense atmosphere, although his words were filled with hidden meaning. This phrase instantly dispelled the heavy clouds of misunderstanding, leaving behind only a slight trace of a smile on the faces of both interlocutors, reminding that even in the most serious decisions there is room for a joke. The moment the dark secret hidden in the labyrinths of the past, embodied in a secret ledger, finally found its investigator in the person of Errol, something happened that turned the tide of her days filled with anxiety over her father's disappearance. For the third 24 hours now, the chill of his absence reeked, when she seemed to have found a clue, perhaps one that could shed some light on his whereabouts. But here, interrupting her immersion in the lines of the ancient text like a ghost from the past, her brother appeared. His appearance was no less unexpected than his demand, a massage that sounded like an order issued from beneath haughtily crossed eyebrows. The air between them shimmered with tension as Errol, undaunted by her inherent wit even in the face of such insolence, reminded him of the times when he, addressing her as if she were an inferior creature, had forbidden even the slightest touch of his majesty, calling her a monster. Her words were like the blow of a whip driving him away from her, but her brother, who would not accept rejection, grabbed her arm as if trying to assert his authority. Yet Errol's spirit was not broken. She broke free of his grip with unexpected strength and determination as if nature itself had rebelled against injustice. But as he swung at her in anger, the space between past and future seemed to freeze, waiting for the outcome of this fight. And then, when it seemed that the air was saturated with the premonition of imminent pain, Ethan appeared, no less mysterious and sudden than the situation itself. His decisive intervention, as he intercepted his brother's arm at the very last moment, was like lightning cutting through the sky. His words promising to break his arm for any attempt to harm Errol sounded not just like a warning but like an immutable law that could not be broken. This moment was the breaking point that exposed the true feelings and relationships between the characters, as if exploding the dynamics in their relationship that had been hidden until that moment. The moment Ethan, like a hero from long-forgotten legends, let go of Errol's brother, the tension in the air began to slowly dissipate like fog in the morning sunlight. Errol, whose heart was still beating in unison with the recent conflict, did not miss the opportunity to draw her brother's attention to his shameful behavior. Her words were precise and sharp, like an arrow shot at a target, intent on awakening a modicum of remorse in his soul. However, as in any drama, fate presented a new twist. The servants, like ghosts appearing out of nowhere, began to gather around, their eyes filled not so much with curiosity as with contempt. Errol, feeling their gazes on her like sharp blades, made the decision to leave, seeking to avoid more humiliation and judgment from those around her. This world, where looks could wound as well as a sword, had once again shown its cruelty. In this melodramatic scene, Ethan, continuing to play the role of unwavering protector, once again emphasized his courage and nobility by comparing Errol's brother to their father, revealing a common trait in them, wildness and rawness. This comparison, which sounded like a sentence, only emphasized the depth of the discord between them. Then, as if seeking refuge from the eyes of the world, Ethan and Errol headed for a room where they could be sure they wouldn't be overheard. 
This act symbolized not just a search for privacy, but a desire to find peace in the storm of emotions that engulfed them. Behind the closed door, they were waiting not only for a conversation, but also for a chance to regain their mutual understanding, in a world where every word and every gesture could have unpredictable consequences. The moment Ethan entered the room, he couldn't help but notice the peculiar atmosphere hovering about, filled with a sense of cleanliness and order, the kind that only Errol's room could boast. There was a silence in the air, broken only by the slight rustle of pages and the soft hum of the outside world through the closed window, creating a sense of hard work and total dedication. Having crossed the threshold of this bright haven of industriousness, Ethan, without wasting a moment, decided to get to the point of his unexpected visit. With some awkwardness and a sense of the importance of the moment, he asked Errol about her vacation plans, gently bringing the conversation to the matter that had brought him here. With a slight huff, as if gathering his strength, Ethan revealed the nature of his visit, explaining that his mission was to head south. However, doing it alone seemed not only boring to him, but also suspicious to those around him. The atmosphere in the room seemed tense when Errol, catching the strangeness of the situation, decided to clarify why Ethan was sharing this information with her. In response, Ethan, with a heavy weight on his heart and regret in his voice, admitted that he was to take Errol as his companion for this journey at Estian's behest. What's more, they would both have to pretend to be a pair of newlyweds. This turn of events promised to be the beginning of not only a dangerous but also unpredictable adventure for both of them, posing many questions and unknown challenges, while the shadows thickened, promising new difficulties and perhaps unexpected discoveries along the way. Ethan's words that Errol didn't have to agree to this unexpected mission added a tinge of respect for her freedom of choice to the conversation. It brought up mixed feelings in her. On the one hand, it was obvious that her participation in this case was not necessary. On the other hand, in the back of her mind, she wondered why exactly she had been chosen for such a role. At that moment, Errol's thoughts began to swirl around the possibilities this trip could provide her. Suddenly, the image of her dear nanny came into her mind, and Errol realized that the journey could be the key to unlocking the mysteries surrounding the old maid's family. This realization filled her with determination. Having made her decision, Errol made a condition. On their journey south, they would have to try to find her nanny's nephews. This request was essentially a bridge between Errol's personal interests and the fulfillment of the mission assigned to Ethan. Ethan, for his part, did not object to such a condition. He agreed, promising to do his best to help Errol in her endeavor. Moreover, Ethan hoped that despite all the potential dangers and unknowns, the trip would give them both the opportunity to visit a couple of scenic vacation spots where they could enjoy the beauty of the world around them and perhaps find peace in their hearts. Thus, an unspoken alliance has been made between Ethan and Errol that promises to be the beginning of an incredible adventure full of mystery, exploration, and possibly danger. But the prospect of unraveling the mysteries of the past and discovering new horizons made their hearts beat faster, filling them with anticipation of uncharted roads and secrets hidden far from their home. Excitement gripped Errol as she, overwhelmed with nervousness, arrived at her destination ahead of schedule. Her arrival did not go unnoticed, and on the eve of her mission, she was surrounded by anxious brothers and sisters, bombarding her with a flood of questions and attention. But now, having overcome her initial confusion, Errol finds herself standing in the Emperor's palace, to which she cannot hide her surprise and amazement. What particularly shocked her was that Estion, showing unprecedented generosity and technological advancement, had granted them the use of a teleportation gate, making their journey much easier. Estion, easily ignoring the excitement his actions have caused the group, calmly explains that the efforts of his mages are to be thanked for this amazing technology, and also his own persuasiveness in the face of his father, which took a lot of dexterity and persistence on his part. The atmosphere of tension dissipates slightly when Ethan, with a touch of suspicion, questions whether Estion has slipped something unusual into their luggage, which is supposed to follow them the traditional way. Estian's reply, accompanied by an enigmatic smile, only heightens the atmosphere of intrigue. Next, Estian, as if though, though to interrupt any doubts and move on to more pleasant things, addresses Errol directly. He hands her something very unusual and mysterious, a stick decorated with vials of potions. These magic potions have an amazing property. They can change the color of hair and eyes. This gesture, though mysterious, is highly symbolic and represents the beginning of a new chapter in their journey, 
filled with both magic and unpredictability of the events to come. The moment Estian proudly announced the completion of all preparations was the turning point for Ethan and Errol. Hand in hand, they made their way to the gate that led to the new temporary shelter. Ethan offering his hand as a sign of support and solidarity, and Errol, who responded to the gesture, crossed the threshold together. The synchronicity of their movements seemed to emphasize their unity in the face of the trials ahead. Once they were inside, Errol couldn't hide her surprise. Everything seemed so familiar and new at the same time. Ethan, sensing her looks, hurriedly clarified the situation, specifying that there was only one bedroom in their temporary shelter. His words sounded cautious, for he was anxious to see if such intimacy would cause Errol any awkwardness or misunderstanding. However, she seemed to have no idea that such a thing could be a problem. Her reaction was one of complete trust and acceptance of the situation, which further strengthened their bond. This moment was not just a transition from one place to another, but a symbol of their willingness to share both the joys and challenges of their journey. It didn't matter to Errol what conditions awaited them. What mattered was that they were together with Ethan and they could rely on each other. This act of mutual understanding and willingness to support each other in all circumstances has only strengthened their relationship, preparing them for the challenges ahead, which they will overcome together, sharing joys and experiences side by side. As soon as Ethan dared to take a seat next to Errol, the atmosphere in the room instantly changed. Errol, sensing the unexpected closeness, was somewhat embarrassed and, on instinct, pulled back, realizing the subtle hint that Ethan had perhaps unwittingly given. Her reaction in turn caused confusion for Ethan, who, anxious to avoid any misunderstanding, hurriedly offered his solution. He, with a noticeable embarrassment in his voice, expressed his willingness to find a lion elsewhere to make Errol feel more comfortable. However, Errol, after a brief thought, stopped him as if crossing a bridge of understanding that instantly brought them close again. She confidently stated that there was no need to find another place to sleep, emphasizing that as part of their assignment together, it was important for them to learn to overcome awkwardness and get used to each other. Her words carried a deep meaning that their interaction and agreement to work together was far more important than any domestic inconvenience. Errol motioned for Ethan to join her and sit on the bed, adding that she was confident in his ability to follow the code of chivalry that promised respect and honor in all circumstances. This moment not only dispelled any doubts and confusion that might have arisen between them, but also built trust. Errol, by taking this step, showed Ethan that she valued his honor and the principles on which their mutual respect was built. Ethan, in turn, felt her trust and understanding, which was confirmation to him that they could work together effectively while maintaining personal boundaries and respect for each other. This exchange of reassurance was pivotal to their time together at the shelter, setting the tone for their relationship for the duration of the assignment. The moment Errol made the decision to lie down, her actions were filled with determination to overcome her inner embarrassment. With ease, as if she had cut through the air, she settled on the bed, her words building a bridge between the necessity of the mission and their current situation. She gently reminded Ethan that for the newlyweds they were pretending to be, sharing a bed together was quite commonplace. Her words were filled not only with the logic of the task, but also with the subtle implication that they needed to get even closer together for credibility. Ethan, guided by her suggestion, carefully nestled himself next to her, trying to keep enough distance for both of them to be comfortable. In that shared silence as they lay side by side, an invisible field of mutual respect and understanding emerged between them. Ethan, whose attention was fixed on Errol, was unnecessarily concerned for her comfort and convenience, to which she, in her own way, responded by shifting her focus to the next phase of their mission. The discussion of the mission took their thoughts from the four walls of their temporary shelter to the wide world of adventure that awaited them. Errol's interest in the next phase served as a catalyst for Ethan to share information about the smuggling gang. He shared his thoughts with her that they might discover important information in the port that would prove pivotal to Errol's mission. At the same time, Ethan hoped they wouldn't meet the people Errol was actually looking for at the port, leaving a vibe of uncertainty and mystery in the air. This exchange of information and thoughts in such an intimate setting only added depth to their relationship, giving their union new shades of trust and understanding. They both realized that they had challenges ahead of them, but in this moment, under the cover of night, they were just two people trying to find common ground and strategy for the adventures ahead. Alden crossed the threshold of his home, 
expecting a warm and joyous welcome, but instead he was met with only silence. Irritation crept into his heart as Errol, his loyal monster, was not there to share the moment of his return. That irritation quickly turned to deep bewilderment when Errol's sister informed him dryly, without too much emotion, that Errol had left the confines of their home and traveled south. The pieces of the puzzle were beginning to vaguely fit together in his head, but not yet forming a complete picture. The intrigue thickened when it was revealed that Errol wasn't traveling alone. When he learned that Ethan had joined her, Alden felt a shock growing inside, as if a bolt of lightning had shattered the peace of his soul. He was truly stunned, as Ethan was the last person he expected to see Errol with together. Putting two and two together, Alden realized that this wasn't a simple journey, but the beginning of something that could do irreparable damage to everything he'd built and valued. Images of how Errol and Ethan might have teamed up against him began to form in his mind, causing him to feel a mixture of anger, betrayal, and determination to act. Without the slightest shadow of doubt in his voice and with iron determination in his eyes, Alden ordered the butler to prepare the telegram at once. There was no time for hesitation. Every second could be decisive. His words sounded like a command before the battle because he was sure that if he didn't take immediate action, Errol and Ethan would have time to destroy not only his reputation, but everything he valued in life. In that moment, Alden realized that he stood on the threshold of a fight that would require not only cunning and strength, but a willingness to defend his own at every turn, even if it meant confronting those he had once considered close to him. Errol was faced with a difficult choice when Estion, their invisible mentor and strategist, offered them outfits for the mission whose beauty and variety could dazzle even the most discerning imagination. The room was a profusion of fabrics shimmering in all shades of the rainbow, and each dress seemed like a work of art. However, when Errol, trying to remain modest and appropriate, chose the most appropriate outfit, she was overcome with embarrassment. This dress, though she had chosen it as the most decent among those presented, was not so modest against the rest. Ethan, her faithful companion and friend, couldn't hide his embarrassment at the sight of Errol in this outfit either. His words were full of admiration. He recognized that the dress was indeed beautiful, but immediately expressed concern that its luxury might play tricks on them. After all, their task required stealth and secrecy, and a bright and flamboyant outfit would only draw unnecessary attention to their person. Agreeing with his opinion, they decided that the best solution would be to find other, more suitable outfits for their assignment. Thus, they went in search of new dresses that would help them remain unnoticed and at the same time look dignified in any unexpected situation. This moment emphasized not only their desire to accomplish the mission in the best way possible, but also their deep understanding of each other, as both felt discomfort and were willing to find a compromise solution. As the city came alive in anticipation of the festival, the streets filled with joy and bustle, Errol sensed that her mask would be nothing out of the ordinary. She was sure that in such a festive atmosphere, where everyone was eager to show their individuality through extravagant outfits and masks, she would be able to become part of the motley crowd, unnoticed and free. When she and Ethan entered the store in search of a new dress, Errol couldn't hide her embarrassment at the sight of the saleswoman. The woman's clothes were incredibly revealing, showing off her skin far more than covering it, which was a real challenge for Errol. However, the saleswoman, noticing her confusion, smiled warmly and explained that this style of dress was part of Southern tradition. She said that the South values the freedom and beauty of the human body, and that their traditions and customs reflect this love of naturalness and candor. Understanding these cultural sensitivities helped Errol to see the situation from a different angle. She began to see revealing outfits not as something provocative, but as an expression of local culture and traditions, which helped ease her initial embarrassment. This exchange of perspectives between the characters and different cultures emphasized the importance of understanding and respecting cultural differences, making their mutual journey even more fulfilling and interesting. In a small but exquisite boutique located in one of the most picturesque corners of the city where every piece of clothing seemed to be art, Something happened that Ethan witnessed and in some way participated in. Carefully and with tender concern for his companion, he approached the saleswoman to pick out an outfit for Errol, the girl who was not only his companion, but also the enigma he sought to understand. The saleswoman, like a magician, disappeared behind a heavy velvet curtain and returned a moment later, carrying six boxes, each containing a marvel of carefully selected fashion. 
Like a river full of gurgling water, the saleswoman poured out recommendations and advice without a word, describing each outfit with great passion and conviction. Errol, consumed by the swirl of colors, textures, and stories behind each of the ensembles on offer, found herself completely unable to make a choice. She, like a ship on the high seas that has lost course in a storm of advice and suggestions, decided not to choose between storms but to take them all, accepting each outfit as a gift of fate, unknowable but enticing. Ethan, watching everything that was happening, felt a kind of revelation, an epiphany that made him look at the situation from a completely different angle. It became apparent to him that the cultural differences between his native lands and this place, the southern lands where every gesture and word had its own particular shade of meaning, were profoundly different from what he was used to. In the capital, where every day was like a game where strategy and calculation led to success, here in the South, heart and spontaneity ruled. This unexpected generosity of Errol's, her decision to accept whatever was offered to her without the slightest doubt or hesitation, reflected the essence of Southern culture, where it is customary to appreciate the moment, enjoy it, and not limit oneself with boundaries and rules. Ethan realized that this trip would open him up to much more than just new landscapes or culinary discoveries. It was opening him to a different way of seeing the world, where it was not so much place and time as feelings and impressions that determined the meaning of the moment. It was a lesson he appreciated as much as the most exquisite outfits that had just become part of his and Errol's journey. Ethan's realization of the subtleties of local customs where love is not hidden behind a curtain of restraint, but bursts forth brightly and openly, was a kind of revelation for him. Realizing that in order for their union, passed off as a marriage of love, to look convincing in the eyes of others, he and Errol would have to embrace local traditions and express their feelings with the same degree of openness and selflessness. It was a test he may not have been prepared for in spirit, but one that their shared mission required. Errol, as if reading his thoughts but doing so with her usual directness and ease, voiced the same thought aloud. Her offer to Ethan to take her on his lap as a demonstration of their supposedly loving bond was the epitome of the very Southern temperament he was just beginning to understand. Such an act, although it seemed natural in the context of local customs, caused a wave of embarrassment in both of them, because for them, adults and independent people, such behavior seemed a step beyond the boundaries of the ordinary. When Errol, without waiting for a response, lowered herself onto Ethan's lap in a graceful and easy motion, it made them both even more embarrassed. At that moment, their faces might have blushed as much as the cheeks of a teenager in love who'd been the center of attention at a public gathering. Suddenly the carriage sprang up, causing them to fall to the floor, for from the surprise they were unable to keep their equilibrium. Ethan, feeling the warmth of Errol's body through the fabric of her clothing, realized that in the face of local traditions and customs, their souls and bodies had to demonstrate a unity that had been made up, but now needed to be made real, taking into account all the subtleties of local etiquette. This moment was not only a test of their ability to adapt to their environment and culture, but also an unexpected test of their own boundaries and comfort. They may not have expected that their journey would present them with moments where embarrassment and discomfort become the price for maintaining the image of the perfect couple in the eyes of the locals. The experience added a new dimension to their relationship, making them stronger, smarter, and perhaps a little closer to each other, despite all the embarrassment they felt. In private, in a moment of indescribable intimacy and delicate rapprochement, Ethan, overcome with embarrassment and uncertainty, voiced the thought that perhaps they should spend more time practicing this art of rapport and tenderness. His words were filled not only with hope for a stronger bond, but also with a hidden fear of not living up to expectations. Errol, for her part, couldn't hide her excitement. On the one hand, she was embarrassed by Ethan's directness and ease, and on the other, angry at his apparent calm. She was torn between the desire to open up and the fear of being misunderstood, while Ethan was actually just as excited. Inwardly, he cursed Estion, whose actions had put them in this position, forcing them to discuss intimacy in such an unusual, intense setting. Meanwhile, in the world outside their secluded haven, the wheels of fate continued to spin inexorably, bringing new challenges and obstacles in their path. A fresh edict came to the city's guards that could turn their lives upside down, Everyone seemed to recognize their faces on the wanted flyers hung on every corner and intersection, though the portraits were drawn crookedly and with a fair amount of imagination. 
The images of Ethan and Errol, though distorted, were undeniably eye-catching, making them recognizable to anyone who had ever come face to face with them. This new turn of events added tension to the atmosphere of their relationship, becoming not only a test for their feelings, but also a challenge that they had to accept and overcome together. As they approached the city limits, Ethan, gripped by a sense of anticipation and caution, handed Errol the ID card that disguised their true identities. These documents, though they were copies, retained their names, thus providing the illusion of familiarity with their personae, but the surnames were changed, thus adding a layer of anonymity to their already elaborate masquerade. Ethan, with his shrewd mind, reasoned that in the southern lands to which they were headed, the use of documents produced with a level of skill that only metropolitan forgers possessed would not arouse suspicion. In these lands, where piracy and smuggling were widespread, such documents may have been considered the norm rather than the exception. It was a world where the boundaries of the law blurred and order was dictated not so much by the letter of the law as by the level of cunning and luck. Ethan, after spending more than an hour thinking about how best to keep himself and Errol safe in this world that was new to them, came to the conclusion that forged documents were their best chance of staying safe. He realized that in cities where power is divided between officials and the shadowy figures who rule the streets, the veracity of a document is often determined not by its provenance but by the confidence with which it is presented. Errol felt mixed emotions as she accepted these documents. On the one hand, she felt gratitude for Ethan's foresight and concern for their safety, and on the other hand, excitement and anxiety about what was to come. The prospect of wandering through a lawless foreign land where their lives depended on a piece of paper seemed at least disturbing to her. As time passed and the wheels of the carriage rolled rhythmically over the winding road, Errol, weary from the day's adventures and the exertion that inexorably accompanied their journey, fell into a deep sleep. Ethan, protecting the tranquility of her sleep, sat beside her, never taking his gaze away, filled with peace and affection. At this moment in time, he was not just a companion or protector on their perilous journey, but a gentle observer, frozen in the silence of the journey. He slowly moved closer to Errol, trying to provide her with more comfort and warmth in the space of their temporary shelter on wheels. Everything seemed to stop temporarily in that carriage. The noise of the outside world, worries and fears. All that remained was silence and two people who were intertwined by a common destiny. Errol was reliving past events in her dream, memories of a ball where the gazes of the aristocracy pierced her like blades, calling her a monster. Those moments filled with anger and rejection marred her sleep, making her heart clench with pain and fear. But a light flashed in the darkness of her nightmare, cutting through the gloom, and a familiar voice stood between her and the scathing words like a shield, promising protection and peace. At that critical moment, when the lines between dream and reality began to blur, Ethan, noticing the worry on the sleeping woman's face, gently touched her to dispel the shadows of the nightmare. His actions were determined and caring. He realized that these dreams were echoes of past fears, and he wanted to protect Errol not only in the real world, but also in her dreams. Waking from his light touch was to be her transition from the world of shadows to the safety of their journey together. Ethan was the light and protection that had appeared in her dream, ready to fight the demons of the past and present for the sake of their shared future. Deep in the dark forest, amidst the sounds of whispering branches and hidden dangers, Errol's heart beat in time with the loud echo of her own fears. The thought that the mask that had become part of her face and soul would forever be her companion made her panic. This mask, symbolizing the fears that tightly wrapped around her heart, seemed like an indestructible fortress. Suddenly, through the veil of anxiety and doubt, Ethan's voice shrill and clear, calling out her name. The sound, like a beacon in a dark night, brought her instantly back to reality. She shuddered and, realizing she was in his warm and secure embrace, hastily took a step back, trying to hide her confusion and sudden embarrassment. Ethan, his eyes full of seriousness and yet tender, shared some important news. He told me that there was a search at the city gate. This information made Errol remember the precautions necessary for their journey. With the ease of a sorceress, she reached into her small but valuable supply of potions, a gift from Estion. These potions, carefully selected and prepared by an old and wise sorcerer, had the power to change the course of their journey. Each vial held wonders and secrets, magical powers that could be the key to their rescue, or on the contrary, the cause of unknown obstacles. This moment, filled with excitement and anticipation of the approaching trials, 
became a turning point in their adventure. Ethan and Errol, united by a common goal and an irresistible longing for freedom, stood on the threshold of uncharted lands, ready for new challenges and unexpected discoveries. A flame of hope burned in their hearts that together they could overcome any obstacle and reach the end of this mysterious and dangerous path. Like a whirlwind suddenly crashing over the calm surface of the water was Errol's realization that Potion's magic had not given her the look she had expected. Panic, swift and merciless, gripped her heart with icy fingers in anticipation of detection. At that moment, Ethan, like a trusted guardian standing between her and the outside world, urged her to stay close. Like a shield ready to defend himself against any trouble, he presented his papers to the guards, stating confidently that he was traveling with his wife. This statement, spoken with unshakable confidence, should have been a pledge of safety, but fate had decided otherwise. The guard, whose eyes did not miss the smallest details, noticed something familiar in Errol's facial features. His attention was drawn to the resemblance to the face depicted on the wanted flyer that had been distributed to the guards. Like lightning cutting through the sky, suspicion flashed in his eyes. He turned to Errol, demanding that she remove the mask to reveal the truth behind that mysterious accessory. His interest was piqued in the spot around Errol's eye, a key element that could confirm or dispel his suspicions. At this critical moment in time, when every moment seemed like an eternity, tense anticipation filled the air. Ethan, standing nearby, was ready for any action to protect Errol from possible exposure. The eyes of everyone present were fixed on Errol, waiting for her actions. In this interaction, where every gesture and glance mattered, people's fates could change forever. On the border of two worlds, where ancient laws intertwine with modern ambitions, our heroes, Errol and Ethan, meet in the face of the unyielding will of the Marquis Delphius. The guards, endowed with power and confidence like the steel guards of ancient times, approach the carriage in which our heroes were. One of them, whose face concealed the impartiality of an executor of his lord's will, announced without a shadow of doubt, the Marquis's orders tolerated no objection. Force was ready to be used without hesitation, like the wind that rushes through the fields, unyielding and resolute. His words echoed like distant thunder in the demand to remove the mask, adding to the pressure Errol felt. The weight of those words was unbearable, causing a wave of anxiety to wash over her heart. Ethan, whose soul burned with a thirst for freedom and defiance, could not stay away at the sight of the threat. His suggestion to defy fate and escape from the carriage like a fire in the night offered the illusion of hope. Errol, however, with a mind as cold as ice and a heart as warm as the spring sun, weighed the pros and cons. The reality they found themselves in was harsh and unyielding. There were too many guards, and every one of them was ready to do their master's bidding without the slightest hesitation. At this critical moment, gathering her will in a fist and overcoming her inner doubts, Errol made a decision that would change their fate. The courage and determination with which she chose to remove her mask, like the last ray of light in the darkness, illuminated their path. This gesture, though it seemed like an act of submission, was full of courage and willingness to face the inevitable. At the moment when Errol's determination touched the very essence of her soul, preparing to reveal her true face to the world and fate, Ethan, like the embodiment of an unconquerable spirit, tried to intervene at the last moment. His hand, moved by a desperate hope of salvation, sought to stop her, to prevent this act of betrayal of herself. But fate, capricious and unpredictable, had already woven a new thread into their story. Like a messenger of fate from across the horizon of time and space, came a messenger, breathing hard from running but full of determination. His arrival was as unexpected as a thunderstorm on a clear day, but as illuminating as sunlight through the clouds. It came from the Earl of Philbot a great friend and ally whose name was known and respected in many parts of their world. The messenger, like a messenger of hope, announced his desire to welcome his friends, Ethan and Errol, referring to them as such with unmistakable respect and warmth. The symbol he presented was no mere token. It was a sign of deep respect and power, a symbol to which even the guards of the Marquis of Delphius with their adamant desire to obey only their master dared not object. This symbol became the key that opened the doors of freedom for them, the wind that dispersed the clouds of doubts and fears. The guards, realizing the weight and significance of the symbol presented, apologized with involuntary respect and restrained awkwardness. They, without further obstruction, let the carriage pass, allowing our heroes to continue their journey. This moment was a turning point, an epitome of how sometimes unexpected alliances and symbols can be decisive in the most desperate situations, 
offering hope and a path to freedom. In the cozy tavern where the aroma of fresh bread mingled with the smell of wax candles, an unexpected conversation broke out at the dinner table. A man who introduced himself as Hordson became the center of attention. He pulled out a letter from under his cloak, sealed with wax, symbolizing an important message. It was a letter from Estian, expressing with unmistakable candor his dissatisfaction with the current situation. Hordson was mentioned in the letter as their designated chaperone on their upcoming trip south. Ethan, who was sitting across from him, could not hide his interest in the events unfolding before him. His gaze was fixed on Hordson as he questioned the reason for the unusual search of their belongings. In answer to his question, Hordson announced with seriousness in his voice that there was a traitor among their ranks. He explained that the wanted flyers with their descriptions had appeared at dawn, long before Hordson had even begun preparing for their meeting with Errol and Ethan. This discovery created an atmosphere of tension and distrust among those present, for now everyone could be a suspect. In the dark atmosphere of accumulated intrigue and secrets, where every whisper could become a link in the chain of betrayal, the question of who was the source of the leaked information hung in the air, ratcheting up the tension. Errol, whose alarm that her relatives were involved in the affair, requested with bitter necessity that a check be made among her family members. The move was a hard decision, but desperate times called for desperate measures. She couldn't afford the luxury of blind trust, even in blood ties, when the stakes were so high. Ethan, whose thoughts swirled around solving this mystery, decided to delve into the details of their arrival in the city. He turned to Hordson to ask how they had managed to bypass the guards and enter the city without being questioned. Hordson's reply shrouded the story in a new layer of intrigue. It turned out that behind their unobstructed passage was none other than the Count, who occupied no small place in the hierarchy of power, being the right hand of the Marquis of Delphius. This Earl, as it turned out, was known for his greed and penchant for self-serving deals, making him an ideal candidate for manipulation. Hordson shared that he exploited this weakness of the Earls to his advantage, offering him a tempting sum for a pass that would allow them to enter the city undetected. Such a move was risky but extremely effective, giving them freedom of action and the ability to operate under the cover of night without drawing unnecessary attention to their personae. This moment reveals not only the depth of the conspiracy, but also Hortzen's cunning and resourcefulness in being willing to use other people's vices to achieve his goals. Thus, their way into the city was secured not only by their negotiating skills and ability to manipulate people, but also by their willingness to take advantage of the weaknesses of those who seem to occupy unassailable positions in the social hierarchy. This story emphasizes the challenges the characters face in their quest to protect themselves and their loved ones, as well as their willingness to cross moral boundaries for a higher purpose. As events unfolded at a tense pace, Hordson announced with undisguised satisfaction that something like a secluded hideaway had been prepared for the protagonists, the atmosphere of which radiated warmth and comfort, creating an illusion of calm and safety in the heart of the tumultuous events. This place, described by him as a nest for lovers, was not only a haven for rest and recuperation, but also a symbol of subtle care for the feelings and emotional state of the characters. In addition to the cozy corner, Hordson handed them a report imbued with crucial information regarding their onward journey and tasks, as if handing them a clue to the situation. Meanwhile, information was delivered to Estian about the current state of affairs in the South, where the situation was escalating by the day. It was reported that local aristocratic families usually involved in constant confrontations and power struggles had found a temporary truce. Joining forces, they decided to confront a common enemy, pirates whose threat has become too tangible. The reason for this unexpected alliance was the crown's intense scrutiny of the region, forcing the aristocracy to take steps to remove evidence of their corruption and secret ties to pirates. Under these circumstances, they sought to get rid of compromising evidence to save face and status. Estion, realizing the depth and scope of the problem, promised that the aristocrats of the South would soon change their ways and stop the practice of bribery and selling arms to enemies of the crown. His words sounded like a vow, reflecting a determination to put an end to this network of corruption that was undermining the foundations of security and stability in the region. 
This pledge was not only an expression of Estion's personal will for displacement, but also a sign of hope that justice would be served and peace and order would be restored to the southern territories, cleansed of dark deeds and conspiracies. After much wandering and trials, Errol and Ethan finally found a temporary shelter where they could get away from the restless homeowner, whose intrusiveness added fatigue to their already accumulated problems. It was a temporary relief, but the weight of unspoken words and unresolved questions hung in the air like clouds before a storm. Errol, sighing heavily as if the entire weight of the world had been placed on her shoulders, opened the dialogue about the difficulties they faced. Her words were full of the realization that the obstacles in their path were far more serious than they had originally anticipated. Ethan, for his part, couldn't hide the regret that crept into his voice. He could hardly admit to Errol that his decision to ask her to join the mission now seemed like a mistake. He saw how difficult it was for her and realized that her difficulties were multiplied by the unforeseen circumstances of their journey. Errol, however, felt the burden of failure and chided herself for her supposed weakness. She recalled the moment when, faced with a deadly threat, she was unable to take decisive action and remove the mask that would have changed the outcome of their adventure. In her eyes, it was a clear indication of the lack of strength and determination needed to successfully complete the mission. Just as she was about to utter words of apology, Ethan, as if reading her mind, beat her to it. He expressed his feelings and concerns, emphasizing that he did not wish to expose her to further risks for his own ambition or gain. His words sounded sincere and reflected a deep concern for Errol's well-being. This moment tested their relationship, showing the depth of their understanding and their willingness to put each other's well-being before their own interests. They both realized that the road ahead would be difficult, but admitting their fears and weaknesses only strengthened their resolve and mutual support in overcoming the challenges ahead. In the depths of the mossy, cozy shelter, where every object seemed imbued with stories of the past, a scene of unprecedented sincerity and openness unfolded. Ethan, the embodiment of valor and honor, took on the role of protector, declaring that his determination to protect Errol would not be shaken by any obstacle, even if it meant sacrificing his own life. At this moment, his words full of courage and self-sacrifice hovered in the air, creating an atmosphere of unshakable confidence in the future. Errol, stunned and confused on the one hand, deeply moved on the other, faced the question that tormented her soul. How could the life of one of the most respected imperial knights, a guardian of ideals and protector of the weak, be valued less than her own seemingly insignificant life? But deep in her heart, she knew Ethan would never allow himself to be deceitful. His words were as pure as a stream in a mountain valley, and she believed him despite her inner doubts, feeling the warmth of his sincere devotion in her heart. Later, when the emotions had subsided a bit and Errol's soul was filled with gratitude and renewed hope, she came across the mysterious bag Hardson had left behind. As she took the bag in her hands, she felt a thrill of excitement, anticipating the discoveries that lay ahead and preparing for new challenges, whatever they might bring. Errol realized that every item Hardson had left behind held special value and could hold unknown power to change the course of their destinies. This object, seemingly unremarkable, but perhaps holding the answers or clues to the next stage of their difficult journey, awakened a sense of curiosity and determination in her. That afternoon, as the sun began to slip toward sunset, its bright rays illuminating the room with a warm glow, Ethan rummaged through Hordson's bag, looking for something important and unusual. His hands finally found the object he was looking for. It was something that was impossible to ignore, despite its diminutive size. Ethan pulled out a small but conspicuous earring, which he christened with the name Communication Device. With some embarrassment, but also with hope in his voice, he asked Errol to wear the earring. His request sounded almost like a prayer, flavored with a touch of tenderness and awe. Errol, feeling incredibly mortified by such a gesture, couldn't resist the offer. With a slight smile, she accepted the earring as if she were accepting not just a piece of jewelry, but a piece of Ethan's soul. She immediately tried on the earring, examining it by touch and then by sight, fastening it to her ear. This act was something more meaningful to her than just wearing jewelry. She looked around herself, trying to see how the earring looked in conjunction with her image, and turned to Ethan to ask if it was too conspicuous. Ethan, in turn, did not miss the opportunity to assure her that the earring not only looked good, but also perfectly harmonized with her red eyes, adding a special charm to the image. 
His words were full of sincerity and admiration, and in that moment it felt like time had stopped to capture that warm exchange of compliments. The compliment, delivered so gently and openly, brought a wave of embarrassment to both Ethan and Errol. They both blushed, like a sunset that colored the sky with warm hues. This moment was not just an exchange of words, but an expression of the deep sympathy and understanding that was beginning to awaken between them. Suddenly, the magical earring came to life, becoming a conduit between the invisible Hordson and his two friends. Though Ethan couldn't catch the words that sounded from the jewelry, Errol served as a bridge to convey the message. Hordson's voice, penetrating through mysterious magical frequencies, carried with it news of a critical discovery. He exposed the existence of anonymous bank accounts located in six different banks that were found to be financing actions in the South. The details of this investigation, according to Hordson, were neatly packed and left in a bag for Errol and Ethan to find. Their task was not only to discover this crucial information, but also to uncover the secret identity of the owner of these accounts, which could shed light on many dark cases. However, the conversation took an unexpected turn when Ethan, as if sensing an inner impulse, decided to take a decisive step. With the intention of investigating the traces of the great conspiracy on his own, he announced his departure, leaving Errol bewildered and confused. Errol, whose heart was determined to go along with Ethan, faced an unexpected rejection. Ethan, as if anticipating the risks and dangers that might lie ahead of them along the way, insisted that Errol take a break from all the hardships and trials they had endured. You need rest, he said, filling those words with concern and worry for his companion's well-being. With those words, Ethan walked away, leaving Errol to ponder the coming trials and her place in this exciting story. Errol, weary to the core after a day full of unfamiliar and draining adventures, tried to find solace in the soft embrace of her bed. An internal struggle between the desire to rest and the urge to act kept her busy. Eventually, she came to the conclusion that inaction was not her way. With that thought in mind, Errol decided to go to the Spy Guild, a place where every corner could tell stories of conspiracies and secrets hidden from the eyes of ordinary citizens. However, when she was just about to leave her hiding place, the estate manager met her on her way. His words, full of genuine concern and caution, sounded like a reminder that the nighttime city harbored just as many dangers as the daytime city. He insisted that Errol, being unfamiliar with the area and the peculiarities of nightlife, should be escorted. At first, Errol felt some irritation at this concern, taking it as a distrust of her ability to take care of herself. However, she soon realized the wisdom in the manager's words. The city was foreign to her, and the mysteries of the night could be too dangerous a challenge for a lone wanderer. Accepting the decision gratefully, Errol agreed to the offer of an escort. The manager introduced his stern assistant, Ben. This man who seemed simple and unassuming at first glance actually had a look that was deep and unyielding. His presence gave Errol a sense of familiarity, as if they had met before in some other life or perhaps in a dream. His eyes read an unknown story, making Errol wonder who he really was and what secrets he hid behind his silent facade. Strolling through the busy streets of the festival city where every corner pulsed with music, light, and joy, Errol continued to wonder about her previous encounters with Ben. This city, filled with laughter and merriment, seemed to be in complete contrast to their own quest, which was full of mystery and the unknown. Suddenly, Ben, appreciating her disguise, easily deduced their intention to go to the spy guild, as if reading her mind. It only reinforced her suspicions that their paths hadn't crossed by accident. Eventually, their path led them to a tavern, a place where everyone from weary travelers to adventurers gathered, each with their own story or mystery. The light from the fire flickered on the walls, creating a cozy, almost magical atmosphere. Errol, without wasting a moment, approached the bartender to inquire about the missing people whose information she had been looking for since her arrival in the capital. Her questions sounded insistent, for they concerned a matter that could not be delayed. An unfamiliar girl approached their bar, who, having heard part of the conversation, decided to insert her own five cents, assuming that Errol was looking for either a missing lover or a cheating husband. The assumption seemed obvious to her, given the typical requests for bartenders in such places. Errol, however, was far from wanting to laugh or share the lightness of the moment. She was preoccupied with far more serious matters, and the girl's joke seemed out of place. Her eyes reflected determination and depth of feeling, 
indicating that her quest was not about a personal relationship, but something that touched the fates of many people. In this world where intrigue and secrets weave tighter than a spider's web in the corner of an abandoned castle, Ben faces an unexpected turn of events. In the middle of the ordinary bustle of his life, when the days flowed one after another like water in an endless river of time, suddenly before him appeared Leona, a girl with a mysterious look and no less mysterious proposal. The Leona that presented herself to Ben wasn't just a random stranger. She carried secrets that could change the course of both their destinies. The date she offered was just an excuse to talk, far more important and dangerous than any lovemaking. Ben's refusal, which at first seemed the only right thing to do, suddenly took on new dimensions when Leona mentioned information concerning Errol, a mysterious figure whose fate was inextricably linked to their shared past and possibly future. Leona, Fibella's older sister, whose name carried the weight of stories yet to be told, revealed to Errol a part of her soul and her fears. She spoke of the South, a place where the laws of honor and justice were forgotten like old legends and where cruelty and lawlessness ruled. Her words were full of seriousness and warning. Errol was not to meddle in the affairs of the South, for there her inevitable doom awaited her. Leona wasn't just issuing a warning. She was opening the gates for Errol into a world where every step could be fatal, and every decision had a chain of unpredictable consequences. Leona's words were like a cold wind suddenly entering a cozy room, making you freeze and realize the fullness of the looming threat. Errol, faced with a choice, knew that from this moment on, his life would never be the same. Leona held out her hand, clutching the keys to a riddle that held both mortal danger and a chance for redemption or victory. The story they were both drawn into promised to be filled not only with challenges, but also with discoveries about themselves and the world, where the boundaries between good and evil, loyalty and betrayal were being erased. In the face of the warnings and dangers that loomed like dark clouds over the southern lands, Errol showed unyielding will and determination. She, not allowing fear to overwhelm her, insisted on getting the information she so critically needed to know in order to proceed. Leona, watching Errol's indomitable spirit, couldn't hold back a smile, a smile that was intertwined with both respect and a subtle note of irony for a boldness that sometimes bordered on recklessness. The information Leona had provided to Errol was evidence of the dark mystery enveloping the southern lands. The people Errol was looking for seemed to have vanished into thin air. All the evidence indicated that they were not only in hiding, but possibly dead. But without bodies, without visible signs of their life or demise, this conjecture remained only a guess, a ghost of truth in the fog of the unknown. Digging deeper into this mysterious story, Leona revealed that there have been at least 40 such disappearances in the past two years. In all cases, children of the same age were missing, suggesting that the events were not random. This assumption of kidnapping posed a new, even more sinister mystery for Errol and Leona. The mystery of these disappearances knitted a noose of silence and fear around the southern lands. With each account of missing children, with each suggestion of abductions, the knot grew tighter and tighter. Along with the information Leona had provided, Errol, there was an unspoken threat in the air, a warning that actions have consequences, and sometimes in unraveling one mystery, one can stumble upon a door to an even darker and more dangerous world. This exchange of information between Leona and Errol wasn't just a conversation between two acquaintances. It was like two chess players moving pieces on a board full of mystery and intrigue where every move could cost too much. Though they both faced the unknown, their determination to seek answers only strengthened, leading them through the darkness of the mysteries of the southern lands to the truth that perhaps awaited them at the heart of the mystery. After being generously rewarded with valuable information to guide her further along the thorny path of investigation, Errol returned with Leona to the cozy shelter of the inn, where Ben was once again waiting for them. An unexpected turn in the conversation occurred when Leona, studying Ben's face with genuine interest, could not contain her surprise at the unexpected thrill of recognition. Her words, hovering in the air like a light spring breeze, penetrated deep into Ben's mind, forcing him to confess his past as a mercenary. This moment, overflowing with memories and shadows of days past, added another facet to their shared history. Shortly afterward, when Errol and Ben decided to leave the inn to continue their journey under the stars, they were suddenly stopped by Ethan. His warning of the dangers of nocturnal wandering sounded like an ominous echo of the legends and stories that littered every corner of their world. 
He stood at the doorstep of the inn like the epitome of care and guardianship, reminding them of the vigilance and caution that must accompany them on their nightly adventures. Errol, eager to escape the discerning gazes, tried to hide her face under her hood, but Ethan, with deafness and confidence, shifted the cloth, exposing her face to the twinkling starlight. His words, filled with the certainty that he'd recognized her the last time they'd met, framed the moment once again with a special intimacy and the realization that there was more between them than just random crossings of destinies. Ethan, reeling from his unequivocal recognition, suggested that Errol go home together, as if putting into that suggestion not only a concern for safety, but also an unobtrusive suggestion of the possibility of a future together, if only for this one night. Thus the night thickened around the heroes, enveloping them in mysterious silhouettes of the future and uncharted roads of destiny. Each of them, standing at the crossroads of their life paths, was looking for their place, their role, their purpose in this world. And in this eternal quest, their paths crossed, creating a new story filled with danger, mystery, and perhaps new discoveries about themselves and the world around them. At one point in their conversation, Ethan, in a caring and thoughtful way, called attention to the extraordinary dedication to the work to which Errol was sacrificing herself. He knew that for her work was not just an occupation, but the meaning of her life, her passion and vocation. That's why Ethan was sure that Errol couldn't leave her work for frivolous hobbies or trifles. Her disappearance or absence, he interpreted as another plunge into the depths of an investigation where every detail, every rustle could mean a clue. Suddenly breaking the silence of their conversation, Ethan asked what seemed to be a question about the weather, wondering if Errol was feeling excessively warm. She, without giving the question much thought, replied that she felt quite comfortable, unaware of the true nature of his concern. It soon dawned on her, however, that Ethan was referring to her mask which she wore not just as part of her image, but as an integral part of herself. Errol felt protected with this accessory, even though the mask could make her uncomfortable in the heat. Understanding Ethan's concern, she admitted that she could take off the mask if it made him uneasy. But Ethan, showing genuine concern and respect for Errol's personal space, insisted that her comfort meant far more to him than his own worries about her well-being. After that fleeting but meaningful exchange of care and attention, Errol reminded him of the time to rest— suggesting that Ethan put off all business until tomorrow. When he left, Errol was alone with her thoughts. In the silence of the room, she remembered how, throughout her life, those around her often perceived her as someone alien, sometimes even calling her a monster. These memories were painful, for as a child and young adult, when she needed support and help to get up after falls, a helping hand was often left unreached. Such moments from the past left deep marks in her heart, but also formed an unshakable willpower and desire to go forward, despite all the difficulties and misunderstanding from others. That evening, as silence enveloped the room, leaving Errol alone with her thoughts, she made the decision to remove the mask that had long served as her shield from the views and judgments of those around her. Standing in front of the mirror, she looked at her reflection and, as if asserting her identity, declared to herself that despite all the adversity and prejudice she had endured, she was still human. This moment was an important step for her towards self-recognition and self-acceptance, symbolizing her willingness to face her fears and doubts. At dawn, when the first rays of the sun had barely touched the ground, Errol, still half asleep, noticed Ethan's soft golden curls playing in the sun. The warmth and comfort of his presence caused her to feel an extraordinary heat she had never experienced before. Suddenly, she realized she was in his arms, which made her heart beat faster and her cheeks flush with a blush of embarrassment. However, that moment of awkwardness was quickly replaced when Ethan, awake, rushed to apologize for his unintentional invasion of her personal space. His genuine embarrassment and concern only emphasized his respect for her. To smooth the awkward moment, Ethan offered to make tea, as if through this simple gesture he wanted to return their communication back to normal. Sitting over a cup of fragrant tea, they fell into conversation about little things that nevertheless created a bridge of understanding and intimacy between them. When the conversation turned to tea preferences, Ethan admitted with a smile that he preferred tea with honey or notes of orange. He also noted not without irony that many people feel as if such supplements are not good for him. This moment, light and sincere, allowed Errol to see Ethan from a different side, revealing him as a man capable of making jokes about himself and not being afraid to look vulnerable. 
So, in the simplicity of morning tea, something deeper than mere friendship or understanding was brewing between two people so different, yet at the same time so close to each other's hearts. This moment was a testament to both of them that even the most mundane moments can be the beginning of something magical and unique. At that moment, when the world around seemed calm and secluded, Errol, as if sensing the silence as a harbinger of an important conversation, turned to Ethan with a question, piercing and deep, reflecting the gravity of her inner feelings. Her words, filled with uncertainty and hidden pain, sounded quiet, but the depth of her confusion was clear in them. She brought up again the subject of her curse, the very spot on her eye which like a smoldering coal flickered under the cover of her gaze, and the bloodshot eyes in which splashed the bottomless depths of misery, which were the reason why so many saw her as something other than human. These attributes made her life a never-ending struggle for acceptance in a world where difference was seen as a threat rather than uniqueness. Ethan, whose attitude toward Errol was always an island of warmth and understanding in the ocean of her loneliness, listened to her, enveloping her in the warmth of his attention. His kindness and sincere desire to be near caused confusion in Errol's soul because she could not understand how such a bright man could so unwaveringly stay close to someone who many considered a monster. It confused her because the feelings she had for Ethan were something new, mysterious and troubling, and the realization of what he might be feeling for her eluded her, like the fog cleared by the first rays of the sun. Just at this moment, when the hearts and souls of both were ready to open up to each other, when words could probably have turned their world upside down, reality intruded with unexpected and unpleasant urgency. A knock at the door interrupted them, like a cold rain dispersing the warmth of a cozy evening. Ben stood at the door with a message from Earl Philbot, whose arrival was as unexpected as it was untimely. With all the solemnity that was characteristic of him, he invited Ethan and Errol to join the banquet, leaving them no choice and no time to think. The event seemed to herald a new turn in their history, forcing the mysteries of their hearts to be left unsolved and postponing the possibility of understanding and acceptance to an uncertain future. In the face of an unexpected invitation from Earl Philbot, Errol and Ethan found themselves shrouded in a veil of bewilderment and skepticism. In their view of the world, where every action has a price, and every offer of friendship is carefully weighed on the scales of benefit, such an invitation seemed strange and incomprehensible. Thinking over the possible reasons for such generosity on the part of the Count, they came to the conclusion that the matter here, most likely, was not in the desire to make friends, but in more down-to-earth motives. The Marquis Delphius, whose name had already managed to tarnish their perception of aristocratic society with his self-serving actions, probably played no small part in the situation, pushing the Count to further enrich himself at the expense of others. Returning to the conversation that had been so rudely interrupted, Ethan tried to sort through the tangle of questions and feelings they'd left at the door, but Errol, whose thoughts had already drifted to the evening ahead, suggested they postpone the conversation. Her voice sounded determined, leaving room to continue, but later, when circumstances were more favorable, Arriving at the banquet, they immediately felt like strangers in this world of opulence and sophistication. Suddenly, they were faced with a problem that seemed funny only until it became reality. They didn't even know what their host for the evening, the Earl of Philbot, looked like. This mishap added to the already existing tension with a sense of acute awkwardness. They decided to act as carefully as possible to avoid possible embarrassment and chose a place on the sidelines, trying to remain unnoticed in the shadow of the beautifully decorated hall, absorbing the atmosphere of the party, but not becoming part of it. In this decision, there was not only a security strategy, but also a desire to observe, analyze, and understand without entering a game whose rules were unknown to them. At the lavish banquet, where the flicker of candles was reflected in gold jewelry and the rustle of silk dresses mingled with the harmony of music, there was an unexpected meeting. Errol and Ethan, standing a little away from the main bustle, suddenly found a stranger beside them. He was an old man with a shrewd gaze and a smile that skillfully hid the knowledge and experience of long years. Acting with the ease of someone driven by genuine curiosity, he approached them, noticing their distance from the main festivities. You should be enjoying the banquet, not standing here in solitude, he began, his voice soft but confident. They might think you're up to something. There was no threat in that suggestion, but rather a benevolent warning, spiced with a spark of humor. 
Errol, who had not lost her presence of mind, replied with ease that they were up to nothing and saw no point in worrying about the opinions of others. Her words were full of determination and self-confidence, as if she was ready to face any challenge. The old man, smiling, approved of her bravery and nonchalance. I like your opinion, he said, his eyes sparkling with recognition and respect. After this brief exchange, he introduced himself as Viscount Roth, sharing that tonight's banquet was in honor of his son's fourth marriage. This explanation added a note of levity to the atmosphere, revealing to Errol and Ethan the little secret of a splendid evening. The intrigue of the evening deepened when Errol, dictated by a sudden impulse of curiosity, inquired as to the whereabouts of Earl Philbot. The Viscount, with the grace reserved for a true aristocrat, pointed to a girl with dazzling red hair. This moment proved to be full of surprise, for it was news to Errol and Ethan that Earl Philbot, whose name suggested thoughts of a stern and imperious ruler, was actually a woman. Her appearance and grace, like a flash of lightning, illuminated the gathering, adding another mystery to this already unique evening. That evening, when the stars shone especially bright in the bottomless sky, Ethan and Errol, two inseparable travelers, arrived at the hospitable home of Countess Royce Philbut. Their meeting was filled with warmth and cordiality, as if they were truly close friends who had many stories to share after a long separation. The countess, whose splendor and nobility were not inferior to her high title, invited them to go to the balcony in order to continue their conversation in more private and quiet surroundings. The night was warm, but the air on the balcony felt cool after a hot day filled with hustle and bustle and business. Countess Royce, the epitome of sophistication and power, suddenly seemed somewhat tense, as if the mask she wore in public had begun to crack. This was unusual for a woman whose charm and composure seemed impenetrable. She began to pace the balcony as if something was bothering her more than just meeting old acquaintances. Soon it became clear that the cause of her restlessness was some kind of internal struggle. She seemed annoyed not only by her heavy, closed clothing, which apparently limited her freedom and comfort, but also by the very state of affairs in which she found herself. The countess stopped and, turning to Ethan and Errol, as if throwing outward all her worries, declared her desire for more money for the continuation of this theater of deception, the pretending of their friend. This moment revealed to them a very different side of Countess Royce Philbot, a woman willing to trade her feelings and relationships for material goods. Such a discovery forced Ethan and Errol to rethink not only their relationship with the Countess, but also the values that guided people in their world, where friendship and loyalty seemed to have come to weigh less than gold. The gist of her demands was clear. She wanted increased financial support for continuing to play the friendship game with Ethan and Errol. The Countess turned the subject of the Southern Lands into an explanation that conjured up an image of a situation that required immediate attention. From the South came news of a protracted confrontation that had reached a critical point. Countess Royce and the Marquis of Delphius, her ally, felt the pressure building. She said the conflict, which had begun decades earlier, had gained momentum, escalating to full-blown war. This war, she claimed, was initiated by Pulgis, whose actions jeopardized their position. The Countess emphasized the need for financial support to keep the Marquis Delphius in a stable position and prevent his downfall. She argued that without additional funds, they would both be stranded. Errol, for her part, was skeptical, questioning whether there was enough justification to increase funding based on the stories told alone. In response, the countess came up trumps. She had strong evidence that the Dyslavan Empire had intervened in support of Puljin, which could have changed the course of the war and had serious consequences for all sides of the conflict. The statement raised the stakes of the conversation, promising to have significant consequences for the balance of power in the region and forcing Ethan and Errol to take the Countess's warning seriously. In the shadowy hall of the ancient castle, where every object seemed imbued with stories of distant ages, the Countess Philbo, bearing with dignity the burden of her title, appeared before the assembled crowd with an important messenger. In her dainty hands glittered a Dyslavin coin, the very one discovered among other valuables wrongfully withheld from the Marquis of Puljin's supply line. This artifact was not just evidence of secret dealings, but a sign of the deep divide between truth and deceit, valor and treachery. Ethan, the young and witty strategist present at this revelation, had a deep respect for the Countess's words. It was revealed to him that in the context of these events, the hero was Delphius, whose actions illuminated the darkness of the machinations of Puljin, that villain who covered his self-serving schemes with the cloak of power. 
The countess pronounced with unyielding certainty that Puljin, who had joined forces with De Slavin, deserved only contempt and should be called a traitor, which was a clear call to action for all who valued justice and honor. At this moment, when the tension in the air was at its height, a servant burst into the hall. With a face reflecting urgency and excitement, he delivered the news that Count Kraysak, a relative and apparently an ally of Puljin, was seeking an audience with the Countess Philbo. A fire of determination flashed in the Countess's eyes. She did not hesitate to accept it as a sign of fate, an opportunity to face those who had taken the path of treachery and wickedness. This challenge was accepted with dignified readiness. For to the Countess every such encounter was not merely a diplomatic meeting, but a chance to strengthen truth and justice in a world where the shadows of intrigue loomed menacingly over the fates of many. Thus, in the meeting at the Countess Philbo's house, Events unfolded like a great play, where each participant played a different role in the struggle for power, honor, and truth. Fates were intertwined in a tangle of intrigue, where every decision and every choice could change the course of history. That evening, as the thickening shadows of night covered the city in a mysterious blanket, the first sounds of a meeting that promised to be a momentous occasion were heard in the castle hall. The atmosphere was filled with the fragrance of expensive perfume and the light rustle of silk dresses. The countess, shrouded in a veil of intrigue and beauty, became the center of attention from the very beginning. Her interlocutor, not missing a moment, surrounded her with flattering compliments as if trying to distract her from the accumulated worries and anxieties. The questions came one after another like fine rain in early summer, refreshing memories, and bringing a smile to the countess's lips. He skillfully turned the conversation to a topic that had been keeping many of the city's influential circles busy lately. With genuine interest and a note of concern in his voice, he mentioned the spies whose shadows seemed to manage to sneak through the most secure barriers. The conversation turned to security strategies that were designed to protect the city from ill-wishers. He emphasized the actions of the Marquis of Delphu, who, as rumor had it, had greatly strengthened the defenses, but even this was not an insurmountable obstacle to the skillful spies. As the dialogue unfolded, the gazes of those present inevitably turned to Errol. Her appearance in the hall could not go unnoticed. The mysterious mask covering most of her face added an element of mystery and intrigue. A whisper passed among the crowd, and every look, every word began to form speculation and conjecture. Rumors began to form that she might be the spy they were talking about. After all, who but a mysterious stranger, capable of raising so many questions and yet remaining so elusive, could play such a role in this complex game of shadows and light. Thus the evening, which began with light and pleasant conversations, gradually turned into a battlefield for wit and deduction, where everyone present became a participant in a great game, trying to unravel the mysteries hidden behind masks and words. In this room, where every corner is filled with mystery and enigma, Count Crissac, as if seeking the truth among the masks and shadows, has suggested that a true spy must conceal under his mask not only his face, but also the more conspicuous marks of his guilt, such as the spot on his eye. Errol, whose mask had already attracted attention, was put in the center of everyone's attention. Calmly and with dignity, she explained that her choice to wear a mask was merely an echo of a recent festival where such an accessory was not only appropriate, but welcomed. Her words sounded convincing, and she expressed surprise that the traditions of the masquerade were not continued at this banquet. However, the Count, not satisfied with this answer, asked Errol to remove her mask, as if trying to penetrate her defenses and unravel the mystery of her real face. At this point, Errol, feeling the pressure of accusation and suspicion, decided to go on the counterattack. With unexpected acuteness, she pointed out that Count Crissac's words carried an intolerable accusation against the Countess Philbo, implying her connection with espionage. According to her, such accusations without hard evidence could be perceived as an insult to the honor and dignity of the Countess. Countess Philbot, catching Errol's train of thought, decided to support her by expressing her indignation at the baseless accusations. She emphasized that Count Krasak's words hurt her not only as a person, but also as a representative of high society, and simple apologies would not help here. The Count, who found himself in a corner under the onslaught of two strong women, felt that he had to salvage the situation somehow. 
In a fit of desperation and wanting to prove his point, he went to the extreme step of declaring that if Errol turned out not to be a spy, he was willing to suffer the harshest punishment for his words, even if it meant his own execution. So the drama unfolded amid velvet curtains and glittering lamps, where every word and every action could change destinies, and the charge of espionage became a sharp blade, threatening to destroy not only reputations, but lives. In the shadows of the bright castle hall, where the air was saturated with the tension of impending exposure, Kraysak, stern and unforgiving in his judgment, made a statement that portended grim times for the Countess, should Errol prove to be a spy. Errol, standing in front of the gathered crowd, nodded in agreement, taking the full weight of the consequences. With each passing moment, her eyes reflected the struggle with her inner demons. Remembering the scars of the past, she was about to do something she had never dared to do until now, remove the mask that hid her true face from the world. Ethan, whose heart was overflowing with concern and worry for Errol, tried to stop her, wanting to protect her from potential danger, but received only a cryptic reply that everything would be explained later. At that critical moment, as the mask detached from Errol's face and flew to the floor, there was a stunned silence. All eyes were fixed on her face, where they expected to see the familiar stain symbolizing her supposed guilt. It was absent, however, leaving only a clean skin that bore not the slightest trace of past accusations. The tense and anxious looks of those gathered in the hall, facing Errol's true appearance for the first time, gave her a mixture of fear and determination. Count Krezak, gripped by fear of the unexpected development, reflexively stretched his hands out in Errol's direction, trying to grasp at the last straw, screaming that this was just a ruse. But his attempt was immediately foiled by Ethan, who, standing between Krezak and Errol, emphatically declared that the time for such performances was over. This moment was a turning point not only for Errol, who had decided to take such a bold step, but also for everyone present who witnessed this exciting reveal. The looks of disbelief and prejudice were slowly replaced by surprise and admiration for her courage. On that day in that castle hall, there was not only the sound of a mask falling, but stereotypes and prejudices crumbling, leaving behind only a deep reflection on the essence of true courage and honor. The next events in the hall unfolded with cinematic dramatic intensity. Count Krezak, seized with pain and humiliation, roared with unbearable pain in his wrist, accusing Ethan of intentionally damaging it. But in this whirlwind of accusations, the Countess became an unshakable pillar of justice, reminding Kresak of the lost argument, which now turned out for him the most extreme of all possible outcomes, the death sentence. There was an iron logic in her words. Compared to the threat of execution, complaining about a broken wrist seemed trifling. Krezak, trying to find salvation at the last moment, claimed his words had been misinterpreted in an attempt to extract himself a path to forgiveness. However, the laws of the South were inexorable and did not tolerate ambiguity, and the Countess, as the guardian of these laws, remained steadfast in her decision to carry out the harsh sentence. A heavy silence descended upon the hall as the Countess's sword, like a punishing sword of justice, swept through the air, ready to fall upon the guilty. The hearts of those present froze in anticipation of the final act of tragedy. However, at the last moment the sword failed to find its target in Krezak's body, Instead, the blade stabbed into the parquet, leaving behind only the quiet echo of steel clinking against wood. The Countess, showing her power and mercy at the same time, ordered the still-living, though exhausted unconscious Count to be carried from the hall, postponing the decision of his fate until a later hour when she could discuss it with Poljan. This moment was not just a resolution to a tense situation, but showed everyone present that the true strength of a leader is not in the ruthless use of force, but in the capacity for fair judgment and mercy. In the hall, where recently there was a spirit of conflict and betrayal, now there was a sense of respect for the Countess, who managed to find a balance between law and humanity, leaving a mark in history as a ruler capable of deep and meaningful solutions to the most complex issues. In one of those moments when the world seemed frozen in anticipation of the denouement, Errol, whose thoughts were always filled with courage and eagerness to learn, turned to the Countess with a question. She wanted to understand why this high-ranking official, the Countess, had decided to take such a risky step, to trust her, Errol, putting the most precious thing on the line, her life. In answer to her questions, the Countess, gathering her thoughts, smiled softly and looked penetratingly into her eyes as if trying to look into her very soul. 
We're friends, she began, and there was confidence in her voice, but also a certain tenderness. The countess emphasized that in Errol's eyes, she saw the very sense of confidence that was so necessary for true trust between people. Errol, suddenly deep in thought, remembered Ethan saying something similar to her, which made her heart beat faster. That night, as the shadows grew longer and the torchlight softly illuminated the walls of the hall, Ethan seemed on the verge of an outburst of anger. From his lips came the words, You could have been executed today. Those words vibrated in the air, full of tension. After a moment, however, his anger seemed to dissolve into silence and he gathered his strength and apologized. At this point, Errol, despite everything that had happened, asked him why he was avoiding her gaze. Ethan, as if caught off guard by this question, noticed that his thoughts were occupied with something else. He was pondering the reasons Errol was hiding his face behind the mask. He supposed there was a desire to hide something behind it, or maybe her father was making her do it by calling her a monster. However, when he saw her face, revealing only ordinary features, he was overcome with mixed feelings of sadness and anger, reflecting the inner conflict between his perceptions and reality. In the moment Errol shares with Ethan as if opening the door to her inner world, she opens her heart to him, confessing her fears and doubts. She, whose name is shrouded in the whispers of rumors and the heavy glare of public condemnation, found something in Ethan that made her feel like she wasn't alone in the world. Her confession that many see her as a monster, but Ethan manages to see the true Errol behind that scary label, sounds like a melody of hope. This confession about the mask she was unwilling to take off, wanting to keep this compassion, this understanding from Ethan, transforms into a heartfelt revelation that even in a world where you're called a monster, you can find someone who sees more in you. Ethan, in response to her candor, begins to lead his story of the distant past, of a time when he himself felt the weight of wearing a mask. His story takes us back to the days of his youth, when as a boy he went hunting with his father. This journey deep into the woods, a seemingly ordinary father-son adventure, turned into an ordeal that changed Ethan forever. The encounter with the panther, the mysterious and powerful predator of those dark forests, was a moment he recalls with a shiver in his heart. Ethan describes that fight as a turning point in his life, when only thanks to his father did he stay alive. His father, who entered the fight with the predator, saved his life, while Ethan, too wounded, was barely on his feet. The story ends by showing the scar secretly hidden beneath his hair, an eternal reminder of the day when life hung in the balance. This exchange of stories between Errol and Ethan not only reveals the depths of their experiences, but also creates a special bond between them, an understanding that they have both experienced moments when they felt vulnerable, alone, standing on the brink of life and death. In their stories, pain and fear, but at the same time, willpower and desire to live, overcoming difficulties. So, through sharing their deep and personal experiences, Errol and Ethan find in each other not only understanding and compassion, but also the strength to face their fears, accepting each other for who they are, without the masks behind which they have been hiding from the world. As he continues his story, Ethan shares another important revelation that brings to light the depths of his inner world and struggles. He admits that the scars from that fateful encounter with a panther in the middle of the woods were the reason for the way he was treated by those around him. These signs of struggle and survival, instead of telling of young Ethan's bravery, became symbols of fear in the eyes of others. People began to avoid him, treating him as some kind of monster, an outcast from their own world. This alienation has forced him to resort to wearing a mask to hide his scars and the pain they symbolize in an attempt to gain at least the illusion of acceptance. In that context, learning of Errol's existence, of her own choice to wear the mask, Ethan felt something deeper than just a soulmate. He saw in Errol not only a reflection of his fears and trials, but also a source of inspiration. Unlike him, who preferred to hide from the world behind a mask to avoid judgment and fear in the eyes of others, Errol displayed unyielding resilience and confidence. She faced contempt and misunderstanding and did not let it break her. Errol did not shy away from meeting people, did not hide her face behind a mask of fear, but continued to live a full life, proving her importance and fortitude indeed. Ethan admires this incredible confidence of Errol's, her ability to stay true to herself despite all the obstacles and insults. His admiration for her becomes a beacon of light in the darkness of his own experiences. Ethan sees in Errol not just a kindred spirit, lost and alone in this world, but also an example to follow, 
proof that you can keep your essence and not give in to the provocations of circumstances, even if the whole world around you seems hostile. This moment of shared experiences and mutual appreciation becomes pivotal in their relationship, allowing them to see each other and the world around them in a new way, finding comfort and support in their unique bond. Ethan, reflecting on the wisdom passed down to him by his father, recalled how he had been taught to value strength in friendship, asserting that true power lay in alliances with those who possessed qualities beyond the ordinary. However, up until the moment Ethan met Errol, he had never questioned his own shortcomings, because up until that point it seemed as if his inner world was flawless. Meeting Errol had opened his eyes to his own vulnerabilities, and it was that discovery that made his heart beat faster. There was something he could learn from Errol, something about her that was missing from him that attracted him the most. In this connection with Errol, Ethan saw something beyond simple admiration or a desire to be stronger. It fascinated him that Errol possessed qualities so far removed from his own that it made him want to be around her to learn and grow. It wasn't about competing for the title of strongest, but about complementarity, the combination of two halves that together created a perfect harmony. Referring back to the morning conversation they'd had, Ethan found the courage to admit that his feelings belonged solely to Errol. It was not just a declaration of love, but a declaration that he had found in Errol, a person who made him whole, complementing and enriching his own being. It was the moment when Ethan, having overcome all doubts, could say with certainty that his heart, full of warm feelings and tenderness, belonged only to Errol. That night, as silence enveloped her room, Errol found herself in an ocean of restless thoughts. The moment spent earlier with Ethan had seemed like an exciting eternity to her, and his sudden disappearance after such a momentous recognition had left her heart tossing between hope and doubt. Sleep was distant and unapproachable, as if it had left with Ethan, leaving Errol to deal with the chaos of her feelings alone. When morning came, the appointment at the restaurant was the only beacon for Errol in the fog of her confusion. At the sight of Ethan, who was already waiting for her at the table, the girl's heart did a few accelerated beats. Both of them were clearly embarrassed by the encounter, but Errol seemed caught in the middle of a shared awkward silence, as if the full weight of the situation rested on her fragile shoulders. Ethan, who had an amazing ability to read her state of mind even in silence, noticed the pallor on her face and expressed concern about her night's rest. Errol, trying to appear more confident and calm than she actually felt, replied with a slight smile that her sleep was deep and peaceful, trying to convince herself of that first and foremost. However, when Ethan, feeling guilty for his unexpected departure that evening, began to apologize, the walls that Errol had so diligently built around her emotions began to crumble. All attempts to remain calm were in vain. The words she wanted to say in her defense, in defense of her inner world, became confused. She tried to convince him, and perhaps herself, that his sudden disappearance after such an intimate confession had left no wounds in her soul. But the more she tried to hide her anxiety, the more it became clear that this night without sleep and his sudden departure had left a deep mark in her heart. This encounter, which began with awkwardness and embarrassment, became a bridge over which both could move to a deeper understanding of each other, if only they could overcome their fear of candor. On this path to mutual understanding, their every word and gesture, every look took on a special meaning, promising a challenging but exhilarating journey through the labyrinths of feelings and hopes that sought a path to the light. Ethan's heart was filled with confusion after leaving Errol alone with her thoughts and unresolved feelings. His eyes reflected a deep desire to make things right as he gathered his wits and decided to apologize to Errol if his recent actions had hurt her. He cautiously started the conversation, intending to make amends for a possible offense, but his attention was intercepted by Errol's sudden confession. Her words were filled with sincerity and openness that made his heart beat even faster. She wanted to share her feelings, letting him know that their future together mattered to her. At the same time, the viewer was to find out where Ethan was headed that fateful night after his unexpected disappearance. The answer lay in magic. Ethan used his magical earring to call Estian, his trusted companion and advisor. This earring, symbolizing the connection between distant hearts, became a conduit for his restlessness into the deep night. Estian, with his wisdom and experience, listened to Ethan and offered him advice on how to proceed after the confession. He reminded Ethan of their mission where they had to pretend to be married, emphasizing that Ethan should remain calm and confident without letting embarrassment take over. Estian paid special attention to Ethan's action of leaving Errol alone after such a momentous moment. 
He pointed out that this decision wasn't the best, adding a slight note of jest to the conversation about Ethan's father expecting grandchildren, which no doubt put Ethan in an even more embarrassing position. That moment when Ethan threw back the earring reflected his inner conflict and at the same time his desire to find the right path for his circumstances. These events reveal the depth of the characters' experiences, their fears and hopes, which are closely intertwined in their shared journey. Ethan and Errol, on the verge of making new discoveries about themselves and each other, struggle together to balance mission, personal feelings, and the need to make decisions that could change their destinies forever. The moment Errol noticed Ethan's unusual behavior, he seemed withdrawn to her, as if his thoughts were far beyond their current conversation. She couldn't help but notice how embarrassed he was, caught off guard by her observation. His attempt to distract himself from the moment by turning his attention to work matters and announcing the next destination of their journey did not go unnoticed. Errol, for her part, made a suggestion for a brief deviation from their route. Her request was for a visit to a village that happened to be on their route. The reason for this detour in their journey was Errol's desire to look for Nanny's children there, who were not only acquaintances, but nephews to her, adding a personal interest to the journey. This village beckoned them not only by its location, but also by the promise of secrets that could be uncovered in the course of their search. However, they faced a formidable obstacle, the Pyatt Forest, also known as the Wilderness of Bear Trees. The place was surrounded by dark legends and unfounded fears, and the current season added another detail to its mystical halo. Poisonous creatures that came to life during this period and made traveling through the forest extremely dangerous. Despite the dangers, Ethan didn't show an ounce of hesitation. With the confidence he displayed, it was clear that he had already envisioned this risk in their plan. He reassured Errol, explaining that if they set out today and quickened their pace, they would be able to traverse the forest in just one day. Moreover, Ethan cryptically mentioned that he had prepared something special for their protection in the forest. It gave their upcoming adventure a touch of mystery and made Errol feel grateful and admire Ethan's ability to foresee and plan, making their journey together not only possible, but also safe, despite all the possible dangers in the Pyatt Forest. Preparations for the journey through the Pyatt Forest were in the final stages when Ethan decided to reveal one of his closely guarded secrets to Errol. He introduced her to the carriage, which he said was not just a vehicle, but a magical device with defenses against wild animals. This enchantment seemed a true marvel of engineering and magic, designed to ensure their safe passage through the most dangerous parts of the forest. In this beautifully decorated and exquisitely enchanted vehicle, Ethan found a moment to broach the subject of the long journey ahead of them. He expressed his intention to make sure that Errol would be well-rested when they arrived, emphasizing his care and foresight. However, when Errol expressed her determination and self-confidence, Ethan couldn't hide his admiration for her. His words were filled with warmth and sincerity as he began to express his admiration for her strength and splendor, confessing his constant thoughts about her. But before he could finish his thought, their conversation was interrupted by an unexpected guest. The manager of the manor where they were staying had come with an unexpected proposal. He persuaded Ethan and Errol to stay with him longer, with persuasiveness bordering on insistence, Perhaps he saw some benefit in their presence, or perhaps he simply wished to share his home with the travelers for a longer period of time. Ethan, however, certain of his intentions and unwilling to delay their journey, did not enter into a long discussion. With a decisive gesture, he slammed the carriage door shut, leaving the steward with his suggestions behind him. With this act of determination, they left the manor, heading towards the adventures that awaited them ahead. This moment was full of symbolism. Closing the door, not only in the face of the manager, but also in the face of any doubts or delays in their path. There were challenges ahead of them, but together, they were ready to overcome any obstacles. In the heart of a dense, fog-shrouded forest, under thick drops of fall rain, two travelers, Errol and Ethan, were making their way on horseback through soft, moisture-soaked moss. A chill permeated the air and the sounds of droplets tapping on the leaves of old trees created a monotonous but soothing melody. Ethan, feeling the aggravating cold, turned his attention to the antique suitcase attached to the saddle and motioned for Errol to put on her coat. There was care in his voice, but also a slight concern, for he himself was only dressed in summer clothes, having not foreseen the sudden change in weather. Errol looked at Ethan and felt a warmth that even the warmest cloak could not provide. 
With a sense of gratitude and tender care, she offered him her coat, knowing that now her companion would be protected from the piercing wind and cold. Ethan, with a slight smile and gratitude in his eyes, accepted her offer, but when he put on the woman's coat, the atmosphere was filled with slight irony. The coat certainly looked unusual on him, like a shield not meant for this warrior, but the warmth and comfort it provided was priceless. Errol couldn't help but smile as she looked at Ethan, whose attire now consisted of an odd combination of summer clothes and her coat. Despite the ridiculousness of the situation, she was pleased to see her concern warming Ethan on this cold day, but soon her gaze became more thoughtful, and Ethan noticed her shrinking slightly from the chill. His attentive eyes couldn't help but notice a slight shiver in her shoulders, and he thought perhaps she had caught a cold. That moment was a reminder to him that caring should be mutual, and now he was looking for a way to warm Errol as much as she cared for him. Continuing their journey through the viscous embrace of the rain that hid the boundaries between earth and sky, Errol and Ethan found themselves on the border of the Pyatt Forest, a place shrouded in mystery and old legends. The forest greeted them with thick green branches and the mysterious whispering of leaves, giving them the feeling of entering another world. Errol, looking at Ethan in his unusual outfit, couldn't resist a light joke, saying that the coat suited him exceptionally well. Ethan, deftly accepting the game, declared with a smile that he would then continue to wear it, emphasizing his willingness to make any sacrifice for warmth and comfort, even if it meant dressing in women's garb. As soon as they entered the depths of the Pyatt Forest, Errol was gripped by anxiety for the fate of the coachman left behind. This forest was known for its dangers, and even the strongest hearts were filled with anxiety at the thought of its depths. But Ethan, as if sensing her excitement, gently took her hand, interrupting the flow of anxious thoughts, and put a dainty bracelet on her wrist. He explained that this accessory has the special property of warding off wild animals, making their journey through the forest safer. Errol was surprised and encouraged at the same time, realizing that the coachman had the same bracelets, providing them protection from the unpredictable denizens of the forest. However, when Errol noticed that Ethan himself did not have such a bracelet, her heart clenched with worry. Ethan said with confidence and warmth in his voice that he could just be there for her. These words sounded not just like a promise of physical intimacy, but like an assurance that their bond and mutual support could overcome any difficulties. Ethan, despite his lack of a personal amulet, was confident in his ability to protect Errol, and his determination gave Errol a sense of confidence and security, allowing her to feel protected even in the most unpredictable and dangerous place that was the Pyatt Forest. In one quiet moment when the sounds of the world outside the window only slightly interfered with the silence, Errol stared at the window, where, as if on a canvas, her own figure was reflected. In this unexpected mirror, she noticed a detail that made her think. Her face did not have the usual mask that protected her from the world and herself from the gaze of others. The mask was her shield, hiding what she considered her curse. Thinking back to her childhood, she couldn't help but recall those moments when, in desperation and hysterics, she had begged Siebes, her unknowing protector, to free her from that stain that seemed like a lifelong vow. Siebes, the same one who was more than a friend to her, had promised her that someday she would achieve everything she desired, which seemed like a promise of endless possibilities and hope for the future. But life unfolded in such a way that Siebes disappeared from her life, leaving her alone with her fears and hopes. And when Errol died, caught in the arms of death, and then against all the laws of nature came back to life, she found that the stain had disappeared. This miracle, small but so meaningful to her, made her wonder if Siebes knew this would happen, or if his words were just an attempt to comfort her in her despair. These thoughts were suddenly interrupted by her awakening. Opening her eyes brought her to a world where Ethan, her companion, and perhaps the only one who could understand her, through the prism of her own experiences, slept beside her, an unwitting reminder of the reality of their existence. Seeing him defenseless in his sleep, Errol wrapped the warmth of the blanket around him as a symbol of the care and affection she felt, making the gesture another confirmation of the close bond between them. This moment was a reminder to her that even in the darkest of times, you can find a spark of light that leads through the darkness. Errol, standing at the window, looked out into the impenetrable darkness that enveloped the forest like a cloak. Everything seemed still except for a slight rustle that suddenly cut through the silence. Her heart raced in anticipation of the unknown as she jumped sharply to the window, trying to discern the source of the sound. 
At that moment something hit the window with force, stirring his heart and waking Ethan from his troubled slumber. Ethan, still half asleep, assumed that the cause of their sudden awakening was a common bug that had gotten lost in the night. Errol, however, remembering the magical protections of their carriage, designed to deter wild animals and unwanted guests, noted that such an event was beyond the ordinary. Their musings were cruelly interrupted when a giant wasp struck the carriage again, as if released from the heart of the night, its size and aggressiveness seeming unnatural. Ethan, realizing the seriousness of the moment, ordered the coachman to speed up immediately, trying to get away from the uninvited guest. In the back of his mind, he feared that the magical enchantments meant to protect them on their journey might have dissipated or weakened, leaving them vulnerable. His worst fears were confirmed when a swarm of bees descended upon the carriage from the darkness surrounding them on all sides. These creatures seemed to materialize out of thin air, and their attack was so sudden and coordinated that it seemed as if they were instigated by some unknown force. The moment was filled with chaos. The sounds of wing beats and terrifying buzzing filled the air, making it seem as if the night itself had risen up against the travelers. Ethan and Errol, surrounded by darkness in the swarm's attack, searched for a way to defend themselves and maintain their presence of mind to face this unexpected and frightening challenge that beckoned them in the darkness of the night forest. At the moment when Ethan realized that the huge, almost mythical wasps fluttering restlessly around the carriage showed no interest in the coachman, and their attention was entirely focused on the carriage itself, a guess about the real reason for their aggression began to form in his mind. These creatures seemed to be hostile solely to the vehicle itself and not to the living creatures that surrounded it. But before he could fully comprehend the thought, his attention was abruptly diverted by the sound of a powerful blow on the roof of the carriage, which recalled itself with unexpected force. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a new threat came upon the coachman. Snakes. They appeared so quickly and unexpectedly that for the first moment it seemed as if they had materialized right out of thin air. These reptiles, possessing exceptional agility and speed, instantly turned their attention to the coachman, preparing to inflict deadly bites. The situation seemed hopeless, and Ethan's heart sank in anticipation of tragedy. But at the last moment something incredible happened. The shining bracelets on the coachman's arms flashed brightly, and a powerful spell emanated from them, which, as if by an invisible force, drove the snakes away. The moment was a revelation to Ethan. He realized that the true target of the attacks was not he and the coachman, but something inside the carriage itself. Ethan's discerning eye quickly discovered the reason for all this. Among the various runes decorating the interior of the carriage and the objects inside, one in particular caught his eye. Different from the others, this rune not only exuded a different kind of energy, but it also seemed somehow wrong, out of place. This discovery only deepened the mystery surrounding their journey, and Ethan realized that he was faced with the task of not only uncovering the meaning of this mysterious rune, but also understanding how it related to the aggressive behavior of the strange creatures around them. Despite the dangers that lurked at every turn, Ethan's resolve only grew stronger, he was ready to go all the way, to solve the mystery of the rune and ensure the safety of his companions. The sudden onset of silence in the forest, when even the smallest animals ceased their sounds, was a clear sign to Ethan and his companions that there had been a change in the forest, awakening their attention to a new, imminent threat. This moment of silence, unnatural in the wilderness, carried a warning. The master of the forest, a powerful and ancient being whose presence dominated all life in this place, had awakened from its slumber. The realization of this made Ethan and his companions take drastic action. Having gathered their courage and realizing that further stay in the carriage was tantamount to death, they decided to act immediately. They have determined that their only chance for salvation is to escape the gaze of the master of the forest by using horses to escape. These noble animals— ready to rush through the darkness of the forest, will be their salvation at this critical moment. The bracelets, endowed with magical power, were to protect them on this dangerous journey. It was decided quickly, but with a heavy heart, for every step into the unknown could cost them their lives. Before setting off, Ethan turned to Errol, one of the bravest companions in his life. With guilt in his voice, he apologized for dragging her into this dangerous mission full of uncertainty and potential death. However, Errol only smiled in response to his words, showing an indomitable spirit and willingness to stand by her friends regardless of the dangers ahead. 
That smile was filled with courage and determination, symbolizing an unwavering belief in their joint victory over any obstacle. It was at this moment, as the group prepared to leave, that the master of the forest revealed himself from the depths of the dark forest, through the tangle of trees and the darkness of the night. This creature, shrouded in mysticism and ancient legends, appeared so suddenly and imposingly that even the air around him seemed frozen in anticipation of his next actions. His presence changed everything around him, transforming the forest into a place of his unlimited power, where every creature and plant obeyed his will. This was the moment of truth for Ethan and his companions, the moment that would determine the outcome of their brave journey. In one of those moments when the fate of the characters hangs in the balance, Ethan and Errol, acting with incredible synchronicity and determination, rush to their only hope for salvation, a speeding horse that could carry them out of this unfortunate situation. With the determination of warriors whose lives repeatedly depended on the promptness of their decisions, they ordered the coachman who shared the path with them to perform the daring maneuver of getting rid of the lanterns, lest the flames should give away their location in the gloomy night, and with one decisive movement they severed the carriage from the horses. It was a daring but necessary act, for the master of the forest, the mysterious and powerful creature whose footsteps were already threatening to overtake them, was too close. Despite a heartbeat louder than thunder and adrenaline bubbling in their veins, our heroes managed to slip away from their imminent fate, leaving behind only the echo of their decisions. As morning came and the first rays of the sun broke through the trees, the world seemed different. The dangers of the night were gone, giving way to the peace and tranquility of the new day. Ethan and Errol, along with their faithful companions, continued on their way, this time without too much haste, allowing the horses to recover from the night's run. The coachmen, who were in a state of extreme exhaustion after all they had been through, could barely keep in the saddle. Ethan, feeling generally tired and exhausted, leaned against Errol, sharing with her the thought that they needed to get important information to Estion as soon as possible about the betrayal that had caused all their troubles. However, before continuing their journey, they urgently needed a rest to gather their strength and thoughts for the challenges ahead. Realizing this, our heroes made the decision to stop at a tavern where they could temporarily forget the burden on their shoulders and recover before the new challenges that undoubtedly awaited them ahead. So, in the tavern, among strangers, they found a short-term refuge, a temporary oasis of calm and safety, where they could catch their breath heal their wounds, and gain strength for the new deeds and accomplishments that were an integral part of their journey. Reflecting on the gravity of the situation and the potential threat posed by the traitor, Errol realized that she needed additional resources and information to counter the impending danger. She decided to approach Earl Cribb, whose influence and resources could help solve their problem. Communication with Earl Cribb was critical. He was one of the few who could promptly provide the necessary materials and support at such a troubling time. Errol knew that much could depend on his response, and so she waited impatiently for a reply. After discussing the current situation with Ethan, they agreed that they needed to regain their strength and health before taking any further steps. They decided to spend a few days in the tavern, allowing themselves and their companions a decent rest to avoid illness and exhaustion that would seriously compromise their ability to cope with the challenges ahead. These days, the tavern was a temporary refuge for them, a place to find peace and quiet as much as possible in their tumultuous lives. One evening, tired but grateful for their moments of rest, they cuddled and fell asleep together on the bed, seeking comfort and security in each other's presence. That night, Errol was visited by a mysterious dream in which a bound man apologized to her and Ethan for keeping them alive. This dream reflected Errol's deepest fears and anxieties, expressing her inner worries and doubts about their current situation. In the dream, the man sitting on the throne, clearly in a position of power and authority, stated that this was the third time that the bound man had failed in his schemes. With ruthless determination and coldness, the man from the throne ordered the capture of the offender and did not hesitate to personally execute him, thus demonstrating his unappealing authority and unyielding judgment. Then, turning to the other man, he ordered him to take up the cause with full determination and without regard for loss, emphasizing his willingness to go to extreme lengths to achieve his goals. This dream left an imprint of uneasiness in Errol's soul and a foretaste of the trials to come. 
He reminded her of the gravity of their situation and that there were even harder battles ahead. As she came back to reality, she realized that there were still many challenges ahead and that she and Ethan would have to be prepared to face whatever dangers the new day brought. In a cozy room, crowded with the flickering light of the morning rays, Alden with deep reluctance plunged into a pile of papers that seemed endless. With each sheet his tired hands turned over, he became more and more convinced that this clerical work should have been done by Errol, not him. His complaints about the injustice of fate were cut through by the quiet but commanding voice of Perez, who was suddenly beginning to realize how important a role Errol played in their family life. She suddenly realized that Errol was not just a part of the family, but its foundation, the breadwinner, who carried on her fragile shoulders all the heavy burden of daily care for her loved ones. Perez recognized that they all, without exception, owed Errol a huge debt of gratitude as the most important member of their little community. Alden, albeit barely, recognized the importance of Errol in their lives, but his recognition was overshadowed by a snide remark that he felt Errol now owed him. He cited her unexpected union with Ethan, which Alden felt was bound to change something in their relationship. Meanwhile, in another part of their humble world, Errol awoke from her sleep feeling an inexplicable emptiness beside her. Ethan wasn't there. She was immersed in memories of the previous evening when Ethan had noticed her icy hands and offered to warm herself in his arms as they had once learned to survive in the harsh conditions of the polar regions. Ethan's gesture, simple but so sincere and warm, seemed incredibly sweet and close to her now. She then jumped into his arms without a second thought, making it clear that their relationship was much closer than it seemed. Errol was overcome with nostalgia for those fleeting moments of intimacy, and she realized that her heart was already trying to find its way back to Ethan, missing his presence. As soon as Errol stepped onto the worn floorboards of the cozy inn, she was greeted by a young girl with lively eyes who announced without prior explanation that Ethan had already taken care of ordering lunch for Errol. With those words, she deftly took Errol's hand and led her to the table where Ethan was already waiting, enveloped in an aura of calm and anticipation. The moment their gazes met, Errol felt a slight reproach in her heart for not being able to wake up earlier to share these first moments of a new day with Ethan. Ethan, however, brushed off her apology with a slight smile, emphasizing that the last few days had been so eventful that she really should have taken the opportunity to sleep longer and regain her strength. Errol, sensing the excitement and concern, couldn't help but notice that Ethan looked tired, and perhaps even more so had suffered just as much as she had, if not more, in their latest adventure. Ethan replied with unwavering optimism that, despite all the trials they have already had to overcome, he is confident that the next stage of their joint wedding journey will be less painful for him. His words sounded light, but in them there was an unshakable confidence that only bright moments were ahead of them, and that they could overcome any difficulties together, sharing joys and hardships in half. In the cozy corner of the mysterious bar where travelers and locals gathered, Words of determination and adventure resounded. Ethan, with a bright light in his eyes, announced to his companions that he was ready to go to the distant and mysterious village of Filoso. His voice was full of enthusiasm, and his heart was full of thirst for discovery. However, his words were broken by a voice belonging to a random interlocutor from the bar, whose face was shadowed by a shadow of past memories. "'Give it up,' came a grim voice from the corner where a man sat whose features were distorted by worry. He introduced himself as a native of the village of Filoso, a place he said was uninhabitable. His eyes showed the depth of the horrors he had experienced, which made his heart clench at the mere thought of his native land. Errol, Ethan's equally determined companion, declared with courage in her voice her intention to search Filoso for survivors. She believed that even in the darkest corners of the world, a spark of hope could be found. However, the man replied gravely that the village was cursed and had recently fallen victim to a devastating onslaught of monsters, after which no survivors even dared to approach its ruins. Before leaving, the mysterious stranger left one last piece of advice for our heroes to take a mercenary with them. There was a note of pessimism in his voice, for he doubted that there would be a brave man willing to accompany them on this dangerous journey. This moment shrouded the bar space with a peculiar gravity, for the decision to go to Filoso carried not only the hope of saving lost souls, but also the risk of coming face to face with the darkest corners of human fears. Errol carried in her heart the burden of a secret mission to find the nephews of her longtime nanny, a woman with whom she shared warm childhood memories. But the clouds of betrayal hanging over their little team made her reconsider her plans. She couldn't put Ethan in danger. 
especially since she wasn't sure she'd be successful. In addition, the cursed village of Filoso was a mystery whose echoes held only darkness and despair. In this maelstrom of doubts and decisions, Errol made the decision to bypass the ominous ruins of Filoso, leaving the investigation of the disappearance to Leona, the trusted head of the spy guild whose abilities could shed light on the mystery without her and Ethan's direct intervention. And when it seemed that the whirlwind of events could not acquire new turns, into their dialogue suddenly bursts Kleber, the adjutant of Count Crib, whose appearance was as unexpected as well as timely. Kleber, like a messenger of fate, handed Errol the papers, which arrived with a speed that tore the mask of surprise from the girl's face. Her request to Count Crib, which seemed to have been sent only the day before, had already found its fulfillment in these papers. The gesture emphasized not only the Count's efficiency and influence, but also the high level of trust and respect Errol enjoyed in his eyes. The speed with which the documents were delivered not only impressed Errol, but also added weight to her decision. At this moment in time, when every step could lead to unpredictable consequences, the importance of making the right decision was emphasized by the unexpected appearance of Kleber. This episode was a reminder that in a world where destinies are so closely intertwined, the support of powerful allies can be a key factor on the road to accomplishing goals, even if those goals seem, seem seemingly out of reach. Documents provided by Earl Cribb outline three recent incidents of missing children. 